Hey, Nick. Hey, Frank. Let me see if I can get... Uh, oh, you can get in. Good. I, because yeah. I set it up so that the, the videos wouldn't go on automatically. But as long as you can put on your video, that's very good. That's a good sign. Right. And you can <laughs> hear me. <laughs> Hola, Mari Malu. Hola. ¿Cómo están? Bien, bien, bien. I hope too many people are coming. My students are coming. Yeah, that's great. Limited to what, a hundred and hundred or? Yeah, the limit is a hundred, so <laughs> let's see what happens. Exactly. Yeah. Emilio, eh. no escucho. Hi, Raul, there's one of my students. Okay, good morning. Ahora sí, Emilio, ¿qué tal? Bien, bien. Este, ¿cuánto, ¿Cuántos Caribe plurilingüe ya, ya van? ¿Cuál, este, es, cuál? es el, el, el uh, cuatro décimo, entonces uh, por, número catorce. Catorce, wow, that's very good. <risa> no, bien, no, bien. Pero es primera vez que lo hacemos así. <risa> es, es un nuevo, de hecho les le voy a mandar eh, un ensayo que yo escribí, que lo oh, escribí al principio de la pandemia. Se llama eh, Notas para, para la, la, la Sociedad Translocal, Notas sí. para una Nueva Época. Sí. Porque lo que pasa es que esto lo teníamos disponible siempre. Claro. Lo que pasa es que ahora lo, lo tenemos que usar todos los días. Claro, claro. Eh, eh, eso es verdad. Eso es verdad. No, pero esta idea de, de translocalidad es muy, muy importante. Y estamos integrando eso en la lingüística en términos de la um, uh, del translanguaging. Entonces, que podemos imaginarlo como cada, cada uh, repertorio que tienes en tu, tu, tu mente en términos de capacidad lingüística, entonces tú puedes también eh, integrar los repertorios de manera trans. Y entonces, bueno, es otro acercamiento, pero es un acercamiento que crece cada vez más reconocido y apreciado. Entonces, sí. No, pero es muy interesante porque lo que quiere decir eso es que las fronteras, nosotros hablábamos de tres passing frontiers. El problema es que there are no frontiers anymore. Eso. Bueno, oh, bueno es que, uh, bueno, es nuestro, yo, yo veo que es, 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 es uno de nuestros retos de asegurar que estas fronteras artificiales no se respeten más. Porque, bueno, claro. son todos artificiales. Completamente, completamente. Bueno, vamos a ver si... Uh, eh, bueno, si hay otra persona intentando de entrar. No, por el momento no. Ok, entonces... Um, vamos a ver. Ok, entonces son las nueve con dos. Empezamos. Uh, ok, entonces, bienvenidos y bienvenidas al Simposio Caribe Plurilingüe. Uh, welcome to the 14th Simposio Caribe Plurilingüe. Es, la, es, es, es uh, el Caribe Plurilingüe uh, número 14, es la uh, décimo cuarto vez que <ríe> realizamos este evento. Entonces, uh, pero es la primera vez que uh, lo re realizamos de esta modalidad. Eso quiere decir que normalmente lo, uh, presentamos todo presencial, pero bueno, con las condiciones de la pandemia y todo eso, entonces uh, tenemos que realizarlo esta vez por uh, medio electrónico virtual. Uh, so this is the first time that we've ever done this, of the 14 times that we've done this, uh, by, uh, uh, with, uh, usually we do this uh, face to face, but this is the first time that we've done it electronically. So please be patient with us um, and forgive us if uh, there are any glitches or any problems because we are all just finding our way right now. So uh, we, we want to, um, excuse ourselves and to beg your forgiveness and to re recognize your patience in advance. <laughs> Entonces, eh, primera vez que realizamos este evento por medio electrónico, eh, así que queremos perdonarnos 
y queremos expresar nuestra apreciación de su paciencia en este proceso porque puede ser que habrá algunos <risa> trastornos, pero eh, eh, de todas maneras, eh, nosotros podemos contar siempre, siempre con el apoyo, eh, el apoyo, bueno, bien, bien, bien apreciado del Instituto de Estudios Caribeños. Y tenemos esta mañana el honor y el placer de tener el director del Instituto, Emilio Pantojas, el profesor Emilio Pantojas, para uh, darnos algunas palabras uh, para... Um, uh, como uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, we, no matter what the problems are, we always have the Institute for Caribbean Studies uh, behind at our backs to support us. And uh, we really appreciate that. And we also appreciate the fact that the director of the Institute is here this morning with us, Professor Emilio Pantojas. And he is here to give us uh, uh, a few words of introduction. So without uh, Further ado, let me introduce Professor Emilio Patojas. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Nick. Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Para mí es un placer eh, estar en esta decimocuarta edición del Caribe Plurilingüe eh, y sobre todo en esta primera edición digital, <laughs> a distancia. ¿no? Eh, y en realidad eh, nos llena de mucha alegría y mucho placer eh, primero, eh, haber heredado este proyecto eh, y segundo, que finalmente después de, mucho, de mucha discusión y de mucha, mucha, ponderar muchas posibilidades, lo logramos, ¿no? Y lo logró Nick, sobre todo. Nosotros simplemente le ofrecimos el apoyo que podíamos. Ya les garantizo que para la próxima edición vamos a tener un Zoom de un webinar que le da capacidad a 500 personas. Lo hemos ordenado, lo compramos pero en la Universidad de Puerto Rico todo tarda la vida y un mes más en llegar, así que estaremos en la próxima, en la edición extendida y agrandada, ¿no? Este, well, uh, it is a great pleasure and a great honor to me to be in the 14th edition of uh, 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 Caribe Plurilingüe, and it is uh, indeed a, a, a major uh, activity of importance to the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Uh, for the next activity, we hope that uh, we will have the Zoom webinar for 500 people. Uh, we have ordered it, ordered it but uh, in, in, at UPR, everything takes time. So by next semester, we will have it, and uh, hopefully everyone can join at the same time, and we can, we can take the whole thing in one go. Uh, but in, indeed, I congratulate Nick Faraklas and Professor Frank Flanagan for this uh, feat. I mean, this is a major feat. This is a great feat. And I wish you the best. And Did you hear that? Uh, just that last sentence, sorry. Oh, and, 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 and I hope to be able to record this and include it in the, in the, in the, in the series, in the, in, the, in, the, in the archive of the Caribbean Studies so that we'll have it not only for posterity, but for consultation for other students and other professors. Thank you very much to both of you, Nick and Frank, and best wishes and good luck. Thank you. Professor Pantojas, uh, really, uh, we don't know how to thank you because there's, you've supported us all of these years. And all, every one of those 14 times that we've had the Caribe Perilingue, it has been with the generous support of the Instituto. So um, we should all uh, give a great big uh, applause to the Instituto for uh, this wonderful, wonderful, making this possible, making this event possible. Okay, so uh, I think everybody has a copy of the program. And as you can see, uh, the first presentation on the program is also a book launch. Uh, and so it's by one of our most talented authors of literature, for young people uh, in Puerto Rico, Carmen Milagros Torres Rivera. And she's just uh, uh, publishing a book called Apparently Enchanted, Speculative Fiction and Afro-Puerto Rican Identity. So the special thing about, um, uh, one of the special things, there are many special things about uh, Carmen Milagros. But one of the special things is she is one of the few people on the island of Puerto Rico that is trying to promote um, literature for young people that has an Afro-Caribbean focus. 
Okay, now, um, Carmen, would you like me to, uh, how is your internet uh, right now? Would you like me just to project the video or would you like me to uh, do it's the slides? It's very glitchy right now. I barely can hear you well because it's coming on and off because of this issue that I mentioned. Okay. And to top it off, from time to time, they're cutting the lawn here. So it's becoming like a, a nightmare. <laughs> so if it's, I'm sorry about this. This has no, been really... Okay. No problem, no problem. It, it's not a problem at all. Uh, what we are going to do then is, um, is, is because uh, there are issues um, uh, with uh, the reception, with the internet reception uh, with, at uh, Carmen Milagros' house, and because there's a lot of background noise, we're going to, instead of being able to see her present um, directly, instead uh, she has, uh, as an emergency measure, recorded a video and let's hope that it works. Here it is. Excuse me, Professor. Uh, yes. Uh, it, it's not. Okay. I'm not uh, hearing it. We can't uh, hear it. Oh, one minute. One minute. Um, there's a problem with the with the audio. You can't hear it. No. no. We can see her talk, but we can't hear it. You can't hear it. Okay. Let's see what's going on here. Um. Okay, um, let's if, yeah, if okay. not, yeah, okay, let's see. Uh, so you couldn't hear the video, right? Okay, no. let's let's try starting it again, looking at the uh, the Professor, Professor Torres could just talk over the top, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, okay. I, I so give me a minute to get them the manuscript because there's a part, and I hope that the background no or the internet doesn't, uh. Well, but let me get that very fast. Give me let a moment. Me look at the yeah. The well, let, let's let's start it again. Could you let me know if it's if it's if you can hear it this time? Maybe it was just that first time. See. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's move. Unfortunately, the controls are down here. Mm. It's not. It's not her. Give me a moment to get the map. Well. The noise began, but give me a moment to get the manuscript so I can then explain the, yeah, the presentation. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, okay? go ahead and get the manuscript. That's fine. That's fine. Sorry about that. Uh, While we're waiting, Nick, I wanted to point out that I didn't help set this up. This is completely Nick Faircloth's <laughs> job. I don't also, want to credit for something I didn't do. Yeah, no, the other, the other professor who is responsible for this is Professor Danubang Kuabong, uh, who's uh, on his way. He's on his way. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I just want to see if we can, um, there's a way to do this. Uh, then okay, if let's... you want to, you can present the PowerPoint, even though there's some part that I will be jumping because of the time, time constraint, and I'll okay. explain it then. And okay. if you hear background noise of lawn, I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. Okay. It's... Let's let's get to your PowerPoint then. Yes. One minute. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's see. There's a movie. Where's the ah? Here it is. I think. Let me turn the timer oh, to. Yes, me. I'm trying to. Aha! Uh -huh. Here we go. All right. So, so we'll present the PowerPoint. Uh, yes. uh, Carmen Milagro. Yes. Okay. So Let's good morning. Yes. So good morning to all. 
and I want to first express my gratefulness and I'm very honored to be here to present uh, the novel Apparently Enchanted, which began as a project during my graduate studies. And I want to uh, express my gratitude to my dissertation committee, Dr. Alicia Posada, who was directing my dissertation, Dr. Alma Simonet and Dr. Nicola Faraclas, because these stories, many of them uh, in the novel branch from the courses that I took during my graduate studies. The novel, Apparently Enchanted, when I was in my graduate study, I presented the, 40, the first 44 pages and the committee, they gave lots of support and recommended that I continue working on the novel after graduation. And that was done and the novel was completed. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Um, well, that is basically the short stories that were completed as part of my dissertation. Uh, the next slide. But since this is about the novel, well, the novel, as well as the short story, the genesis uh, was because of the research I did during my graduate studies. While I was doing uh, that investigation, the following was uh, part of the findings. One of them was that there is a lack of afro perican characters in children and young adult books. The few that are identified are usually in Spanish or out of print. And that in itself causes a lot of issues because my concern is providing culturally relevant literature for the ESL classroom and also to present the African heritage that in Puerto Rico has been invisible or overlooked due to racism. That, that is another topic that we can talk later on, but it's a reality here in Puerto Rico. So the next slide. One of the most influential work for the novel was the 2013 publication of Arrancando Mito de Raiz that was published by the Instituto de Investigación Interdisciplinaria ILE of the University of Puerto Rico Calle. Within their work, they mentioned that in the 2010 census, there was the issue that most Puerto Rican identified themselves as white, showing this rejection toward the African heritage. This book was recommended by Dr. Lisa Posada and the findings in this book became a great part of the influence within the novel I was writing. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a slide that shows basically how in the United States also reflect this lack of representation of African uh, heritage. Uh, next slide. And this slide shows one of the books that shows afro perican character of the few that were identified during my research. Next slide. So Arrancando Mito de Raiz, in addition to showing about the census, it's a six year study that was conducted in two elementary schools, Calle and Arroyo. So it really uh, is very influential in terms of what I'm working with, which is mostly elementary uh, school literature for our students. And it showed that in that study, these children, most of them rejected their African heritage because they had this misconception about our Afro, Afro Puerican and African ancestors. Next slide. So, based on these uh, work, is that the short story Cookie Drums and Dream, which is still an unpublished work, and the novel Apparently Enchanted came into life. Apparently Enchanted, as it shows, um, it has APP in capital because. Camille, the main character, she is a young girl that lives in Puerto Rico and she rejects her African heritage. Uh, th through an app that she downloads in her cell phone, she travels to the past. And there is, she ends up in 19th century Puerto Rico at the threshold of the abolition of slavery and she's confused as a runaway slave, una cimarrona, which makes for her a very frustrating situation. So the novel, she, it, through, uh, most of the novel she's trying to return to her present time. But as she's doing that, she starts discovering about her African heritage and see all the misconceptions she has had about it. Uh, and the next uh, slide is the trailer of the novel that shows the first part. I don't know if, it's, if it can be heard. Uh, it's not heard there. Can you hear it? No, uh, no, unfortunately. Well, yes. let, let me explain. Basically, uh, and I'll put it up in YouTube. Camille, she is a young adult. She lives with her mother and grandmother. 
And in school that year, her social studies teacher mentions that they're going to do a special project for the Semana de la Puerto Ricanidad. And he decided to divide the students into the three main groups that are composed of Puerto Rican culture. She expects to be placed either with the Spaniard or the Taino, and she ends up being placed in the African group, causing for her basically a crisis. She's trying to convince her mother to talk to the teacher and tell him that that's a terrible error and place her in another group. Her mother is fascinated with her African heritage, so she's celebrating that her daughter's gonna learn more about her heritage. So there comes a conflict between the main character, the mother, and the grandmother basically sides with the, the granddaughter, saying that that's offensive, uh, that she's not an African uh, a girl, she is Taina India, but not African. So she basically becomes very rebellious, doesn't want to do the project, but then when things get really difficult, she must do the project. And as she's looking through uh, the, uh, her cell phone, she finds an app called Back to the Past, and she decides to download to see if it can help her find more about the period of that time that she's been assigned to. But the app is not symbolic, it's literal. She ends up in 19th century Puerto Rico. She's uh, classified as a runaway slave in the community that basically uh, takes her in to protect her. And then all the rest of the novel is this uh, battle of her of trying, first of all, not to be identified as a timarrona, and then trying to see how she can return to her present time. So the trailer basically summarizes in those minutes, so it can be turned off uh, to the next slide, summarizes this frustration of the main character. The novel, well, that is Camille and her issue. Within that plot, there are the myths that Arrancando Mito de Raiz mentions in their study. And one of the myths that is mentioned is that many Puerto Ricans believe that all Africans came as slaves to Puerto Rico, they were enslaved. That was an error. The first um, African descendant that came to the island was an explorer, Juan Garrido. There were many African descendants that lived in Puerto Rico that were not enslaved. They, uh, they worked on the island. But this conception is that if you are identified as afro Puerto Rican, basically you're a slave or you've been enslaved. And that basically causes rejection. In the novel, it appears in several instances. And one that I would like to share is the one when she's talking with Delia, one of the women that live in the community because I, int I basically interwove character from the short story of Koki Drums and Dreams in within the novel. So one of the characters, the one that appeared in the Ungrateful Koki that I shared many years ago in one of Professor Farrakhan's classes, she appears here. She is uh, after the short story ended. So here uh, Camille says to her, I decided to ask Doña Delia, are you a freed slave? No. I was born free, why do you ask? I felt uncomfortable, but I needed to express what I had bottled up before even coming to this place or time. I believe, well, I thought all black were slave or had been. Pobrecita, Camille, you have been so locked up in that hacienda that you came from. No, Camille, not all have been slaves. And she continues on discussing this issue. So that's the first myth and Camille starts discovering all those myths that she has had and believed true as incorrect. So the next myth, which appears in the next slide, uh, uh, that can be jumped, that basically is about enslaved people accepted their fate without resistance. Uh, many times we remember or we look towards other islands where there were these very uh, intense revolts. We have to think, we have to remember Puerto Rico is a small island. Also the geography, the ge geography of Puerto Rico is not the same as other island for the type of maroon uh, that existed in the other island. But there was resistance here in many forms, not only uh, through a physical means to obtain their liberty, but other more subtle means. But that is a reality that has happened. There are many books and study like uh, uh, Esclavo Reverde or Baral that shows all these type of resistance. So in the novel, Camille uh, meets uh, a, a character, Juan, who is a young boy who has escaped several times and has been caught and been brought back into this play system. When she's trying to go to a place that has been told to her that she might be able to return back to her present time, 
she meets one who is a very friendly character and decides to help her, even though she's very ungrateful and very cynical many at times. As she's traveling with him, she begins to open up about one of another myth that she has about this lack of resistance. So in the novel, uh, she also discusses this in some parts. In one of the parts, she says, uh, then I, uh, and then I answer, well, is that all you slaves do? I mean, you all slaves seem so happy. Some of you try to escape, get caught, return, try escaping again. Oh my God, se me cayó. Okay, um, am, I, am I here? Yeah, you're here. Oh, because I, I lost my, I can see you. Well, then let me continue. Then I answer, well, is that what all you slaves do? I mean, you all slaves seem so happy. Some of you try to escape get caught, return, try escaping again, and now swinging from a branch. Then there are others singing and dancing and waiting to see if a miracle comes and they are free. Really? That's all there is to being a slave? Estoy decepcionada. And there we have one that he does develop and discusses the issue of how they have basically resisted enslavement in different forms. Uh, the next slide, I've lost, I can't see none of you. I'm trying to see if I can find where am I because what I have is a... Uh, okay, you're, you're at myth number three. Myth number three, Carmen. Okay, yes, that part I know is that I don't see any, okay, uh, any of you, but I'll continue with myth number Wait, three. Wait, uh, uh, one minute though, does everybody see the presentation? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So Carmen, they, they can, I continue. They can I continue see your on. Yes. Okay. Myth number three uh, is the one that this uh, discusses that uh, about the 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 contribution of Afro Puerto Rican. Many people think about the folkloric aspect or in terms of food and dancing, but that's not all. Uh, our African ancestor and Afro Puerican ancestor they contributed in great ways in our culture. Our first Puerto Rican painter was Jose Campeche, just to mention an example. So in the novel, I decided to include the, the, a very important woman that has basically been very invisible, Celestina Cordero, the sister of Rafael Cordero, who helped and who contributed a lot in education. She resisted the system when she was denied uh, the license to be an educator but she continued to she obtained the license. So Ma Camille, since she is considered a runaway slave and they assume that she doesn't know how to read or write, she is sent to Magdalena to learn how to read and write. And there she learns about Celestina because Magdalena tells her, um, there I met and there I met Celestina Cordero. She had a school for young girls. She gave classes for free, not only for the white girls, but for the black girls as well. And she gave me the opportunity to learn to read and write. So throughout uh, Camille's journey, she discovers that all these conceptions that she had about being afro Puerto Rican are incorrect. She travels and she goes through this adventure, but throughout the novel, the goal is that our readers are able to understand and embrace their African heritage and be proud of it. Uh, since I can see, I mean, I have I only have this image of Zoom 5.0 is here. I don't see what is being mentioned. Uh, the next slide, if I'm not mistaken, is the one about what are what has been done with the with it's this your, novel. Yeah, it's your FAI proposal. Okay. Yes, the proposal after I wrote this novel, I didn't know what to do in terms of publication. And then I decided to submit it to uh, the University of Puerto Rico, Macau. They have a research office and they have the five. These are funds that are given to educators so they can uh, uh, begin a research or a creative project. They have basically, they helped me in terms of getting a design for the book cover by Carlene Gomez, a student from communication. The first uh, copies of the novels that will be printed in Arte Grafica is covered by this, uh, this funds and will be donated to a school, Juan Ponce de Leon. That school, they pro, uh, the teacher, Ms. Joanny Morales, she accepted using the manuscript with her students to see how they, what was their feedback in terms of the novel, which has been favorable. So that school will receive those first copies. In the next slide, which is uh, 
the future plans about the novel. Right? Am I correct? Yes, future plans, yes. 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 The novel, well, due to all these uh, challenges that we have faced in the past year, 2020, with the earthquake and the pandemic, it has been uh, delayed the uploading of this uh, manuscript into Amazon. Right now I have the, the, the last manuscript that has the, the last revision before it gets now approved by the university and we get it in Amazon because the goal of the novel is that it will be available not only for a limited group like in Juan Ponce de Leon but for a great uh, for audience not only in Puerto Rico but outside of the island and I think after that one is the acknowledgments if I'm yes. not mistaken yes okay well in terms of acknowledgement I have to begin uh, giving thanks to the program of of our, our program here in Rio Piedra of literature and linguistics because all these stories and all this project began in those courses. I also want to acknowledge, uh, now I almost acknowledge uh, the voice actors of the trailer, uh, even though you couldn't listen to it, it was a former student from the English BA program and an, and a teacher, an English teacher from Juan Ponce de Leon School. And I had two at Anodem editors who were former students, Mariana Cruz and Carolina Rivera. So I'm really, really grateful to all in the English department and thank you for listening for the presentation. I'm sorry for all these uh, technical issues that I'm having at my house, but I'm really grateful that of the support because the novel has been, a, uh, was a reality thanks to all the support from the graduate program in Rio Piedra. So thank you very much. And I'm trying to see how I can return back to you and see you because I can't see none of you. So have a very nice <laughs> Sorry. day. Sorry. Yes. Well, applause. Excellent presentation, uh, despite all of the technical difficulties that we were facing. But uh, you did a great job. You uh, you were able to face the difficulties, and uh, and and uh, your presentation was fine. It worked very well despite Thank all you. of the difficulties. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so our next, we're going to do questions after uh, the three presenters for this session have presented. Although, uh, yeah, so let's um, go to our next presentation now. Our next I'm presentation is- I'm going to uh, disconnect, okay. Yeah, our next presentation will uh, be by Frank Flanagan. It's entitled Law and Order, the Headlines of Hegemony. Okay, so uh, it'll take me a moment to get to the... Um... Uh, while you're doing that, Nick, yeah. I want to thank my students for showing up. I really appreciate it. I think it's important to have students involved. Uh, I wanted to also congratulate Professor Torres. Um, I taught elementary school in the Bronx for five years, and we never had enough texts that were relevant in English or Spanish at that time. But I think it's a very important book uh, because... I know that the most powerful person, the richest person in the Caribbean was actually a Puerto Rican man in the 1830s, and he was uh, African, and he was free, and that's, uh, he owned uh, the largest plantation in Puerto Rico, and I can't remember his name, you can Google it, but that's a story that needs to be told for sure. Okay, so uh, the okay. title of, of, of uh, Professor Flanagan's presentation is The Use of Reactionary Language to maintain power, law, and order. Okay, thank you, next. <laughs> I wanted to start with um, England, and the reason that I'm doing that is because a lot of American law and common law begins with, uh, with England, and I wanna reference uh, the notion of the King's Peace, which is an Anglo-Saxon and Norman England notion, uh, with a, uh, basically it was a top-down power trajectory namely the power, uh, the control of the powerless to seek to consolidate their power. Um, in ancient England, the king used the threat of violence to enforce the social order, often against the poor. Today, you can see the Republican presidents backed by uh, affluent whites use the threat of violence in an attempt to coerce power, control of non-whites, women protesters. We can see this today with Donald Trump. Um, and also recently, they were using Homeland Security agents I think illegally against the protesters in several cities. Next, there he is, Mr. Law and Order, as though he was the first one, but we actually have a long tradition of law and order in the United States, uh, but Donald Trump embraced it as many Republicans can, and there's a long tradition. 
And I'll discuss that in the next slide next. I talk fast, Nick. <laughs> okay. Um, so in response to, it's really a lot of this is interesting. It's been response to black power, uh, black folks. Um, and this is, re, uh, Trump got very excited about the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's no doubt because basically it's uh, black folks demanding an equal uh, share of the power. But there's a tradition going back way before uh, Donald Trump to Richard Nixon, um, who responded to the riots in the American cities in 1968. And then Barry Goldwater um, really rested a lot of, uh, almost got promoted as president because he wanted to, uh, his platform was basically structured on keeping uh, black people in the South disenfranchised. Next. So in, in a lot of ways, I mean, a lot of people don't see this, but it's pretty obvious now that Republicanism really is equated with white power and white supremacy. Uh, and for generations, the, the phrase has been used very effectively as a coded term to consolidate working class white voters, especially in the South and Midwest. This could be seen as Trump's voter base, basically. So the laws are written and enforced by whites over non-whites. I think it's important to say that. And then they, the, what is the order? The order is to maintain the traditional social order of whites over non-whites. It's the status quo. It's men over women, rich over poor. And of course, we use, uh, Trump uses slogans like make America great again, which means a return to the old order, to a time when whites had even more power over non-whites. Next, please. So then comes up the suburbs. Trump started fixating on the suburbs. This mythological 1950s suburb of this ideal social order. Uh, he, uh, in Trump world, the houses, the people in the skin are all, skin color are all alike. And the poor and other people, people he's othered, are safely zoned out, gated and coded outside. And this is actually true. You can see this with the gated communities in Puerto Rico even. Uh, the elites pass laws to keep low income people out. Um, this uh, Make America Great Again means to maintain white power, patriarchy and capitalism. Trump also uses the fear of the other when he references the opposite order. And then he refers to the chaos of the cities of course, where poor and non-white people might live. Next. Next. Nick, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, it, it, did, it did go okay, next. We have, a little uh, uh, so we have a little freeze up. There we go. Yeah. So Trump often equates keeping America great with uh, a platonic binary. For instance, social change is bad. Well, tradition is good. Those who challenge the social order are bad. Well, those who maintain the social order are good. Oftentimes, this older people versus young people, too. Those who disrupt the white patriarchal capitalist system, who are they? Trump uh, calls them terrorists, socialists, and criminals, but they're really just average citizens, um, often peaceful protesters, who want change. They want to the, the share power. They want, the, uh, they want to make rich white males share power. I mean, it's as simple as that. And I, here's a little list here. Um, uh, what is the social order? Well, it's in-group, out-group uh, psychology, really. It's a desire for change versus no change, male, female. And you can go down this list. I don't think there'll be many surprises. I've got to list the youth, young versus old, Nick. I don't know okay. why. There's a lot of things that could go on this list. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, go back, Nick, please. Uh, go yeah, forward. Yeah, on the next. No, I'm ready to go next. Okay. So it's the consent of the powerless. So Antonio Gramsci um, is a very famous person uh, who wrote a lot about uh, hegemony, but uh, he wrote about it differently. Typically it's thought of as like uh, control of the state over other states, um, geographically and military. But Gramsci was really talking about control over the narrative, over um, how people thought about themselves. And uh, he said that the, the powerful control the powerful through manipulative discourse. That's like discussion, talk, uh, media, backed up by threats of violence, of course. However, the powerful need the tacit consent of the masses to support the social order. So this notion of consent is actually really important. Um, and people say, well, that comes through elections. But I think it's actually deeper than that. But I think also the irony of this consent is that a lot of people who give consent are actually uh, working class people. And they actually give up power in order to keep the powerful in power. And so this is a confusing. 
why would the masses, the working people, give their consent? And, or in other words, why would chickens vote for Colonel Sanders? I'm sure a lot of people are wondering that. Um, Cramsey suggests this consent is given by the masses because of the prestige of the ruling class. Poor people and working class people are really impressed with affluent people. For instance, the dominated groups are impressed with the wealth and the power of the ruling elite, and they have confidence in that power and perhaps wish to be like them someday, as unlikely as that may be. This is the pathos of the situation. A lot of these poor working class people are never going to be uh, affluent. And, but it all goes, and you can see um, when Donald Trump was doing The Apprentice, the whole notion of rich white people controlling the world and firing poor black people. And um, some of it's true, but some of it is not very aspirational and needs to be uh, struggled against, basically. Next. Next. Yeah, it's uh, thank you. Ticket. So how does Trump, that's okay. How does Trump convince poor whites to exercise violence against black demonstrators and white supporters who could ostensibly be their partners, even when poor whites themselves do not appear to have a realistic prospect of wealth, prestige, or power? Why, why, why? The power elites use discourse to convince poor whites they also have a vested interest in the maintenance of the social order. Uh, make America great again, a uh, fantasy about going back to the suburbs in the 50s. So this interest actually could mean economic jobs. It could mean, um, uh, go back, please, Nick. Uh, yeah. yeah. It could mean um, that they're better than blacks. That seems to be really important for a lot of working class whites. It could also mean sexual preference, reproductive uh, order, which I don't want to get into, but I think it's fascinating. Next, please. I'm sorry I talk so fast. I'm from the New York uh, metropolitan area. Um, so ideology is like really important. Ideology are shared social belief systems. And Van Dyke talks about that. I wish I could talk more about Van Dyke because I think he's a genius. Uh, the ideology of Trump world seeks to maintain patriarchy, Eurocentrism, and capitalism. Uh, ca Trump believes that uh, an oligarchy, which is a small group of people, uh, which is based on Calvinism, should maintain power indefinitely. So he uses the law. I mean, this is why he won't leave office. So the weird part about this, uh, Professor Fairclaus, is I thought that this would not, my subject would not be topical, but since Trump refuses to leave, there's still some topicality here. So, um, so he, uses, he, he uses law written by the elites to maintain the social order. Ironically, he's only able to keep the current social order of land ownership, Land ownership is central to everything. Don't forget that. Wealth and income inequality by using the consent of the class, uh, working class as enforcers of that order. So basically Trump convinces working class people to enforce the order against other working class uh, people and even the middle class. So I thought back, I'm thinking, why is this happening? How is it even possible? And I thought back, well, what about the patrols of the Southern uh, plantation? And we just read a book are called the Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. And my students all know about the patrols. And uh, these were poor white men who did not get much money for policing blocks. They went out at night. Uh, instead, they received social status from uh, rich Southern plantation owners. Telling these, uh, this was enough for them, apparently, as long as they were not at the bottom of the social order, then they would support the order and their own lack of power. And so I asked, what the, might this suggest about poor white men who follow Trump's law and order rhetoric and ideology? I think the sad suggestion is a lot of times people don't need wealth or, uh, you know, monetary. They don't need to have material wealth or anything. Sometimes it's enough just to be better than another group. And that's an area where I think I would maybe be willing to do more research. Um, Thank you so much uh, for listening. I'm sorry if I talk so quickly. I'm supposed to be a good role model for my students on public speaking, uh, Professor Fairclass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, great presentation, applause. I'll give you applause on behalf of everybody else because uh, most people are Excellent. muted. Excellent, yeah. excellent presentation, I love it. There's a okay. lot. Thank so you. the third presentation was supposed to be Professor Kuabong, but I think he's probably having um, transmission difficulties with uh, his internet. So I'm thinking that actually, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll just go on to the questions. So does anybody have questions for Carmen or for Frank about the presentations? Carmen's presentation about the book uh, that she wrote uh, and uh, Frank's presentation about 
how uh, the social order is preserved through hegemony, particularly uh, around uh, issues of race. Any questions? I'm hoping my students say something. <laughs> I've trained them uh, to ask questions. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, Carmen. Yes. Uh, I'm interested, you mentioned about the order, this binary. Uh, basically, and you mentioned Van Dyke. Can you talk a little bit more about that work? Because I'm interested yeah. about that. Well, um, Van Dyke has a lot to say about that. Um, without his theories in front of me, it might be difficult because I'm not a linguistic, so I'm just kind of delving into this area. But basically, Van Dyke said that uh, the powers that be use ideology to and discourse to manipulate the masses. Uh, and rather effectively, um, but I kind of came uh, came more interested in what Gramsci was saying about the consent. Okay. But um, Van Dyke is just somebody who constantly writes and speaks about um, power, uh, racism, and ideology. Uh, uh, I I don't know if I answered your question. No, yeah, uh, and basically uh, your presentation resents uh, a clear view of what is happening with this greater make. Make America Great Again, which I find it yeah. so shocking because uh, now that we were near the elections and I was looking in my yes. social media, I will find people that, sh in my, perspe my perspective, shouldn't be, I mean, celebrating this type of philosophy. And they were the first one and very intense in their defense about this great, Make Great America Again. And they were basically those that are going to be according to this discourse, are not really the ones who are welcome. And they're basically defending it with all their passion. So it's very interesting, yeah. your presentation. Well, I think what's unique about what's going on now, and I've been around a long time. I don't know how old you are. I don't want to, to point that out. But 51. I've been <laughs> a long time, and I've never seen anything like what's going on, um, you know, with the dialogue and the open uh, racism uh, is was never part of my childhood or my young adulthood. So it's, a, it's just a stunning time. And um, I don't know what to say. It's just upsetting. And the weird part is uh, when I told Professor Fairclass that I was sad that I'd written about these topics because they wouldn't be irrelevant because Trump would be gone and he's actually not gone. Oh, no, no, no. yeah. This fits into actually my argument about the whole notion of the status quo and trying to maintain power um, through dialogue, which is what exactly what Trump is doing. He just won't leave. So uh, this is what affluent white males are doing. It's like a last gasp of their uh, their power. But I think demographics uh, are just going to defeat uh, eventually defeat them. But they're going down ugly. But uh, it's very it's very interesting because I was born and I was raised in New York, and as an Afro Puerican uh, girl, I saw lots of tension, even though it was subtle. But now with uh, this past government, uh, many of my friends, some that live in Florida, they say that it's like open a Pandora box of those right. things that have been repressed. Now they will openly express them without any fear. Sure. And it, and it reminds me also the course of language and power the fire class gave because it basically was seen so intensely these past four years. All right. these discourse and the way it moved the people towards these uh, uh, in these type of ideology. So it was something that brought a lot of things into the scenario. Well, I'm glad that uh, Professor Fairclass calls the class language and power because we really need to talk about power. I mean, black power and the notions of, uh, you know, racial power is something that we think is in the 60s, but it's actually going on right now. Um, I want to also point out Van Dyke has some really excellent uh, videos on YouTube that are definitely worth a listen. Um, he excels uh, in lecture. His lectures are great. I listen to him in the car. So if you ever want to listen to them, I can definitely uh, recommend those. Oh, I will check that because I really, I enjoy your presentation because it opens up a lot of these issues because I communicate with my friends in the States and yeah. some of them feel so shocked at the way things shifted in these last four years in such an overt type of expression against things so, that were not told or expressed so openly as they're doing it now. So I think it's, even though I presented this, I did not answer the question of why really um, working class white people um, 
allow um, what would be ostensibly their partners would be working class people of color, why they side with the, the rich white oligarchy uh, time and again. So, I mean, I think this is something that you could easily write a book about, and I'm sure books have probably been written, but that's what interests me is we need somebody to build bridges between working class white folks and working class people of color, because once that happens, I think this whole game of uh, the affluent white power oligarchy is going to be in trouble. Yeah, so this uh, gets back to a point that Carmen made. When Carmen was talking about uh, Cimarrones, when you were talking about Maroons, yes. mm -hmm. okay, um, the situation in Puerto Rico uh, looked like it, it, it in a way, uh, it was extremely similar to the other islands in terms of Maroons. There were lots of Maroons, but it wasn't just um, people of African descent who were running away to the mountains. Also people of European descent, and also there are people of indigenous descent there. Yeah. So really you can, you can even bring that into that dimension into um, your work because uh, uh, this whole idea of the Hibaro, the, before the Hibaro uh, uh, became bleached, became uh, yes. whitened mm -hmm. during the 19th, yes. cent 19th century uh, and the 20th century. Basically, the Hibaro was a person of mixed um, yes. African, indigenous, and European descent. So, and this is one of the reasons why, uh, this is part of the, the answer to your question, Frank, because in fact, uh, this was a major threat to what was happening in uh, North America, the first colonies of North America, people of African, indigenous, and European descent were running away and living together. So they really had to drive a wedge between people. And basically what they did was they gave guns and titles to indigenous land to people of European descent. They had them go to the frontier, kill indigenous people, take their land, and then also prevent people of African descent from running away to live with indigenous people, which had happened a lot too. So this idea of a buffer, so people of European descent actually uh, were given two types of privilege. They were given titles to land and they were given a gun. Okay, and you can see um, today that uh, that lives on. So one of the main things that the Trump supporters are fixated on are their guns. <laughs> and also uh, uh, their uh, hatred towards people of African descent but also the hatred towards people of indigenous descent and seeing the, those people as um, in competition with them because the land of the land of the United States was all indigenous land. And the only reason why they got land, they, the, the people of European descent got land was by killing the indigenous people. And so there's all of that going on too. So, so if, you, if you look at the history, there's an archeology span of this. That, so um, yeah. So which brings up another question I want to ask you, Nick. Do you think some of these rabid white uh, nationalist supremacists are descendants of people who actually committed genocide and stole the land? Oh, absolutely. So in other words, uh, if you look at the areas of the United States where people support Trump, it's just those areas where you have the most recent history. I mean, the whole country was stolen from indigenous people. The whole country was built on money made from uh, the, the stolen labor of people of African descent. I mean, the whole country is, but the, the regions of the country that were the most recently uh, involved in this are the South and the West. The West with the indigenous people, where, where pe the, all of those people in the cowboy movies that now, uh, that, that whole tradition in the West and those states that vote for Trump from Texas going on up to Idaho and Montana, those yeah. states are the states that have the most recent experience with the massacre of indigenous people and the stealing of indigenous land oh. and then all of the Appalachian region. So the Appalachian region was the region where this actually started. And there you have this, um, this dynamic of not only killing indigenous people and taking their land, but also of keeping the enslaved on the plantations to the east. Professor so Farrakha, uh, yes. oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead, Carmen is that when you're mentioning this, it basically brings up about Little House on the Prairie books of Laura Ingle Wilders, which um, they were very popular and even, there was even a war name after Laura Ingle Wilder. Like two years ago, the name was taken off because of all these issues. And we had conversation in Schumann's literature about this, 
about the novel because basically uh, the novel deal with this issue that you have mentioned. They were traveling towards the West where they were basically taking away the land of the indigenous people. So it basically is very interesting, this mm -hmm. aspect. And if you look at Trump's campaign, basically he targeted, the first people he targeted were not African-Americans, they were Mexicans, because Mexi Mexicans represent the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Yes. <clears throat> so, and the number of Latinos uh, in the U.S. Is, 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 is rising very rapidly. Yes. And so for him, that's a threat. He sees these are the indigenous people coming back to the, mm -hmm. uh, and yes. to, and, 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 and wow. so what yes. he is doing, he's making people feel that they are, that, that Latinos are a threat, making uh, people of European descent feel that Latinos are a threat and people of African descent are a threat. But actually, uh, actually those are the people, like Frank said, who are the logical allies of the pe of the poor people of European descent, the real the real threat to the to the people uh, uh, to the people to the poor people of European descent are the rich people of European descent. They're the ones who are actually yeah. stealing their um, yeah. stealing their livelihoods right now. So when they used to have union jobs where they were making a decent wage, now they're all making minimum wages. Their um, retirement funds are being taken away from them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Carmen, I want to ask you about yes. the experiences so far. Uh, with uh, some of the, uh, the books that you've written and the short stories you've written. What kind of response have you gotten from teachers and from students? Okay, basically the short stories of Koki Drums and Dream, I only share them very privately, which I'm going to now work seriously in putting them in publication, but they have been positive. In terms of the novel, uh, Ms. Morales, who was the one who used it in her classroom, she said that it opened up a lot of conversation with the students. They were able to relay with Camille. I'm waiting for her to be able to meet with her personally to give me the activities that she did with her students to see the response. Because uh, it, she used it with seventh graders and she said that as she got great response that they were able to relate with Camille. They got upset with us, uh, with her actions. But right now the goal is to open it up for, to be used if anyone uh, is interested in using the short story, Koki Drums and Dreams, let me know in your classroom. I'll share, I'll send you the manuscript so they can be, they can be used. Because the goal is to open up about the Afro, afro uh heritage because it's basically invisible. People say that they're not racist in Puerto Rico, but when it comes to uh, the details, they do not want to be identified as afro Rican. Not everyone, but a, a, gr a group of people. So, um, Professor Torres, yes. why do so many Puerto Ricans identify as white, do you think? Uh, basically, that, they fill out the forms and they check off the white box. Yes, and this uh, for the census, there was a very big movement, at least as much as possible, to open up and identifying those that are Afro-Puerto Rican as Afro-Puerto Rican. It has to do with our heritage of the uh, enslavement system. Um, uh, with the Spaniards, it was basically to move up the scale, you have to be whitened. That's why uh, mejorar la raza. So still this, 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 is, this ingrained uh, issue about improving the race, even though I have seen changes in the last year that there are many younger, uh, uh, younger generation embracing the African heritage that mm -hmm. was not seen in the past. For example, in UPR Macau, we had a group of students uh, dancing bomba, but it wasn't just dancing bomba. It was basically embracing the culture, not only in terms of the dance, also in the way uh, the, the young university student uh, breaking away from this stereotype of their hair always being straightened. I see more that our students are more open to uh, presenting themselves as they are, not this image imposed by others. But there's still a lot to move towards. I wanted to congratulate you. I thought it was very clever in your narrative that you act. You have a some a student using an app. I mean, I feel like a lot of these traditional, so-called traditional stories or whatever, they don't use technology. The kids are using this, so using that is very clever. I also think yes. in the Amazon, it could end up being a big hit because there's just such a need. I think it's going to open up a whole uh, market for you, an audience that is going to be awesome. So. I congratulate you. you and I wish you luck um, for sure. Thank you. Basically, okay, well, stories, go ahead, go ahead, Carmen. No, the story basically began because when I started my graduate study, it was, that wasn't basically the goal, it was Caribbean children's literature. And it kept evolving. Also, I have to uh, acknowledge the, uh, 
a, a very per special person, uh, Summer Edwards. She had an e-sign called Ana System, and I recommend if you're interested, it's still available. She is uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, and she's very passionate about Caribbean children's literature. And many of the works, I was able to find them through her page because she has uh, like a bookstore where she identified the books by countries. And working with her helped me open up into the reality that here in Puerto Rico, we barely have books that present afro perican characters and the courses during my graduate study. So mm -hmm. it was basically a evolution, not only in terms of studying, but also even the way I was thinking. Okay, it's a, this is a great discussion. Unfortunately, it's 10 o'clock, so we have to move on. But uh, thank you to our two presenters. Um, our next presenter is uh, Norma Liz Rodriguez Santiago. And she's going to be talking uh, about the cinema of Maria Govan. The title of her presentation is Grounded to the Caribbean Space, Nature, Carnival, in, uh, Nature and Carnival in the Cinema of Maria Govan. Okay, let me get that up here. Uh, Hi. <laughs> um, I want to mention um, before starting that my presentation is mostly images. And this is a tiny, tiny part of my dissertation from the first two chapters of my dissertation that um, is being directed by Professor Michael Sharp at the English department in UPR, Rio Piedras. Okay, um, okay so I'm let's not, start. Okay, uh, at least um, one minute. Um, uh, Norma, is this the first slide or is this a, dip, this is the middle? No, the one before, but it's fine if, 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 if you want to leave that one um, or you want to uh, put the first one with the title. Uh, I'm good with it. Okay, this is the second slide, is it? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna try to speak slow so you guys can understand and follow me. Okay, uh, in the last 20 years, female filmmakers in the Caribbean and its diaspora have been writing, directing, and producing um, original content in the form of fiction and documentary films. However, the work of these filmmakers has not been thoroughly explored within the realm of Caribbean and film studies. The work of Bahamian filmmaker Maria Govan highlights the issues surrounding queer and heterosexual women within the Caribbean. And this is the second slide, yes. This presentation will focus on selected scenes from Govan's two fiction films, Rain, released in 2008, and Play the Devil, released in 2016, in order to look into how the filmmaker uses carnival and nature to root and establish her main characters within the Caribbean space. The filmmaker uses Carnival and the Junkanoo celebration in the Bahamas to influence and transform the action in her stories. Furthermore, this presentation argues that Govan roots the Caribbeanness of her films in the inclusion and characterization of nature and Carnival celebrations. Uh, we can change the, the slide. Rain is Govan's first feature length film. Uh, one minute, Norma. Um, and it tells Norma. The story. Norma. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, let me let me let me try to get back in because uh, it's not. It's not changing. It's not changing. Like... No, but that's okay. It's okay. Uh, just one minute. We'll 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 we'll, we'll try to fix it. Um, okay. Yeah, it's uh, it sometimes this happens. Okay, let's that's, see. That's can, uh, let's get this back to the beginning. Let's see. Okay. We can go to the number three, which no, is oh, right. I know, I know. I just want to make sure that we can change the slide. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go back. Rain, as we can see here, a, a couple of, of selections from, from the film, is Goa's first feature length film. So it tells the story of Rain, a young girl who lives with her grandmother Rosalie on Ragged Island in the Bahamas. After her grandmother passes away, Rain goes after her mother. She's being raised by her grandmother. When her grandmother passes away, she goes uh, running after her mother named Ethel and now self-named Glory. Her mother self-names herself Glory. And she lives in Nassau in a dangerous neighborhood called The Graveyard. And that's the next slide. It's not okay. changing? Uh, one minute, I can change it here, I think. Um... Uh, yeah, let me change it here. Yeah, there we go. Can you see it? I don't know because the image just... Okay, it, it'll shot. come. It, it will come. It will come. Can you see it now? 
Yeah, awesome. The graveyard. Okay. As you can see, this is the graveyard, the dangerous neighborhood where um, where rain um, um, comes into Nassau. This is where she goes. It is in Nassau where Rain will be encouraged by her track coach, Miss Adams, to become part of the school team, confront her mother's drug addiction and prostitution, and manage her new life in the city. Now the next slide, in her second feature, Play the Devil, Govan tells the story of Gregory, a young bright man who lives with his grandmother and older brother in Parham and Trinidad. So this, the first film takes place in Bahamas, the second one takes place in Trinidad. Gregory meets James, a wealthy, mature, married man with whom he becomes romantically involved. When Gregory decides to leave James, he pushes on to continue the affair. Their last encounter occurs during Carnival, where Gregory performs as a jab jab of Blue Devil, which is what we see here. Rain and Play the Devil follow the three structure of Hollywood films, presentation of the main characters and conflict, climax and conflict resolution. Both films start with the introduction of the main characters, Rain in Rain and Gregory in Play the Devil both teenagers. Rain delivers food to a nearby neighbor. He challenges her to raise home and beat a storm. This scene serves as a metaphor for the question the film directs to its audience. Is Rain going to be able to beat the fast approaching storm? Golan decided to follow a similar structure in Play the Double, giving the audience a metaphor uh, representative of how the film will develop. The film starts with Gregory performing in the play, You Can Lead a Host to Horse to Water by Winston Saunders. Wearing long pants and a heavy makeup, Gregory is narrating the story of a man and a horse, and that's the next slide. And we can see here Gregory in the play. The struggle of the old fool and the horse works as a metaphor for a struggling relationship between Gregory and James, issues that Govan explores and aims to resolve throughout the film. As the film progresses, we get to know Gregory and James mostly through conversations between them. In Rain, since both Rain and Glory live together, we are inserted in their everyday life, and the filmmaker explores the characters more or less equally. However, James is, um, is not as developed by Govan as Gregory. Um, however, both of them are equally representative of the oppression and fear queer men suffer every day in the Caribbean region who live under toxic masculinity practices they feel forced to perform and employ. Change of slides. It is during a carnival celebration the morning night after the jab jabs go down the mountains of Paramount to the main celebration in the city that Gregory has a discussion and fight with James John. The climax of the film starts with Gregory dancing as a jab jab, and this is where they are coming down the mountains, dressed as jab jabs. The filmmaker positions um, pardon, um, Gregory in a trance, impersonating the devil. The camera follows Gregory's body, the blue paint on his skin, his transformation from, from a shy, bright boy who goes to a prestigious private school to a young man possessed by the drums and the spirit of carnival. He yells at James while dancing, slaps him a couple of times, getting some of the blue paint on his chest and face. We can see the people around them also yelling, dancing, getting lost between the fire, the costumes, and the music. And it's the sound of drums and, car and, and dancing, Gregory shouts at James for following him to Carnival. When they move to a faraway place to talk, they get into a fight, ending with the unplanned death of James. Change of, of sight. In rain, while rain is running towards Miss Adams, after having a discussion with her mother, Glory, who we see here, um, walks around in a trance-like state through the June Canoe celebration. It is there with the sound of the drums and the movement of people on the streets when Glory decides to make a change in her and her daughter's life. It is through Carnival, the sound of drums, and her continuous movement on the streets where she makes the decision to look for help. She goes to a police station. Reading concludes with Rain being accompanied by Miss Adams to the Garifta Games trial, which is a very important sports competition in the Caribbean where she aims to find an opportunity to classify to the main games and a future in tracking. She is positioned on the track. We hear the signal for the start um, to begin and the scene cuts to a close-up shot of Rain, again in Ragged Island, running towards the bright, bright blue ocean. Both Rain and Play the Devil use Carnival celebrations as setting during pivotal moments of character development. Carnival is the place where both Gregory and Glory transform. In these films, Carnival not only functions as an inhibitor, but also as a healing practice. 
change of life. Allowing her structure to have an open ending, Govan separates her work from a cage and restricted film structure, giving her art, her characters, and the audience an array of options. The open ending structure works for these Caribbean women and queer characters who have endured the invisibility, lack of options, and oppression by their communities and government. They are taking the power position and taking control of their future. It is important to also point out that Govan transfers literally and metaphorically her, um, her characters during the final sequence from the original places to places where they are surrounded by nature. Rain, Gregory, and Death, which we see here because this is Death, Gregory's best friend in the film, approach bodies of water at the end of their films. Govan is not creating a new cinematic structure or language. Still, she is not constricting her work by following the same cinematic practice that created a stereotypical image of the Caribbean subjects and vilified its landscapes. While at the same time, they have been ignoring no mainstream media, the issues affecting people here in the region. Both Rain and Play the Devil employ elements where female and queer characters break away from the private space while appropriating public spaces, change of life. Gloria appropriates a public space, the streets of Nassau during Carnival, where women are part of, but not a dominant factor. She's breaking away from the space of her home and the neighborhood where she has access to drugs and is employed as a sex worker. Her daughter Rain also takes part in the reappropriation of public spaces and uses her track practices as a tool to find herself in Nassau. The actions of Gloria and Rain are breakthrough because as black women, they are taking the public space that has been negated to them for so long by oppressive heteropatriarchal practices, and I apologize about that truck that is passing by. In Play the Devil, Govan succeeds in encompassing local and cultural components. Gregory performs as a jab jab or blue devil during carnival, making part of his preparation for the performance and the performance act central to the film's final act. While performing as a jab jab, Gregory is allowed to lose inhibitions and unravel parts of his hidden self leading him to act on rage and fear. In the spirit of carnival, Gregory leaves out of his restraints behind and confronts James. After fighting and believing that he had killed him, Gregory and Dave position James' body inside of his car and drive it off a cliff. Both Dev and Gregory run back to carnival celebrations and continue their dancing. The final sequence takes Dev and Gregory back to the deep forest, and this is one of the scenes um, of the water, uh, both young men, still dressed as jab jabs, immerse their bodies into the water in order to cleanse and purify themselves in a ritual-like manner. Next slide. Therefore, carnival celebrations are one of the main elements Govan repeats in her two films. Here we see them going in the water, asserting her visual and thematic aesthetics. During the first sequences of Rain and Play the Devil, Govan decides to frame her main characters and present them as reflections on bodies of water. As in Rain, Govan repeats in Play the Devil the use of the sea as a place to think and meditate. At some of the most difficult moments Rain experienced in Nassau, she will go to sit near the sea, looking at it in a position of meditation. Gregory also uses the sea as a place of reflection. The morning after he has sexual relations with James, Gregory, wearing a hoodie and short pants, sits in front of the ocean. He looks disturbed and teary-eyed when James finds him, and after a brief conversation between them, Gre James returns to the house and Gregory states, looking at the sea in a meditation-style manner. Govan repeats structural and thematic elements in both of her films, such as the coming of age genre, the open ending for her characters, the portrayal of marginalized groups, carnival, and nature. Both Rain and Play the Double explore the difficulties of growing up as a, as a poor Af Afro-Caribbean woman and queer person in the Caribbean, and the oppression the queer community is subjected to throughout the region. Producing two films in different areas of the region, of the Caribbean region, shows the shared issues of drug addiction, poverty, and the impact of conservative religion in the development of these short young characters. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Great presentation. Um, we will have questions Thank afterwards. You. We'll have questions afterwards. Okay. Um, but our next presenter uh, is Maria Luisa Guerrero uh, Diaz. 
and uh, she'll be talking about uh, uh, representaciones de estudiantes haitianos y haitianas en narrativas de episodios críticos del profesorado de Chile. Um, uh, I think Maria Luisa is coming to us from Barcelona. So uh, Maria Luisa, welcome. Uh, I'm going to uh, just get you up on the screen. Yo voy a, a compartir la, la pantalla ahora. Mm. Okay. Okay. Excelente. Ahora sí. Bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, yo soy profesora de la Universidad Metropolitana de Ciencias de la Educación en Chile y actualmente estoy en, mi, en la realización de mi programa de doctorado eh, de traducción y ciencias del lenguaje en la Universidad Pompeu Fabra. Y eh, quisiera contarles en la siguiente diapositiva eh, un poco el contexto en el que se enmarca esta investigación. Eh, Chile es un país ubicado al extremo sudeste de América del Sur, con una población aproximada de 17 millones de habitantes. Esta ha presentado una población migrante internacional que se ha triplicado en los últimos cinco años y ha, y ha presentado un crecimiento significativo del 67,7%, proveniente principalmente de países tales como Haití, Venezuela, Perú, Colombia y Argentina. En particular, nos vamos a centrar en nuestros estudiantes haitianos, en este caso. Y ellos eh, están en establecimientos gratuitos de alto índice de vulnerabilidad social y bajos resultados de aprendizaje. Eh, y eh, junto con ello, las políticas públicas existentes vinculadas al abordaje pedagógico y educativo de la diversidad cultural es que eh, se ha publicado desde el Ministerio de Educación orientaciones técnicas para la inclusión de estudiantes extranjeros. Eh, bueno, esta, estas orientaciones eh, carecen de lineamientos específicos que permitan abordar eh, la diversidad con, eh, cultural y acciones pedagógicas concretas. Además que al ser voluntarias, los directivos y los profesores evidentemente no lo consideran. Por otra parte, existe una rigidez del currículo escolar estandarizado y monocultural que no permiten otorgar condiciones a los directivos ni a los docentes para construir, adaptar y repensar el currículo desde una perspectiva intercultural, eh, ni tampoco considerar a las comunidades educativas. En este marco, eh, supone interrogarnos sobre cómo se está abordando pedagógicamente la diversidad cultural en narrativas de episodios críticos del profesorado. La siguiente presentación, por favor. Por lo tanto, en eh, los objetivos de investigación nos hemos concentrado principalmente en poder comprender e interpretar estas representaciones teniendo como focos de análisis las representaciones de estudiantes migrantes, las representaciones de las interacciones entre los estudiantes migrantes y la comunidad educativa y las autorrepresentaciones de los profesores y profesoras. La siguiente diapositiva. Ahora, eh, en nuestra investigación, hemos considerado eh, como perspectivas teóricas el análisis crítico del discurso y la interseccionalidad como ejes que permiten comprender el rol de los discursos para producir, reproducir o resistirse frente al abuso de poder o dominación. Y también al considerar la interdisciplinariedad como una forma de comprender mejor estos discursos y eh, el posicionamiento crítico del investigador o investigadora. Eh, en cuanto a la interseccionalidad, ha sido clave considerarla en esta investigación, puesto que considera el género con otras categorías de la diferencia eh, donde se visibilizan a los sujetos eh, y además eh, permite ver de mejor manera cuáles son los sistemas de discriminación y privilegios de, la, de, lo, de los sujetos y sujetas. En cuanto a la aproximación al discurso, hemos seleccionado un enfoque sociohistórico y cognitivo del discurso. Siguiente diapositiva. En cuanto a la dimensión de cognición, eh, esta dimensión cognitiva 
eh, nos permite eh, ver a las narrativas o aproximarnos a los modelos mentales de las personas desde el, desde el punto de vista de la cognición personal y desde la cognición social nos permite entrever cuáles son aquellos conocimientos, actitudes y valores que provienen de las representaciones sociales compartidas por grupos específicos. Eh, otra dimensión, en eh, la siguiente diapositiva, está la dimensión eh, de colonialidad. Esta dimensión también ha sido fundamental, dado que en nuestro corpus las representaciones negativas sobre los sujetos migrantes, indígenas y o mujeres son reflejo de creencias que devienen desde la conquista y colonia de América Latina y el Caribe hasta nuestros días, que se ha instalado metódicamente a través de un sistema capitalista, etnocéntrico y patriarcal que se expresa en jerarquías humanas, donde el indígena, afrodescendiente y o mujer se encuentran en posiciones subalterizadas. En la siguiente diapositiva eh, les voy a contar un poco eh, sobre la metodología que hemos eh, abordado en la investigación. Eh, Hemos eh, analizado 25 narrativas escritas por profesores y profesoras eh, de diferentes edades, años de experiencia profesional, identidades de género, etnicidad y de distintas regiones del país, a través de entrevistas semiestructuradas de carácter narrativo donde escriben un episodio crítico en contextos de diversidad cultural. En la siguiente diapositiva eh, se, se muestra el modelo de análisis con el que hemos hecho el, el análisis de las narrativas y esta nos ha permitido identificar el posicionamiento identitario que adoptan los personajes y los narradores a través de sus voces y acciones, así como las formas y cómo se quieren representar con la audiencia en la configuración narrativa. En la siguiente diapositiva eh, voy a explicar un poco los resultados. En las representaciones de los estudiantes haitianos, hay, hay un poco ruido de ambiental, no sé si me escuchan bien. Ah, se ha cambiado, pero a veces se tarda un poco. Ok. En los resultados, en las representaciones de los estudiantes haitianos, existe un énfasis a configurarlo desde un rol pasivo, es decir, como un sujeto paciente, un sujeto que tiene déficit, ya sea a nivel conductual, donde se refleja o se describen comportamientos que no se ajustan a la cultura normativa y escolar chilena. Desde lo cognitivo, eh, se refleja en las bajas expectativas de los estudiantes presentándose, por ejemplo, a través de falacias argumentativas de generalización en donde se enfatiza justamente sus características o atributos negativos. En cuanto al déficit comunicativo, se expresa cuando se les atribuye su incapacidad para poder comprender y comunicarse en español. Por otra parte, hay un elemento eh, desde, el, desde el género, hay una tendencia a visibilizar en las narrativas solo a los niños migrantes, mientras que existe un número muy inferior de narrativas en donde las protagonistas son las niñas. En la siguiente diapositiva, yo no sé cómo voy en el tiempo, eh, hay dos ejemplos, eh, un, la primera, eh, no la voy a leer completa para, para no, por respeto a las demás eh, presentaciones, eh, donde se enfatiza una representación eh, más bien negativa del estudiante, pero la profesora aquí se identifica desde ninguna etnicidad. Y la representación más positiva que está en la segunda narrativa es una profesora que desde la etnicidad se asume como mestiza. Eh, si quieren después le puedo enviar más ejemplos, pero esto es un poco el reflejo de, de lo que he explicado anteriormente. En la siguiente eh, diapositiva los resultados desde la identidad profesional docente. Eh, creo que es ahí, sí. Eh, desde la identidad étnica existe una tendencia general de los docentes a negar su etnicidad y a reconocer solo su nacionalidad. 
siendo estos dos elementos vinculantes con el uso de estructuras discursivas ideológicas de polarización, nosotros y ellos. Sin embargo, se manifiesta de forma minoritaria aquellos profesores y profesoras que reconocen identidades mestizas e indígenas dentro de las cuales dentro de las cuales estas estructuras discursivas de polarización se ven diluidas y demuestran representaciones más positivas de los estudiantes. En cuanto a la identidad de género, los profesores se identifican como una identidad de género, eh, eh, los profesores que se identifican desde una identidad de género masculina tienden a utilizar estructuras discursivas impersonales, y evitar la explicitación de la dimensión emocional en sus relatos. Mientras que las profesoras eh, explicitan y describen sus emociones a través de un mayor número de adjetivos calificativos y a demostrar en, su reloj, en, en sus relatos evolución tanto emocional como de sus acciones y creencias. En cuanto a la dimensión de autorrepresentación positiva, eh, los narradores se autorrepresentan desde el rol de cuidado, es decir, a través de la configuración de un sujeto agente y acciones o verbos vinculados al cuidado, como el compromiso con el aprendizaje del estudiante, el bienestar físico y emocional de ellos. En cuanto al rol de autoridad, hay una configuración narrativa en cuanto al manejo del conocimiento pedagógico del contenido y de la lengua castellana. Y esto se derivó a través de las presuposiciones lingüísticas e implicaturas. En cuanto a las competencias profesionales, que yo la renombraría NIC como capacidades profesionales, <ríe> eh, por el término y la carga semántica de competencia, del término competencia, hay un reconocimiento de ausencia de capacidades profesionales para abordar la diversidad cultural de sus estudiantes ya sea en la enseñanza del español como segunda lengua y el conocimiento de la cosmovisión y cultura de los estudiantes, experiencias y trayectorias formativas previas. Y en, en el ejemplo que viene en la siguiente diapositiva, justamente eh, la, la, la profesora que expresa acá eh, habla y dice que eh, se, se considera que está aterrada quería renunciar y no se, no se sentía capacitada para enseñar a leer a niños con otro idioma. Eh, en cuanto a las conclusiones, eh, bueno, la necesidad de procesos reflexivos continuos y sistemáticos de los profesores. Por lo tanto, porque la formación inicial docente y continua tiende a tener estos procesos reflexivos aislados. Por otra parte, es clave la, el eje de la identidad profesional docente, no solamente desde el punto de vista de las capacidades docentes, sino que preguntarse también sobre las identidades personales y cómo nos asumimos e impacta eso en nuestro quehacer docente. Otro elemento clave en preguntarse y en reflexionar eh, los profesores en su formación continua y, eh, e inicial es sobre nuestras concepciones sobre la niñez y familia migrante y en particular también sobre las niñas. ¿Por qué estamos invisibilizando a las niñas como protagonistas también en, en, en nuestras narrativas o en, nuestra, eh, o en nuestro episodio crítico de nuestra docencia? Y revisar nuestras concepciones racializadas sobre los sujetos y sujetas. Finalmente, un elemento estructural es la necesidad imperiosa de hacer proyectos educativos interculturales y multilingües en co-construcción con toda la familia y la comunidad educativa. Eso. Muchas gracias. Excelente presentación. Muchísimas gracias. Entonces, vamos a proceder a la próxima presentación para acordarles a ustedes que nosotros vamos a a dejar tiempo para las preguntas después de la próxima presentación. Entonces, uh, ahora uh, la próxima presentación se titula Shamanism in Caribbean Literature y el presentador es Alan Valle. Ok, uh, so our next presentation is by Alan Valle and uh, he's going to be talking about 
uh, shamanism in Caribbean literature. Buenos dia, me escuchan? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can everybody else hear? Okay. Hi, estoy un poco nervioso. Um, <laughs> whoops, whoops. Uh, one minute, uh, Alan. I have to uh, get this back up on. Don't uh, bear with me for one minute, please. There we go. Okay, let's do this now. Okay, there we go. Um, okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, my presentation is going to be about shamanism and Caribbean literature, but I'm going to focus on Kuvad, a dream play of Guyana by Michael Gilks, and Old Storytime by Trevor D. Rome. Next slide, please. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge a colleague, Petra Barreras, who helped me during our presentation on Michael Gilks's Kuvad as part of one of our classes here at the PhD at Rio Piedras. Please. So before we officially start and go ahead and make the breakdown, this theory of shamanism comes from an academic called Michel Eliade, who wrote uh, his book in French in 1951, and then it was translated in the 1960s into English. Uh, the theory essentially posits that there are people who engage in archaic techniques of ecstasy or techniques of ecstasy that allow people to talk to spirits and to visit different worlds, you know, the land of the dead, maybe the sky, different worlds in different dimensions. Um, it posits that the reason that shamans are different from other spiritual figures is because they use techniques of ecstasy. So anything that is native to their own culture or their own being, be it drumming, for example, playing music, singing, uh, organizing plays, rituals, all these things, anything that elicits a feeling of ecstasy and allows them to communicate with spirits. So the essential requirement for being considered a shaman is that a person has to be initiated. And before they're initiated, they have to display some kind of a, a sickness, a, a kind of neuroticism that makes them a candidate, which then uh, allows them to see spirits or has spirits visit them during their dreams. Or it can also be a group of people, or if it's a shamanic community, where the person is going to be initiated by their elders. So initiation involves the person's death and their resurrection. And it's important to note that the death and resurrection are, are symbolic, can be symbolic, although some people would even argue that this death and resurrection is literal in a sense, if they believe in the, in the spiritual aspects behind shamanism. And also uh, instruction in shamanic healing after the person is initiated and service to one's community. Those are the four uh, main requirements the other ones are part of Eliade's framework, and I would argue do not appear in multiple works of literature and are not necessarily, they're just uh, supplementary. Next, please. So powers that a shaman might have are, as I mentioned, uh, transmission in between different cosmic regions and seeing spirits and souls and essentially having control over spirits, not allowing uh, the spirits to control you. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about shamanism as it applies to Kuvad by Michael Gilks. This is a, a presentation of the play because we're going to be talking about dramas and these plays have certain appearances. Next slide, please. And that one, at least, there's a vertical association, but I'm not going to delve into it very much. So the idea is that um, Kuvad is basically about an artist teacher uh, called Lionel who paints. Um, in his paintings, he tries to communicate a world where there's going to be, uh, where Guyana is favorable to the idea of people of mixed races, because he's talking about a Guyana where people from different races are having conflicts. Uh, he's the father of the bee. He speaks to his ancestors in his dreams, although he doesn't directly recognize this. And at the end of the story, uh, he goes through a kind of psychotic breakdown, what they would describe it as a psychotic breakdown, where he talks to spirits and he's isolated from, his, from his, uh, the father of his child who's about to give birth to their child. And there's a revolution uh, while they're isolated. And when his child is born is when the story finishes, essentially. 
And it suggests that all events are interconnected because as the revolution erupts, the child is born. Next slide, please. So before we continue to develop this, uh, the idea is the title of the story of the play is called Kuvad. A Kuvad is a ritual where a father-to-be uh, isolates themselves from the society or from the or from the, the mother as well, and basically goes through their own uh, mimicking of the birth process. And in this story, we can see this as uh, Lionel cannot give birth to the child. That's the mother's job in this sense. And he mimics this by creating a work of art where he can also create a life or a cultural life in Guyana that is favorable to his mixed race child. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and I forgot to mention, the general idea is that the title of the play is Kuvad, and Lionel is going through a Kuvad, which is a ritual, right, an ancient ritual, but nobody recognizes what he's going through. And that is a part of the criticism that the novel, I mean, that the drama offers. Next slide. So Lionel can be considered to be a shaman for various reasons. First and foremost, he's initiated. He has an initiatory sickness where he, he gets neurotic and he starts uh, losing sleep. He becomes insomniac and he starts seeing these uh, ancestors from his past and from the past of Guyana that actually go through a ritual with him during his dreams that evolves and explodes during the middle of the night where he has his psychotic breakdown and frightens his wife. Um, he, and he's also, you know, he has his own archaic technique of ecstasy, which is pain. But the general idea is that his society does not recognize his role as a shaman, or there isn't a, a cultural background that is favorable to it. And therefore, he's left isolated and is not able to succeed as far as we can see in the, in the drama. Although at the end, when he's recovered, and he's able to recover himself, I would argue, that is another element that contributes to his interpretation as a shaman. Next slide, please. Another theme that I think is very important that this uh, offers in terms of shamanism is the idea of politics as being sacred and spiritual. And there's this idea that a political leader that appears in this drama um, is also the same character or played by the same actor who plays the shaman that initiates Lionel in his dreams. So it suggests that there's a reincarnation in this world, which is again uh, a shamanic idea, the idea of, of souls being reincarnated and uh, time being cyclical. Next slide, please. In addition, there's characters whose circumstances mirror each other. There's a couple of, what should I say, triads of friends that, uh, for example, Lionel, when he goes back to the past and he starts seeing something that happened in the past of Guyana where, with three men, one of them tries to kill the other and tries to conspire with another person to kill him, mirrors his own fate and what happens to him with his other two friends. But it also suggests something which I think is very important to the idea of shamanism and literature, which is that gods can take the forms of human beings and engage in politics, right? In the game of politics, for example. And this happens where in a public meeting where a pundit, Pandit Prasad, um, he gets assaulted by a man who bears a stark theatricality of the goddess Kali, who's incarnated and is mocking him in person. So it's an idea that is similar to the Odyssey in that sense, where, you know, Athena becomes a, a man and helps Odysseus and Telemachus. So old story time by Trevor D. Rome. Go ahead to the next slide. The general idea is that there is this young man called Len who gains a scholarship and becomes a banker. And when he comes back to his land, which I would argue is Jamaica and his community, his mother's been defrauded by a banker. She refuses to believe that this banker defrauded her because she's been colonized. This causes a conflict in the community where everybody tries to engage in a ritual of spirituality called Obea in, in Jamaica, in this world. And basically the main figure, uh, the Pa Ben, he's called Pa Ben in Old Story Time. He's able to, to hold this ritual at the end of the story, which is very beautiful. 
where everybody shares their own experiences of being oppressed by this white man, this banker. And once they're able to express how they've been abused in the community circle and a community kind of ritual, they're able to let go, forgive, and heal as a community. Next slide, please. So I would argue here that the general idea of shamanic healing takes place as well. Well, we have a bit of a dic difficulty um, to interpret lot, I mean, to interpret Len as a shamanic character, but definitely Pa Ben can be interpreted as a shamanic character because even though um, old story time doesn't have any any spirits per se, like um, in Kuvad where spirits are in the background of the play and they're constantly peering in, um, old story time still features all the elements with an exception for that appearance of spirits, but it's implied that they still exist, right? And I would argue here that in old story time, if there's a shamanic character, it's Pa Ben and not Len. Although you could argue, if you would wish, that Len is kind of a secular shaman. He goes through an initiatory ritual where he uh, basically dies symbolically and he's resurrected with the knowledge that the world is a cruel place that discriminates against him because of the color of his skin. And then he's able to gain uh, dominance in this world. And in the end, he's able to call men or spirits that belong to the world of banking so, to be able to, to get this defrauding banker to leave his community. So in a sense, he has a shamanic role, but because there aren't any spirits per se, it, unless you want to argue that these characters are spirits, you know, which is kind of convoluted. Well, that's uh, the role would definitely go in that sense to Pa Ben and not to Len. Next slide, please. Comparison. So the general idea is that both of these plays, I would argue can be uh, can be perceived as metaphysical plays. Um, in that sense, I would argue that old story time is more metaphysical uh, because it includes the audience at the beginning. Uh, pa Ben talks to the audience as if they were spirits that were looking into the past. And in Kuvad, where the metaphysical elements have to do with the spirits being um, embodied by characters, by people. Um, and finally, the general shamanic message, which is the one that Eliare also posits that is definitive for being considered shamanic, is the idea of love conquering evil, uh, of that being the unifying thread or theme across different religions and different practices. That the shaman is a person who focuses on healing and love instead of hatred and destruction. And that's what I have so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, great presentation. Um, okay, now it's time for questions. So we had three presentations. We had the first one on the cinema of Maria Govan by Norma. The second one by Maria Luisa about um, representaciones de estudiantes haitianos y haitianas en narrativas de episodios críticos de profesores en Chile. Y después, uh, Shamanism and Caribbean Literature by Alan Valle. Uh, we can take questions now. Any questions? Okay, well, uh, if nobody else has questions, I have one. Maria Luisa. Sí, dime nomás. Sí, uh, no, eh, tengo una preguntita. En tu opinión, ¿cuál sería la, bueno, el, el primer paso? Entonces, un, bueno, hay gente ahora en Chile que está intentando uh, abordar la situación, de mejorar la situación con los estudiantes, con los alumnos inmigrantes y uh, eh, hay, hay cosas concretas que, que están haciendo o si no, ¿cuál sería, ¿cuál sería el primer paso en tu opinión? Eh, en mi opinión es que eh, hay, hay organizaciones ya de, de profesores de forma más independiente que se han preocupado eh, no tanto de aprender el, de, a enseñar el español como segunda lengua, sino que aprender el criollo haitiano para, eh, para establecer eh, la comunicación con los estudiantes. Nosotros tenemos muchísimos estudiantes haitianos. Eh, tenemos eh, 
eh, que no están, que los datos oficiales se ven menos, obviamente, pero son muchos más. Y, y tenemos aproximadamente algunas escuelas en donde hay 90% de estudiantes haitianos en la escuela. Hay muchos más estudiantes. Y eh, yo creo que la, lo primero es integrar en la construcción de los proyectos educativos a las familias. Eh, aprender el criollo eh, haitiano y, y, y no se puede generar un currículo intercultural si, si no entramos primero a, a comunicarnos y a visibilizar también entre nosotros, aunque no nos guste, eh, los sistemas de discriminación también. Eh, yo creo que hay, hay mucho discurso de racismo encubierto en las narrativas y eso... Eh, por decirlo directamente, evidentemente es sancionado socialmente. Pero tenemos que también un poco visibilizarnos eso. Y existen, existen programas de educación intercultural bilingüe con, eh, so, eh, bueno, enfocados en los idiomas indígenas. No sé si ya existen in, eh, idiomas indígenas en Chile, pero yo he trabajado en varios países latinoamericanos en uh, aquí, uh, bueno, hay qué tipo de programa. Eh, no sé si existe en Chile y no sé si hay posibilidades de enlaces con programas de aquel índole. Nosotros eh, tenemos un programa de educación intercultural bilingüe con el Mapudungún, Aymara, Quechua y Rapanui. Eh, sin embargo, eh, es un programa que es muy débil porque está concentrado solamente en aquellos espacios en donde tú tienes estudiantes indígenas sobre el 40%. Ah. Y eso no es real. Eso no es real porque finalmente eh, los estudiantes indígenas est estamos de alguna forma dispersos en el país. No estamos concentrados necesariamente... Eh, en, en un aula y por lo tanto ahí es pertinente la aplicación. Entonces, eh, el Estado chileno eh, nos debe eh, un programa educativo intercultural de revitalización de las lenguas indígenas, pero también de consideración real de, la, de las muchas lenguas que estamos hablando. Y eso eh, es un tema largo y, y de lucha también del profesorado y, y, y las comunidades. Gracias. Uh, más preguntas, more questions, more questions. Okay, well, both Norma and Alan, uh, both of you uh, were talking about spaces where uh, ecstasy is involved. Uh, and also, uh, Alan, uh, when uh, you are talking about uh, shamans, the Uh, it connected me to something in Liz's presentation because uh, the the uh, role of shaman in many cultures um, is assigned to LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus people. Um, I'm just wondering if Norma or Alan have anything to say about that. Why should uh, it be LGBTQ people who are also playing this role in a lot of societies? And it, maybe it touches on some of the things that Norma was saying as well. Either one uh, of you. Okay, uh, Norma. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting that you say that um, uh, the LGBTQ uh, plus community is associated with shamanism, because in my in in the films that I talked about in Rain and Play the Devil, uh, our characters um, and and their culture is very rooted in conservative religion, like uh, uh, conservative Christianity, um, and and it's kind of like you know uh, opposed to to what Alan says. So I don't know if he has um, a theory on how you can also like why this community is associated and and not. Um, and not the heteronormative one. I don't know yeah. what he thinks about that. Yeah, so this is a big theme. You know, in other words, you have the colonizing religion, which has yeah. uh, really marginalized uh, LGBTQI people. And then you have still a memory, uh, and uh, a memory that's very much alive of another spiritual tradition, because you have carnival, 
and and even even though carnival has been interpreted through maybe a catholic celebration on the surface underneath there's all this great um uh African derived spirituality. And I think that, um, uh, so you have that conflict in the Caribbean uh, between the two of them. And I think both of you are, are, are touching on that in your presentations. Norma? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's, well, in Carnival, when they go into like this deep tram state where they transform themselves, I think that these um, African religions and cultural elements allow them to connect to an inner part of themselves, of their past, of who they are, like in, in, in essence, you know? Eh, que quizás, and maybe the, the Christianity doesn't allow them to because it doesn't come from, from who they really are. So mm -hmm. I think that um, it's the same with gender. It's who you are, how you feel like uh, your gender identity or your sexual uh, orientation is deeply rooted also in who you are. And maybe we can compare them like that, like uh, also carnival and and it's 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 associated with um, our our beginnings of, of, of where we come from and 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 our sexual uh, orientation and sexuality is also rooted in that. So I guess that's why maybe they both go together. Mm -hmm. And now and, and and what you were saying and then using carnival is really interesting because like we were saying. Uh, Carnival has both elements in it, so it is a Catholic tradition from Europe uh, on, on one level. But then you have the breakaway moments, like you, that's a very key term that you use, breakaway, because it, when you get to that moment, then it's tapping into these other uh, levels of spirituality that are not, for, not uh, necessarily European. So, and that maybe brings us to Alan's presentation. Alan, what do you have to say about this uh, conversation that we're having? I think it's fascinating. I just wrote down a couple of notes. Um, I, I, I can't speak for a person of, uh, as a person of LGBTQ descent, right, or that identifies as LGBTQ. I think that it's very important to have an LGBTQ person in this, under this theory of shamanism, to be able to explain it themselves and what they think because I think it would be a bit irresponsible of me to, to explain it for them. But at, at least based on what I've understood is that if you conceive of male and female or of that binary, right, or maybe of even other different uh, elements that we don't talk about, it's, it's the general idea that there is different worlds. Each person is a world. So if, you're if you have different spirits, right, if you feel male, female, maybe something else. Each one of these elements is a worldview, which normally people are only ascribed to one. You know, normally society just tells us identify as male or female and that's it. And that limits conversation. So the general idea of having a person that can transcend those, those boundaries as being like the cultural um, agent i guess or or the person responsible for healing i think is essential and there are different cultures that have what we would describe as two spirits for example or third genders as being you know the shamanic uh the shamanic person in the community so i think that's very interesting and important and as i think norma and you said professor it also has to do a lot with um how with colonization and, and Christianity. So the idea is that in native religions, I don't want to be a generalist and say that all native religions or, are, are, you know, in favor or have this uh, community organization where they ascribe the two spirit or third gender person into the role of the shaman. But it seems to be like self-evident. I think it is self-evident that when a community recognizes that a person is like this, they consider them to be sacred and they give them that special role in the community, which is also political if you want to be, what, what should I call it, um, a bit cynical in terms of spirituality, you know. It's a very important social role that they ascribe to these people. Norma, did you have something to say? No, 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 I was just okay. Pero eso, eso me hace llegar a la intervención de a María Luisa otra vez. Porque lo que se enfrenta en el salón de clase en uh, Chile, uh, lo, los salones de clase donde hay uh, 
una presencia haitiana. Entonces, eh, esta idea de, de trans, uh, translingualidad. Entonces, me inter yo creo que es bien interesante que hay uh, profesores que han tomado la iniciativa de aprender el, el haitiano, el, el criollo haitiano. Y, y porque, bueno, este vínculo entre sanación y eh, trans, la, eh, eh, bueno, la, 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 la habilidad de, de, de violar fronteras, de operar en dos eh, idiomas a la vez o en dos eh, realidades a la vez. Y, y, y también, uh, como dijiste, la, una, un, un punto de inicio sería la familia también. Entonces, porque la familia haitiana representa un mundo. La familia chilena, eh, eh, chilena representa un mundo también. Entonces, eh, cultivar la habilidad de todo el mundo de, 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 empeza, de, de empezar a, 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 dis, a disolver estas fronteras, estas estas divisiones entre comunidades. Sin duda, justamente uno rompe todos lo, los prejuicios, las creencias, cuando interactuamos. Porque finalmente, eh, todas toda estas estructuras discursivas racistas de discriminación es porque siempre estamos diferenciándonos del otro. Y, y esa categoría de diferenciación y de homogeneización es simplemente porque no, no nos hemos preocupado de conocer realmente a las otras personas. Y, y, una, y una mejor manera es, es conocerlo a través del aprendizaje de su lengua también. Eh, no solamente de enseñarles nuestra lengua hegemónica de nuestro currículo escolar, sino que también eh, hay muchas palabras que son, no son posibles de traducir, de hecho. O sea, a mí me pasa con el mapungún. Hay palabras que yo no puedo traducirlas en español, pero, pero yo las entiendo de otra forma cuando lo, cuando lo hablo. Entonces, eh, sé que sin duda aprendiendo el criollo haitiano, hay palabras que no, no son posibles de, de, de expresar. Y, y es una responsabilidad también para nosotros, eh, los profesores que creemos más bien en este tipo de proyecto educativo, eh, eh, es poder romper un poco esta, estas barreras ficticias eh, en el aula. Y, y bueno, para eso, para eso estamos, estamos trabajando un poco para, para no dejarlo solo en investigación, sino que también para... Eh, para poder sensibilizar a nuestra comunidad universitaria en Chile también de formación de profesores para que tomemos acciones también. Uh, Norma, <coughs> I'm wondering how uh, Govan treats uh, the, um, let's see, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the man who was killed in... Um, James? In, yeah, James. Okay. <coughs> The problem, okay, uh, just there's a there's a trope. There's a a a, a trope in the way that uh, LGBTQ people are represented and LGBTQ rep, uh, relationships are presented uh, in um, the cinema, especially especially the U.S. cinema. Uh, it's that at the end there's always death. That um, And, and, and it's, it's, it's almost like, um, the message is almost like, well, uh, no matter how uh, sensitive uh, this, this representation is, what I'm telling you is that the, uh, the, the, the only or, or a, a likely outcome of this situation is that somebody's going to die. So I, I, it's just, I don't know, does she have a way Does Maria Govan have a way to sort of uh, deal with that? Is she, does she try, does she make an effort to say, yes, this person dies at the end, but um, is, is there, is there some way, is there, is there the way she treats that death, uh, uh, does that, does that uh, break from that 
tradition? Okay, uh, they have very, they have very good question on that because I actually talked to her about it. I had a lot okay. of problems with with this ending um, because I, I thought that the same way uh, that it is problematic. Why I always uh, LGBTQ um, story so tragic? And there's another film from the Bahamas. Yes, uh, I remember uh, that one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, for our conversation. Um, I explained my that same worry that it, it, it kind of ended in, it kind of added like to the stereotype and because James is also an older man that is sort of like looking to have a, a love with a high school boy you know that also I felt like I added a little bit to that stereo to the stereotype to the community yeah. but uh, what she argues is that um, it is important this is what she said this is it is important to um, present the realities of life in the Caribbean. Uh, Play the Devil, I didn't mention it, but it's based on a true story uh, and it's slightly based on a true story about a young boy who has a relationship with an older man. The older man threatens him to expose him to his family, his sexual orientation, and the boy kills himself. Um, in the film, it's different uh, because it is Gregory who murders James, but uh, what I feel is that it is based on, on fear uh, of being of his sexuality being discovered and his life changed and I think that um, even though we feel that it is it can be a little bit stereotypical I don't think Caribbean cinema here is as developed as other cinemas around the world to be able to to have explored those issues and those areas thoroughly you know I think we're still stumbling a little bit on things that other cinemas have already passed, we are still trying to find a way of saying it. And I think that's what happens in this film. But I think the same thing that you did, and I express it, I don't think it's the best way to end the film, but um, it's also representative of, of, of what this community, I mean, I'm not part of it, so I, it sometimes feels strange talking about it, but I, I, from what I read and what I see, it is, representative of, of what they experience on an everyday basis. Yeah. Okay, unfortunately, we have no more time for questions. We're going to go to our next, uh, our next uh, presentation. But um, great presentations, all three of you. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, and a great conversation as well. So uh, it, it's 11 o'clock now, and uh, now we're going to our third session. Uh, our first presenter will be Itza Hernandez Janovetti. Uh, and she'll be talking about English language acquisition, a look at four Puerto Rican English majors. Okay, Itza, I'm going to just get it up on the screen here. Okay, Itza. Okay, thank you so much. Hello everybody, I hope you're all doing well. Thank you so much for being here. Like the professor was saying, I'm gonna be, my, the title of my presentation is Exploring Influencing Factors in English Language Acquisition, a look at four Puerto Rican English majors. So, um, next slide, <laughs> thank you. And so this idea came from the fact that I'm, I'm really interested in learning how people acquire English in Puerto Rico, specifically people who have never lived abroad or anywhere else. They've just been living on the island, right? So throughout the years, I, you know, just like to ask this to friends, family, pretty much anybody I meet. Um, and a lot of I get answers along these lines. They tend to say things like, oh, you know, I just learned by watching television or uh, just, you know, I really like music in English and I'll watch my movies in English. And all the answers tend to be focused around media, right? So that was my initial idea for this research project. And then it kept evolving, but that was the main idea that behind uh, this project. Okay. Okay, so when it comes to the theoretical framework for this project, I looked at social cultural theory, which basically proposes that we learn languages by interacting with people and interacting with culture in general. So any cultural artifact, basically anything created by humans, is also going to play a role in our language learning journey. I also looked at the ecological systems theory, which looks at child development within a context of systems and relationships. Uh, so it basically looks at how we develop in different environments and how those environments are connected to one another. 
Another very important theory to consider was cultural capital. So this theory made it possible to explain the unequal scholastic achievements of children originating from different social classes. So it basically establishes a correlation between uh, certain highbrow activities like uh, reading, going to museums, FM, exposure to different types of setting and academic success. So it basically, in other words, it proposes that if you have access to these settings, you are going to acquire certain skills, which will in turn help you succeed in certain environments. Okay. Okay, so for my project per se, uh, I looked at, I interviewed four participants. These I that I did life histories. My participants were all undergraduate English majors at UPR Mayagüez campus. All four of them are from the linguistics track. All four of them are also females just because I wasn't able to find any male volunteers. I originally wanted two males and two females just you know for the sake of having a representative population but no males volunteered. So for females, they were all between the ages of 21 and 24 years old, and they all grew up and lived their entire life in different parts of Puerto Rico, mostly the west side of the island, uh, but some of them did live in other parts of the island as well. So for my research uh, questions, the ones that I'm going to be focusing on for this presentation, so could we go to the previous one? <laughs> okay, could we go back for a second? Oh, you have to go back. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. So here are my main research questions. So the big idea was to get um, students to narrate the story of how they acquired English. Through, so we talked about different stages of their life and we did all of this through individual interviews. Okay, next one. Okay, so when it comes to that general story of how they acquired English, the mo they all had regular access to English mainly through schooling and through media exposure. So all four of my participants, two of them went to bilingual private schools throughout most of their school life. One of them went to a bilingual public school uh, throughout her early years of her studies. And the other one attended re just regular public school throughout her entire life. And, but however, they all had a very constant exposure to English, okay? Uh, whether it was through that schooling or whether it was through media. Um, so, and having this exposure to English in their early stages of life and throughout their lives in general, pretty much helped them uh, develop a certain inclination to use English over Spanish in some specific situations. So here we have some quotes from my participants. Laura said that she uses English whenever she wants to talk better, when she wants to sound maybe more intelligent quote-unquote, <laughs> and Spanish one, she's more passionate about something. So Spanish is usually more for emotions in her case. That's how she described it. Camila said that she usually speaks English when she wants to feel more comfortable uh, because she feels more comfortable using English than Spanish, even though all of my participants come from, Spanish, from homes where Spanish is the main language used. Their parents were all uh, monolingual Spanish speakers. So there you can see how having this exposure through schooling and through media developed that certain inclination in my participants. Uh, in the beginning, they started consuming this media because of their parents. So, you know, uh, five-year-olds don't really have much say in whether or not the movie is played in English or in Spanish or whether the books are purchased in English or Spanish. So it was actually the parents right from the beginning encouraging their children to learn English through this, these different media. So whether it was books, music, television, movies, or schooling per se, it was always the parents who were sort of pushing this idea that it was important for them to learn English. I also asked about different, uh, whether or not they were interested in learning other subsequent languages. They all said yes, they all expressed a desire to learn several more languages, but they ultimately gave up on the process even though they had begun. Uh, they either gave up or they just, you know, left it on the back burner for later because uh, they felt like they weren't making any progress and they weren't, uh, they didn't have anybody to practice with. So sort of that, that little parenthesis for other languages. So when it comes to the key players in the story, so the key people, uh, like I was saying, it was basically the parents. They all come from homes where English was very valued. Here we have some quotes of what their parents would tell them out about English. So Pia says, my parents knew you knowing the English language should help me not only in my academics, but in finding a job. Natalia said, 
Uh, he told me, referring to her dad. Natalia, yo no quiero que tú pases por lo mismo que yo pasé, así que yo quiero que tanto tú como tu hermano tenga esa base en inglés para que tengan mejores oportunidades de trabajo. So, in a lot of these cases, uh, they told me stories about how, the, how their parents had issues or had, um, went through different situations where not knowing English was a difficulty for them. And that's why the parents were so adamant about their children learning English and about them understanding the importance. For, and there we see if it, some of their thoughts about language, right? If, uh, okay. So when it comes to the key events, basically having that access to English was a sign of privilege because as we know, not everybody can afford to pay book, to pay for cable television. Not everybody can afford to buy books for enjoyment. Not everybody can afford private education, especially bilingual education, right? So all these elements in these students' lives were a fact that they had a certain level of privilege. Uh, as Pia says there, we were fortunate enough to have cable television in our house, so we were able to watch TV in English, which is where cultural capital comes in. So the fact that their parents were encouraging them to learn English through reading and having, you know, these interactions with on a regular basis, it shows that they were aware of how valuable this, these skills w were. So the parents were the ones pushing the idea that, yes, English is important, you should learn English. Um, so yeah, and it was complemented then by formal bilingual education. And when I, whenever I say bilingual education, I'm referring to the subtractive bilingualism model we tend to have on the island, you know, uh, where just the Spanish class is taught in Spanish and then the English, everything else is in English, which is a very deficient model because um, it doesn't encourage both languages to develop at the same time. It just completely neglects Spanish, except for Spanish class, and then everything else is done in English. So students never have the opportunity to develop that academic Spanish in different areas, right? So, and that's actually something that was a big issue with one of my participants, especially uh, Camila. If we think back to the first slide where, where we quoted her feeling more comfortable with English, well, she mentioned that she did not feel comfortable with Spanish because she never had that opportunity to learn Spanish. Because even in her Spanish course, uh, there was a lot of English going on. Even though it was in Puerto Rico, she did go to a school where uh, there were a lot of students that were native English speakers. So yeah, there was that situation where they weren't allowed really to use their Spanish or that she didn't feel comfortable using her Spanish, which acted in detriment of her language. So yeah, very important to point that out as well. Okay. So to summarize, we can say that the fact that they, all these students were immersed in English on a regular basis and the fact that they had this certain level of privilege is what allowed them to ver better acquire the language. And it was basically due, be due to the parents uh, because the parents had this idea that English was important for them. They just pushed it onto their children and their children ended up acquiring the language. So. That's pretty much my conclusions. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank um, you. We'll have questions afterwards. Uh, now we'll um, go on to the next presentation. Okay, the next presentation is called Voices from the Mountains. It's by Michelle Baez, Nadia Dorado, Jaheim uh, Garcia, Yabanex Legarreta, Liz Pagan, Lorimar Rodriguez, Lorena Roman, Yasmin Sanchez, Idaris Torres, eh, Elias, Elias Vargas. Uh, I will put it up on the screen now. Um, here we go. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, I will give it over to the group to present. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Yes, we're still. Buenos here. Días. That's Michelle. Yo soy Yasmin. Nadia, are you there? All right. Here I am. Hello, everyone. I'm Nadia. Thank you for listening to us today. We are ready to present. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? 
Dentro de las montañas de nuestra isla hay un sitio mágico donde nuestros ancestros nos dejaron sus huellas y donde aún seguimos en sus prácticas, cosechando en armonía con la naturaleza. Somos la Universidad de Puerto Rico, recinto de Utuado. UPRU is the culturally rich extended family from students all around the island that come to seek a fresh primary experience of what college is like for, from humanities to social sciences and our star courses in sustainable agriculture. Utuado offers an experience like no other and the environment really offers an ancestral perspective that teaches us in many dimensions. Dentro de este recinto maravilloso, es muy importante reconocer todas las virtudes y necesidades de la vida universitaria. Es por, es por tanto que es necesario conocer e investigar la comunidad universitaria desde diferentes esferas para mantener vigente nuestra educación. Nuestra meta siempre es y será cuidar de la montaña. Para dar contexto a nuestra presentación, ¿verdad? es importante recordar cuáles han sido las situaciones por las que se han enfrentado estas últimas generaciones de estudiantes durante su trayecto universitario. Este, algunos de estos pueblos que podemos observar en las imágenes son los recortes presupuestarios a nuestro sistema educativo, la huelga del 2017, aumento del costo de estudio, el huracán María, posibles cierres y conglomerados de recintos, otras medidas de autoridad y actualmente el COVID. Siguiente. The students of Otoao demonstrate their commitment to working in peace with nature through collaborative research in topics such as indigenous people's midwifery, o parteras indígenas, plantas maestras sagradas, or sacred teaching plants, and holistic medicine, traveling to countries such as Mexica or Mexico to learn and apply their skills through service. Siguiente. While most people had never heard of COVID-19 in January of this year, a brave student named Sioni Soto brought her concerns to class, informing us about a strange virus that allegedly began in China and her fears that the virus would reach the US and Puerto Rico made some students laugh. But instead of ignoring her concerns, we took on the challenge of researching the topic. And by February, had formulated these recommendations. Siguiente. Los efectos de la alza de matrícula en los estudiantes de la montaña. Siguiente. Esta es la segunda parte de de esta investigación, la cual fue dada en el 2018 en el simposio Caribe Plurilingüe en el recinto de Río Piedra. Esta investigación fue realizada mediante una encuesta con representación de un 5% de estudiantes, el cual podemos entender que es representativo del estudiantado común. Además, se utilizaron datos oficiales del recinto y del gobierno de Puerto Rico. Siguiente. Para muchas personas ¿verdad? que no tuvieron la oportunidad de ver la presentación del 2018, los datos de, de pobreza fueron sacados del censo y en la pasada nos dejamos llevar más bien por el presupuesto familiar, pero en este caso se hizo un análisis más sobre él o el estudiantado, que son, estos son ejemplos aproximados. Un estudiante que trabaja 7.25, que es el salario mínimo, 20 horas semanales es 580 dólares de ingreso mensual. Un estudiante que participa del programa de estudio y trabajo en nuestro recinto obtiene usualmente 14 horas semanales, lo que es igual a 406 dólares de ingreso mensual. Según la encuesta realizada, el 37% de los estudiantes gastan mensualmente aproximadamente 401 dólares a 600 dólares. El 20% gastan de 600 a 800 dólares. El 14% gastan de 801 dólares o más. Y el resto de los encuestados gastan 401 dólares o menos por mes. El 34% de los encuestados no les alcanza para cubrir los gastos diarios, los cuales no incluyen los gastos extraordinarios. Recordemos que hay estudiantes que tampoco tienen la dicha de trabajar. Siguiente.
La primera gráfica que podemos observar es sobre cuántas comidas pueden hacerle estudiantes. El 13%, el 13 puede hacer una comida, el 39% puede hacer dos comidas, el 37% puede hacer tres comidas o más y el 11% contestó otra. La segunda gráfica habla sobre si los estudiantes pueden pagar su renta, en la cual dice que el 20% dijo que sí y el 45%, el 45 dice que no y el 35% dio otra contestación. Siendo una segunda parte de una investigación social, podemos observar que no hay mejoría en cuanto a la situación económica estudiantil y ha ido deteriorándose de poco a poco. Necesitamos traer nuevas medidas para salvar nuestro sistema educativo, pero sin afectar la sustentabilidad de los estudiantes. Siguiente. Our students are committed to making a positive impact, making and painting cots for the people of the south of the island after the January February earthquakes when we saw the lack of a proper response from the government to provide the resources needed for the people to truly recover. Siguiente. Los estudiantes del Departamento de Tecnología Agrícola toman acción sobre la idea de soberanía alimentaria y vivir en un espacio donde no necesitas dinero para alimentarte bien, en solidaridad con los demás. Se lucha para una perspectiva e ideología solidaria al momento de alimentarnos. Entonces, esta iniciativa se ejecuta a la alimentación a través de cualquier tipo de donativo o trueque. Siguiente. La comunidad estudiantil, ¿verdad? nosotros hacemos un enlace directo con la comunidad del pueblo y es importante porque dentro de las diferentes organizaciones como la Asociación Agropecuaria ofrecemos talleres a los diferentes pueblos de nuestro país. Siguiente. Siguiente. Gracias a las profesoras Glorimar Rodríguez González y Sandra Enríquez Seiders, y muchas otras personas. En el último día de clases en marzo, investigadoras en estudios de género e historia de mujeres presentaron sus trabajos en el noveno coloquio de investigación de historia de las mujeres. A la actividad asistieron personas de todo Puerto Rico, incluyendo mujeres que han dejado la huella en historia de los deportes. Pues el semestre pasado, yo durante el semestre pasado de febrero a mayo de 2020, trabajé con la organización de Green PR que fomenta e inspirar a jóvenes a ser líderes en ámbitos de la sustentabilidad y metas cero basura en su comunidad. Entonces parte de mi proyecto se basó en educar a mi comunidad universitaria sobre lo que sucede con los desperdicios sólidos en nuestra isla y en el mundo y transformar este, nuestra cafetería a una más ecológica y sustentable al generar, a generar cero desperdicios. Entonces, mi, mi proyecto se dividió en esta primera fase que es dar charlas sobre concienciación, sobre cómo nosotros, los seres humanos, somos parte de un gran todo que está interconectado a través de frecuencias y vibraciones que nos relacionan entre uno y el otro, ya sea el espacio, la naturaleza y otros seres sentimentales. Nosotros nos conectamos físicamente, emocionalmente y espiritualmente con ese gran todo, pero a través del tiempo y el individualismo, los gobiernos, las culturas, las religiones, las ideologías implantadas por estos mismos entes, van poco a poco separándonos de esta verdad que nos conecta. Nos hacen indiferentes entre nosotros y lo que sucede a nuestro alrededor. Vamos poco a poco desbalanceándonos físicamente a través de lo que subimos y espiritualmente. Por ende, nosotros estamos en desbalance y el mundo natural y exterior va reflejando nuestro interior. Siguiente. Al consumir cosas negativas sin tomar en consideración lo que le hacen a nuestro cuerpo y al ambiente, vamos creando desperdicio que no desaparecerá por cientos de años. Hemos desconectado de la paciencia 
el respeto a la tierra y el tiempo que toman los procesos naturales de la empatía con seres, otros seres sentipensantes, tanto las personas, los animales, como la tierra fértil que nos provee la vida. Y a través del egoísmo, no nos damos cuenta que nadie nos vendrá a rescatar y corregir nuestro planeta. Nos tenemos que reconectar con nosotros mismos y los demás para poder vivir en armonía en este punto azulito que explota en un vacío. Siguiente. Entonces, Además de dar estas charlas para promover conciencia de los desperdicios, también hice una investigación y e hice una propuesta para cambiar los utensilios desechables de la cafetería por unos reusables. Hice la encuesta, la cual contestaron 90 personas y recolecté firmas de 218 personas listas para hacer el cambio dentro de nuestra cafetería. Y antes que ocurriera la pandemia... Uh, la, la propuesta. Siguiente. Aunque en estos momentos nuestra educación se ve amenazada, trabajamos para que nuestro recinto brille y siga brindando una perspectiva cultural sobre la educación en armonía con la naturaleza. Queremos que este mensaje sirva para visibilizar nuestros esfuerzos como recinto y que recuerdan que dentro de las montañas hay movimiento que lucha por la protección de este recinto y la comunidad y el futuro. Gracias a todos por prestar su atención. Les invitamos a mantenerse conectados con nuestro hermoso recinto que les ofrece tanto a nuestro país. Gracias. Gracias. Excelente presentación. Bueno, para las preguntas vamos a esperar hasta, hasta el final. Uh, tenemos una pre presentación más en esta sesión. Uh, es por Stella Ramírez Rodríguez. So our next presenter is Stella Ramírez uh, Rodríguez. And she'll be uh, giving a presentation titled No Son 64, Acknowledgement and Remembrance of Hurricane Maria's Dead via Art, Literature and Protest. Okay, Stella, I'm just going to get your presentation up on the screen now. All right, thank you. Uh, and sorry, Stella, that um, we had a change in the order here. No problem, no problem. Okay, thank you for your patience. Okay. All right, thank you, Professor. Hi, as he said, my name is Stella Ramirez, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about Hurricane Maria and the mortuary grieving processes, particularly the acknowledgement and remembrance. But um, before we do that, I want to give uh, like a brief review of death and death traditions in Puerto Rico. So the Tainos believed that life, death, and humanity were inseparable concepts. Like through death, they found realization and communication with their gods. They believed that it was el gran areto. It was another form of light. It wasn't like you're dead and that's it. Physical death was just a step in the whole process, in the universal process of life. Death was actually representative of remembrance and celebration for them. It wasn't uh, an instance to get sad or depressed. They saw it as a way for the community to renew their cultural life and to reconcile their past and their present. Likewise, the Tainos believed that the dead never left. They actually became part of nature as spirits, spirits without belly buttons, funnily enough, or they actually became part of their culture via two particular ways. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the semi and the body actually became the ways that the dead continue to be a part of their cultures. They believe that the semis actually hosted ancestral spirits or deities And these were brought to life via the carvings. And that image there is from the semi building that is in Hayuya, if I'm not mistaken, or at Juntas. I apologize if I made a mistake with the location. Um, however, the body itself also never left. They preserved, thank you, Hosan. They preserved the body and they kept it as an idol. It was not uncommon to have Taino dead in their homes, in their boyos because they believed that death wasn't loneliness, it was continuity and renovation. Next. 
all of this changed when the Spanish arrived. Um, not only did they colonize them physically, but it was also ideological, and this extended to their mortuary processes. In 1513, there is actually a regulation in regards to death. The Spanish good death is now the only good death that is allowed for the natives. In the Ordenanzas para el Tratamiento de los Indios, there are specific instructions laid out wherein the colonizers had to provide assistance to any weak, ill indigenous peoples, but also spiritual assistance. As the quote says, confesarle una vez al año. Catholicism, my friends, all of a sudden they have to pray, they have to repent. And not only that, but when they died, they can't observe their own processes. Al que muriere debería ir con la cruz a enterrarle. Even if they can't pay, they have to bury and put a cross over their bodies. And if they don't, they get a penalty of $4. Tremenda multa. So that stopped being a significant part of Taino life. It was no longer a celebration of life or the continuity of it. It became the suffering death. It was the physical pain of disappearing. However, people found ways to protest this, both the Tainos who fleed to the mountains and then when Africans were bought and they became the enslaved, they sought ways to contest the Spanish idea of the good death and preserve their own customs and traditions. La protesta via el baquiné. There were further additions to mortuary codes, particularly there was the burial policies of 1539 that brought along as well regulations in regards to death, religion, and disease. All of a sudden, everybody had to be buried at the cemetery that was at the church. The only reason why you wouldn't be able to get buried there was if you were deathly sick. Back then, they had all these beliefs in regards to how um, disease transmission worked, um, including the belief that illness was like a floating spirit called miasma, and if you breathed it, you would get sick. Therefore, that's why they wanted to keep all of the bodies outside of the communities. However, despite all of these regulations being put into place, they fought back. El Baquine, or Velorio de Angelitos, as seen as in, in the picture at the Velorio, was the way that the peasants and the enslaved fought back. The Spanish and the higher classes, apologies, fought. They, they were horrified. They didn't see why. They didn't understand why these people were having parties and they were drinking and they were singing and they were celebrating when people died. But again, this is a continuation of Taino and African mortuary processes. Death was a part of life. It was just a step in the universal plan. Next. So how does this connect to present day? Some of you might have heard of El Muerto Parao, El Muerto Sentao, El Muerto de Ambulancia. This is known as extreme embalming. And maybe for us, it's considered normal, but the rest of the world was kind of horrified and called it Velorios Insolitos. However, oh, sorry, there's a plane going by. These velorios exóticos have had resonance. People feel a connection to it because these are marginalized peoples reclaiming their spaces. Although um, there was a connection made between illicit economic activities and street violence in regards to these extreme embalming incidences, you will see that that was not always the case. There was an extremely embalmed grandma. Props to her. So, Per Laura Paniso, why? Why do we insist in extreme embalming? Why do we insist in rejecting these cultural norms that have been imposed upon us, this idea of the good death? Well, the wake is a fundamental space and a ritual space where, where the dead person is separated from the space of the living, but at the same time, they are remembered, they are extolled, and they are praised. So even though we are saying a final goodbye, we are just further cementing their memory in our hearts and in our minds. Next. Here are some examples of 
the body and life and death via extreme embalming. Um, to the, the uppermost left is El Muerto Parado, the one that started it all. Uh, to the right, we have extremely embalmed grandma. And then at the bottom, we have El Velorio en Motora. And this is another thing that people are kind of horrified by the tradition of taking pictures of the dead. The little girl, like people try to separate children from the mortuary process. And here we have a little girl, not only at the wake, but taking a picture of El Muerto en la Motora. So why is this? The body, the corpse, is an instance of communication. In the wake, the body, the person, has this one last chance to be a part of the conversation and project a final image of what their life was. Okay, next. Oh, next. I think you went backwards. There we go. So how does this all play into Maria? We were going to get to that, but a quick review. The horrifying disaster that was Hurricane Maria uh, made landfall on September 20th, 2017, and it stayed over Puerto Rico for over 30 hours. Estimated economic impact put it at over 43 billion. And why is this such a big deal? We've had hurricanes before, but the consequences of this hurricane were unprecedented, starting with the fact that to this day, we don't really know the official death toll. There are discrepancies everywhere. The government on September 21st said that it was only 10 dead. Then on September 27th, 26, and on October 3rd, it said that it was 34 victims. Next. So President Trump's visit, nos están matando. Um, most of us remember how he tossed paper towels at a private meeting in Guaynabo, that image is indelibly tattooed in our minds and our hearts. But not only that, to add insult to injury, he said that we didn't have a real catastrophe. He said that we can be very proud because we only had 16 people death versus the thousands that died during Hurricane Katrina. And he said that Hurricane Katrina was the real catastrophe, noting that Look at the tremendous hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that died. And you look at what happened here. And what is your death count? 16 people versus in the thousands. You should be very proud. After President Trump left, all of a sudden there is another bump in the death toll, bringing the total to 64. And for a really long time, that was the final quote unquote official death toll. Next. So what happened? Where are the dead? How can we remember them? To present day, there are still missing dead and unaccounted for, be it because they perished during the disaster, during the atmospheric event, or mishandled during the body recovery process. We don't know what the final count is. The presumed count, thanks to um, a study done between Harvard and in conjunction with Centro para Investigativo, is 4,465 dead. Two, today, the government continues to deny the adjusted count. They do say that it might be higher than the final death toll, but they refuse the number of 4,000. There was also horrible governmental response in regards to cadaver management. There are bodies that were abandoned. They were stored in unsafe, unprepared vans, as you can see in the image. There was excessive decay. There are stories of people receiving their loved ones in a state of rot that they were not viewable. They, like it was beyond embalming um, preparedness. However, la culpa de nadie. Nobody assumes responsibility for what happened. So how do these people mourn? How do they process everything what ha that happened without having the body to be that instance of communication between the living and the dead? Next. Puerto Ricans resorted to art. They resorted to literature. They resorted to song. They resorted to protest. Um, I would love to include all of the ones that I found through the research, but these are a few. The topmost left image is from Iram Bithern. And as you can see, it doesn't have the 3,000, the 4,000 figure. It has 
3,000, 3, and it says nunca mas, never again. The next images are from Old San Juan. Um, these are murals that you can see, prohibido olvidar, mis muertos, tus, muest tus muertos, nuestros muertos. And then, una rosa por 4,645 muertes. The um, bottom right image is a woman holding up a sign saying genocide, and this was part of a mass installation slash protest that took place in front of the Capitol building that we will see in the next slide. Next. Yes, thank you. So um, several artists had this idea of getting pairs of shoes and displaying them in front of the Capitol. The goal was to have over 4,645 pairs of shoes for people to express what happened. And there are also, um, the, you can see that there's a poster board with the information there so people could see it. And many people who lost their families as a result of Maria took their deceased relatives' shoes to be a part of this installation. Personally, I know over 10 people whose relatives died in their homes. And the government said, well, we can't help you. We can't help ourselves. We have no way of getting the body out. So there are instances of people burying the dead in, the, in their yards. There are instances of people having to live with a body in their home for days, perhaps even weeks. And this is a way for the people to protest. Other ways that it was done is poetry written by the diaspora, um, song, Bad Bunny, Residente, and Ile, including um, lyrics um, in their music about Hurricane Maria. So in conclusion, this all has to do with bio and thanato politics or necro politics. Our bodies are more than political apparatuses. Even though Lopez Rojas says, El cuerpo del muerto le pertenece a un aparato político. When the Spanish came, they took over our death processes and they say, this is the good death, not that barbaric, savage thing that you were doing. They took that away. But we keep fighting back. In the, in the tradition of the Taino, in the tradition of the enslaved, we keep finding ways to preserve and remember those who have been gone. And through this, per Sintron Gutierrez, we prove that we don't give up to anyone. We don't, no nos rendimos ante nadie. And this is a way of making history. In el contexto de espacios marginados, hacer historia es poder transcribir la invisibilidad. By having these protests, these murals, these songs, these poems, we are not allowing these dead to disappear. We are making sure that they are remembered every year for the rest of Puerto Rican history. Um, these are my references. Next. <laughs> and that, that is it. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Stella. Great presentation. Uh, these three presentations, I think, probably have people thinking a lot. So <laughs> you probably all have lots and lots of good questions for some good presenters. Uh, let's uh, go to questions now. Who has a question? Questions? Hay preguntas? Okay, we're looking at, uh, we're talking about three presentations now. Itza's presentation about English language acquisition. Stella's presentation that she just gave about uh, uh, the uh, life and death politics uh, involved with uh, in Puerto Rico and with Maria in particular. And then Voices from the Mountains about uh, the University in Mutual. Preguntas? Questions? Uh, can I? Yes, Carmen, Carmen Milagros. Yes, I came since my internet is in and out, but I found very interesting of UPR uh, Utuado about how that student in January was already foreseeing the impact of the virus and all the recommendations which are part of what we are now incorporating. Um, I would like to know more about this uh, after the after the virus became unfortunate reality in our, on our island. How has how did UPA Utuado take this information that the student had provided uh, some months before this impact? Thank you for the question. 
a really great question and and, and um, you know I think one one important uh, message to take away is to never underestimate um, our students to incorporate their interests in the class as much as possible um, and you know, actually, the, one of the fears of the students was that they weren't going to be taken into consideration. Uh, they really didn't believe that it was going to make any impact on, on anyone, what they thought. And um, that's really, you know, something that's very sad. The, the recommendations that they had, um, because we were still trying to uh, make the presentation, we wanted to make it into a nice presentation so that we wouldn't just, what would they, they might have perceived to be just talking from our minds, whereas, um, you know, the, the students had really gotten a lot of information, including um, information that showed that this uh, particular virus was being studied in the 1960s in American universities. Um, so um, when we all went on a break, and actually the students with these initial ideas, they, they, they actually, unfortunately, haven't been able to get in touch with them again. Um, they finished the class and um, have not been able to, to, I haven't been able to reach them. But, I, but I, I'm really glad that, that Nadia and um, Michelle were able to to step in and uh, and that we could leave the the, the mark of, of, of these people um, showing that that young people really have a lot to give thank you for listening to us. more questions más preguntas o comentarios Más preguntas, comentarios. Ok. Um, wow. Uh, Stella. Be some in the chat. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, it would be nice if people ask for the whole. Uh, let's see. Anyway, yeah, people are thanking people. But in any case, anybody else have a question or comment before I start my own? Because uh, if nobody else wants to, I will. Well, I had a comment about the yes. one about uh, the last presentation because the, uh, the first of this group, I wasn't able to be present. I found very interesting the development of the view of death from the indigenous people up to present time. So I wanted to make that comment and uh, basically bringing about the event of Hurricane Maria, which really was one that caused a lot of impact for us. And it was basically seen as they basically just ignore the reality that the death was really in, intense, not only in terms of death, but also other secondary issues. For example, I did not suffer, I was blessed that I wasn't, didn't suffer any death of family member, but their health during that period due to the lack of medical support got deteriorated to an extent that now they have effects that are permanent in their health. So it's, it is a very intense, uh, event that was looked very lightly, unfortunately, by the government. And, and this, this connects as well to, I think, Alan's presentation and Norma's presentation, um, where they are talking about this, um, and, and you mentioned it once, Stella, in yours as well. It was the quote where somebody was talking about um, a trans, uh, in, in, in terms of a tr another kind of trans movement, because uh, this this barrier, this artificial barrier between the living and the dead had to be um, imposed on the people of Puerto Rico by the colonial government. And so the government says it has to happen this way and they impose it to the encomenderos. So the encomenderos are really slave masters, essentially. They are the ones who enslaved the indigenous people. But as the slave masters, they had certain responsibilities. Okay, and one of the responsibilities, they had to make sure there was a separation between life and death. So when somebody died, they have to go away. <laughs> they have to go away, you have to put a cross on top of the, 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 the grave, and then that separation is made complete. But, so there are a couple of things going on there. There's that separation, which doesn't permit transing. <laughs> you can't 
you can't do shamanistic things with it because it's completely separated. So it, it doesn't allow that trans kind of movement, that trans kind of uh, articulation that allows for healing. So people uh, uh, end up taking death as a, as a process that, that scars them for life. If somebody you love dies, there's no proper way of dealing with that. Uh, of course, people, and I like the way you brought out the fact that people rebel uh, in the Bakine. So that was, a, that was a way. But then again, okay, when Maria strikes, okay, one thing that happens during the colonial times is the government claims responsibility or, or the, the colony claims responsibility. So today, the government is supposed to re be responsible at least for the corpses and they weren't responsible for the corpses. If people, if those traditions had continued to today in Puerto Rico, there would have been a way to, to deal with those corpses, but because the government, it just show, shows how the government is much less powerful than the people. The people have the power, not the government. And when something like a hurricane happens, it's the people, it's the people who bring, uh, who, 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 who save us, not the government. So these are all really, really good points. Uh, do you have something more to say yo, about that, Stella? Yo. Okay, yes, just one. Sí que, eh, 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 más allá de que controlen este, los recursos, más allá de que controlen eh, cómo definimos la muerte, en el caso de Huracán María, como que cómo, cómo controlar los cuerpos de los vivos y de las muertas, eh, también controlaban la forma en que definimos al huracán. Eh, que se ve como algo que es eh, totalmente malo. Y de hecho, sí lo es, sí. Pero también es un proceso eh, como de renovación. Porque de hecho, na naturalmente, los huracanes son para limpiar los espacios. Entonces, eh, por ejemplo, en mi caso, eh, que quizá no conecta mucho, o yo no sé conectarlo, pero cuando terminó el huracán, María era como, no hay comida, eh, todo está destruido, no puedes ver a todos los familiares, pero había una sensación como de paz, como que ya no tengo nada más que los estudios, no tengo nada que perder, estoy viviendo el momento. Entonces es interesante para mí en mi caso eh, que ese proceso después de María, ese mes que pareció un día completo, eh, fue el proceso donde yo decidí dejar de ser hombre y convertirme en una mujer aceptar ese proceso y no sé bien cómo conecta pero fue en eso, eh, tiene que ver mucho con, con esa con que va a pasar la huracán María y con los efectos que usó el huracán María que puede ser visto de, de algo como personal por el sufrimiento o incluso espiritual pienso yo pero o sea it, it totally makes sense porque that's that's biopower tú estás tomando control de tu vida de tu cuerpo y tú estás tomando decisiones sobre tu cuerpo y eso súper conectado, o sea, a diferencia de lo que el gobierno trató de hacer, que era como que tú no tienes ni control ni, por, ni de tu vida, ni de tu muerte, ni, ni de la narrativa. I'm not going to sí, let entonces, you say. Es interesante porque en ese momento de, yo lo veo así, quizás estoy equivocada, pero en ese momento eh, que María pasó, esos meses donde el tiempo no corría, el, el sistema de dominación eh, dejó de controlar el discurso porque ya no había medios para controlar el discurso, sino los que habían uh -huh. ya antes. Entonces ese proceso fue, yo, yo creo, el que dio paso a que las comunidades volvieran a unirse y se crearan o sobrevivieran o revitalizaran nuevos discursos. Uh -huh. Yo creo que eso también fue lo que me dio paso a mí a poder aceptarme, creo, lo pongo como hipótesis. No, oh. o sea, it, no, yeah, it right. makes sense. Uh, sorry. No, no, es <laughs> um, okay, it's it, okay. It, it makes sense because en su mente, este, el gobierno, de, los élites, los que nos mandan, ellos estaban creando esta narrativa. They were crafting this idea and that was what they were trying to send out to the world. Eso era lo que querían decirle al mundo. Y hasta cierto punto tuvieron éxito, pero cuando las comunidades encontraron la manera de, de llevar su mensaje, o sea, las comunidades entre sí eran las que se estaban salvando. Nadie estaba esperando por el gobierno porque nunca iba a llegar. Todavía estoy esperando a que lleguen a Cabo Rojo. O sea... Este, ups, este, eso fue ahí yo. <risa> Pero el, el gobierno trató de hilar su narrativa y presentar su narrativa y el pueblo dijo no. O sea, al estar desconectados completamente, el pueblo pudo hacer su narrativa, hacer sus protestas, 
tratar de llevar a cabo sus procesos aparte para sanar, para rehabilitar. Y el gobierno estaba como que en negación total, era como que la, 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 I can't hear you. And they tried to silence. Pero no funcionó, porque ahora lo que, se, lo que se acuerda es como que el gobierno alegó esto, pero entonces el pueblo dice esto. So, makes total sense. Ok, so, Isa, um, we're, on the, we're on the theme of trans, ok, transing in terms of life and death, transing in terms of gender, transing in terms of all kinds of different kinds of trans articulations, trans movements. Uh, trans uh, processes of thinking. So, um, an interesting thing you said was the approach of the government of Puerto Rico to bilingualism. Uh, it, it, it's it's one where uh, I guess uh, they're they're again trying to establish these artificial separations between English and Spanish, and not allowing students to actually translate language in the classroom. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, of course. That's actually something I'm really interested in because uh, here we have this mentality that if a school ha is going to be bilingual, it should only focus on English because you get Spanish outside of the classroom. You can speak Spanish with your family. You can just use Spanish in regular everyday situations and you should only use English in the classroom. And I feel like that is not efficient at all because like I mentioned, it's just... Um, imposing this subtractive bilingualism model so it's just saying okay you can only develop your academic side of you in english and then your colloquial or like your everyday communication in spanish you don't develop those equally which is what we should strive for right a, a more balanced approach to bilingualism where we can talk about for example uh any topic related to science in both english and spanish that is what we should strive for with whenever we're learning another language right we should be able to have the same knowledge in either language, not just saying, okay, I can only talk about science in English because I learned it in English and I never learned this in Spanish. I can only express my emotions in Spanish because that's just the way I'm used to doing it. I, I never express my emotions in English. So having that view, I feel like it's very close-minded and I feel like that's something that should definitely change. Yes, and also the healing aspect of it. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the, the, those processes leave people damaged and it's only in the trans moving from one language to mm -hmm. another and being able to, to, to use all of those, all of your knowledge about one language to, uh, to, to, and apply that to the other language. All of that um, also has a healing aspect. So, mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to what Alan was saying about shamanism. If you can move between the two worlds, that's healing. And what Stella was saying about being able to move between the world of the living and the dead, that's healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, uh, Flavia, Flavia oh, go, who, who wanted to say something? Flavia, Flavia, you've had your hand up for a long time. Sorry, oh, Flavia. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> Congratulations to everybody that participated. I got in a little late, but um, I got to hear some of it. My my comment is, is from Miss Stella because I had the experience of losing everything in Hurricane Maria. I was practically living in the living room with no light, nothing, but I lost everything because my apartment flooded and exploded from the inside out. I lost walls, everything. Um, we were given the option of staying here or leaving to the States to go stay in some hotels if we wanted to. FEMA would pay for that. And I have a son that had an operation, so, but we decided to stay. Then we were given, a lot of people don't know this, but um, there was Netflix was here after the hurricane looking for people to participate in a documentary that was going to be called After Maria. And they were going to give us a good amount of money to participate, but they had their narrative. They had what they wanted us to say about the hurricane, what we should say and what, it was basically scripted. And I was like, you know, you're gonna give us a lot of money. We're gonna come out in a documentary. And then they said, we're gonna fly you out. You can stay in a hotel over there. You will say you stood there all the time during the hurricane. So this uh, this um, process of death and Hurricane Maria has been manipulated by government, 
by media, by a whole lot of things. Um, so I think it's very interesting that, you know, artists have tried to give their way, you know, and express themselves as best as we can in terms of to say what really happened here during Maria. Um, I think it's really interesting about the concept that we have of death, right? Um, and I, I found the, all of your presentations lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also very happy because it's a lot of women that are presenting. Sorry, Professor, but I'm excited. They're women. Hey, you know? <laughs> That a lot of us, the, the chicks are having a good time here and presenting. So thank you very much to all of you. Okay, uh, for the Utuado team, um, okay, we can think about these divisions, these artificial divisions, and the fact that people don't are, are afraid to cross them, and that, that that we haven't brought that trans dimension into our lives. Uh, in terms of what, um, if you look, if you compare Rio Piedras with Utuado and as, as campuses, as university campuses. Uh, Rio Piedras has lot, is a lot bigger, has lots more money, lots more resources, and it's not under threat to be closed. Utuado has fewer, fewer, few, less money, less, less of a budget. It's constantly under threat of being closed down. It has fewer students, but uh, because it seems like Utuado is doing much more in terms of connecting with its community than Rio Piedras is. Um, it's almost like uh, when you walk into the gate of the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, you're walking on, in, onto another planet. Um, there's no connection. That trans isn't there. So we've been talking about trans, transition, trans languaging, trans uh, trans articulation and academics as well are are one the our uh, disciplines have made it so that there's a division between what we do in the classroom and then what happens in the community in our real lives so it seems like in in uh, Utuado you've been much more successful than we have been in um, in Rio Piedras in uh, taking on that trans dimension of what it means to be in a university. Thank you for that. Um, yes, it, it, everything, you know, what, what, what we've been learning is, is, as you have mentioned, that everything depends on us to make the difference, that there is no one who's going to come and rescue us and do all of these great things for us. We are the ones who have to make it happen. And, and I find so inspiring that, that the students are the ones, um, you know, who go in there. La, la, cuando yo estudiaba en la universidad, las muchachas se interesaban más en si, en, si, si el lipstick le combinaba con la camisa, you know, que, y estas, estas estudiantes están jóvenes y no les importa eso, van con sus botas, van, van todos llenos de tierra porque estaban este, trabajando en la tierra, y pues eso, eso you know, inspira a uno mucho. Y um, one thing that I wanted to say as well, that I keep, I feel like I've heard this, this recurring um, pattern is this, um, this Como que cuando el gobierno esconde, when the government hides things, it can be so powerful and how much it is up to us to reveal these things. You know, the, los votos escondidos, este, la gente, la gente que, que, que no se contaba este, después del huracán, eh, lo, lo, the supplies, the such needed supplies que habían montones y montones en Ponce y hasta que la gente no descubrió eso, no, no, no sabíamos que todo estaba ahí para nosotros desde, desde María. Pues, este, y, y eso también de, de, de querer esconder este, las la perspectivas de las personas y cómo, cómo uno se siente sobre uno mismo. Pues, I think that, um, you know, these kinds of stories are just so important because then they can open up our perspectives. And so we really appreciate hearing all of your perspectives and hearing all of your stories so that we can work together to, to make a better world. Okay, it's 12 o'clock. Oh, go ahead. Wait, no, yes, que contesté please. porque Michelle y, y Nadia se tuvieron que se tuvieron que ir a, a otros este asuntos, pero pues okay. gracias. Okay, it's already 12 o'clock and this is time for our break, but we can continue this conversation. We don't, we can, uh, uh, and uh, we can continue uh, uh, with questions and comments. If anybody has questions or comments, we can just continue. We don't have to uh, obey the artificial 
uh, separation of time between uh, session and break. Uh, but the next presentations will be at one o'clock in the afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's time to start our afternoon session. We just took about a 10 minute break um, because uh, what happened was we had our morning session and everybody was uh, so involved in the conversation that we went on until just about 10 minutes ago. So we thought, okay, well, at least let's take a, instead of an hour break, let's take at least a 10 minute break. So here we are back from the break now and getting ready for the next session. Okay, so uh, our first presentation uh, will be by Zahaira Cruz Aponte, and she'll be talking about Perate, on Etnografia de la Comunicación a Estudiantes Adolescentes. Our next uh, presenter will be Zahaira Cruz Aponte. I will get her presentation on the screen, Zahaira, and then... Um, Okay, Zahaira, um, let's see, let's see if I can get you into the, there we go, Zahaira. Sí, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Como mencionó el profesor, soy Zahaira Yanis Cruz Aponte, pertenezco al programa graduado de lingüística y les compartiré con ustedes un proyecto que desarrollé para el curso de etnolingüística con la doctora Alma Simone. Todos se pueden esperar un momentito. Es que... Esta presentación se llama Pérate, una etnografía de la comunicación a estudiantes adolescentes. En una introducción muy breve, la lengua y la cultura habían podido ser estudiadas desde la lingüística, que es la disciplina que se encarga del estudio científico de la lengua, y desde la cultura, desde la etnolingüística, desde la etnografía que se trata del estudio de la cultura. Así que, surgió una necesidad de vincular correctamente la lengua con la cultura. Entonces, a partir de Heinz, 1962, aparece la etnografía de la comunicación. La etnografía de la comunicación se trata del comportamiento, del estudio del comportamiento comunicativo en un contexto cultural específico. Podemos pasar al siguiente. Y es propuesta por Heinz en el 1962. Siguiente. Como parte de la justificación de este trabajo, Heinz 1962 plantea la necesidad de vincular correctamente la lengua con la cultura. O sea, estudiar un comportamiento comunicativo en, en un lugar en específico. Santiago Ortiz, 1994, nos comenta en su trabajo que la vida de un pueblo afecta su lengua. Y además, Santiago Ortiz, 1994, nos dice que los adolescentes hablan una jerga, o sea, que, que expresan mmm, expresiones particulares de ellos. Asimismo, Vaquero y Morales, 2002, resaltan la diferencia entre un estudio sobre la lengua de supongamos hace 10 años y uno de ahora. O sea, nos dice que no es lo mismo un estudio de, de lo que se hablaba hace 10 años a lo que se habla ahora. El propósito de este trabajo era hacer una etnografía de la comunicación, basado en Heinz, 1962. Esa etnografía de la comunicación, nosotros observamos particularmente el léxico, las interacciones y los registros informales en un grupo de adolescentes en Puerto Rico. Así que las preguntas eran, ¿cuál es el léxico de estos adolescentes? ¿Cuáles son las interacciones? ¿Y cuáles son los registros informales? Además, nos interesamos en cuáles sus categorías podrían surgir del léxico. ¿Cuáles sus categorías podrían surgir de las interacciones? ¿Y cuáles sus categorías podrían surgir de los registros informales? Es importante, para que todos estemos en la misma página, aquí virtualmente, que nosotros conozcamos cómo definimos estos términos. Primero, el vocabulario. Se refería, el léxico se refería al vocabulario. 
o las palabras, las frases e interjecciones. Por ejemplo, hay. Las interacciones eran relaciones entre el estudiante y alguien o algo más. Eso algo podía ser un objeto, o sea, relaciones entre el estudiante y otra persona o entre el estudiante y algo. Normas, aspectos de organización en el salón de clases. Los registros informales se refería a todo tipo de expresión que se vinculara con, con un registro informal, por ejemplo, el tuteo. Y cuando digamos adolescentes, en esta investigación se referirá específicamente a los alumnos de séptimo grado de dos secciones que explicaremos en la metodología, grupo 1 y grupo 2, que pertenecían a una, edad de, a una edad supuesta de 12 años y a una clase de español. Cuando nosotros hacemos una búsqueda de revisión de literatura tratando los temas de léxico, interacciones, registros informales, en adolescentes en Puerto Rico, nosotros encontramos entre ellos a Altieri de Barreto. Altieri de Barreto, en 1973, desarrolla un trabajo sobre el léxico de la delincuencia. Ese trabajo se asimila al nuestro en que ese léxico es de Puerto Rico. Y además, dentro del vocabulario de la delincuencia en Puerto Rico, surgieron las categorías de anglicismo, préstamos, ironías, eufemismos, los cuales también observaremos en el, la, en el análisis a los estudiantes adolescentes. Además, Santiago Ortiz, 1994, nos presenta otro trabajo investigativo en el cual también estudia como población el estudiantado adolescente y se centra en cuál es su riqueza léxica, pero lo hace a través de otro método que sería un cuestionario de 30 códigos. La metodología, ¿qué fue lo que nosotros hicimos? Pues nosotros hicimos la etnografía de la comunicación de Heinz 1962, que también la explica el otro autor en pantalla, que constó específicamente de observaciones y apuntes. Como si fuéramos para el salón de clases, ¿verdad? Entonces, los sujetos, ¿a quiénes estuvimos observando? Se trató de unos 57 adolescentes estudiantes de una clase de español. Esa clase de español se dividía en dos secciones. Esas secciones las llamamos grupo 1 y grupo 2. El grupo 1 contenía aproximadamente unos 32 adolescentes. Los temas que se discutieron mientras estuvimos realizando las observaciones eran la gramática universal y las tertulias literarias. El grupo 2 se componía de unos 25 adolescentes y los temas fueron conocimiento metalingüístico y edición de textos. Estas observaciones que hicimos se realizaron en días distintos. Y las observaciones constaron de, nosotros atendimos, en total observamos cuatro clases. Cada clase era de una hora a 30 minutos. Y pues para estar parejos hicimos dos observaciones al grupo 1, dos observaciones de clase al grupo 1, de una hora y 30 minutos cada una, y dos observaciones de clases al grupo 2, de una hora a 30 minutos cada uno. Así que en total, lo que presentaremos corresponden a seis horas de observación. Esto que está aquí es un resumen, simplemente un resumen de cómo fue nuestro procedimiento de las cosas que estuvimos haciendo. Nosotras habíamos tomado las notas a mano, luego en el paso 1 pasamos las notas a computadora añadiendo algunos comentarios. En el paso 2, nosotros organizamos las observaciones en tablas, en Excel, y luego, a partir de las observaciones, fuimos capaces de ir leyendo y creando sus categorías. Así que así se basó el procedimiento. Y como nuestra presentación es de 12 minutos, vamos a los resultados. Y en los resultados, la primera pregunta era, ¿cuál es el léxico de los estudiantes adolescentes? en el grupo 1 y en el grupo 2. En el grupo 1, esta es la razón por la que titulamos la presentación Pérate, porque en el grupo 1, una de las palabras que surgió fue Pérate. ¿Qué es? Por no decir espérate, pues espérate. También please, picharlo, alcapurria y todas las otras que se muestran aquí. En el grupo 2, aparecieron palabras como inalmorzó, que significa no almorzó, para ellos significa no almorzó, guaguando, 
una palabra sumamente curiosa que significó para ellos guiando una guagua. También lo lo lo, que lo clasificamos como, como una onomatopeya, y también otras expresiones como las que vemos aquí, biography, of poor, la rosalía, escobando, ¿verdad? De, de escoba también inventada, caramba, email, vacilamos, chancleta, Netflix, entre otras. Esto es un ejemplo de uno de los contextos porque con estas palabras, aunque se las presentamos ahí aisladas, pues se desarrolló, se escribió todo el contexto de ellas. Así que cuando se dijo la palabra alcapurria, por ejemplo, ahí la, el instructor estaba tratando de estimular una palabra que empezara con alca. Entonces le dijo alca. Y en vez de decir alca nueces, dijeron alcapurria. Si hay alguien que no conoce lo que es una alcapurria, pues una alcapurria, una fritura típica, así que se come mucho aquí en Puerto Rico, que está hecha de una, tiene la forma de una croqueta grande, hecha de yautía o plátano rallado. Y te la puedes comer con las manos, te la puedes comer como tú quieras, para que sepa sabrosa. Siguiente. Entonces, vamos a esta pregunta porque se relaciona con la anterior. En la primera nos presentábamos ejemplos de léxico. Aquí lo que presentamos son las subcategorías, que era la pregunta 4. Así que dentro de las subcategorías había aféresis. Aféresis, el acortamiento de palabras al principio. Ahí fue clasificada pérate. También tuvimos expresiones del inglés o de la influencia del inglés como email, missis, please, of course. Palabras que eran parte de dictado y que los estudiantes repitieron como dirigir, algún, a través, expresión. Términos de cortesía, como, por favor, eufemismo, que les tengo una adivinanza para el final, pero al final es, ¿a qué pertenece caramba? Caramba es un eufemismo, que solamente lo observamos en el grupo 2. También tuvimos creaciones de palabras, como en almorzó, que significó no almorzó, lo que les mencionaba, onomatopeyas como tarararán, interjenciones, uh, ah, sustantivos comunes, o propios como la maestra, la rosalía, Netflix, y verbos como vacilamos. Un ejemplo de ese contexto, que, que es también la razón del título de, del trabajo, espérate, refirió un estudiante, que fue correspondido por el instructor por un, si espérate, es por favor, espérate, era una férisis, mientras que por favor, era un término de cortesía, es un término de cortesía. Como parte de las interacciones, eh, que es la pregunta 2, se vinculaba con las interacciones, pues, ¿qué observamos? Como parte de las interacciones en el grupo 1 hubo contacto visual, que era una de las reglas, mantener el contacto visual con el instructor. Saludaban a los externos, si llegaba alguien, ellos no se quedaban callados, saludaban a la persona que entrara. También los estudiantes chocaban la mano con el instructor cuando hacían como que alguna buena. Y en el grupo 2, por ejemplo, los estudiantes completaron palabras conocidas. El instructor decía chomps y los estudiantes decían key. El instructor decía bigots y los estudiantes respondían key. Entonces, algo, un tema que también es interesante en la lingüística es la del silencio como respuesta. El silencio como respuesta también se observó y es uno de los ejemplos que mostramos aquí. Y también hubo intervenciones de los estudiantes con, con el instructor. Por ejemplo, en un dictado había la... El estudiante pregunta, ¿algún lleva acento? Y algún era una palabra que estaba en el dictado. Ahora, ¿qué subcategorías surgen de las interacciones? Las categorías que surgen de las interacciones... Observamos básicamente las mismas, pero con algunas diferencias. O sea, observamos que habían estrategias de enseñanza o, o reglas como mantener el contacto visual. Observamos las relaciones con los externos. Todo eso fueron interacciones. Entonces, por ejemplo, las diferencias que, hemos, que encontramos simplemente que en las ocasiones de las observaciones este, anotamos no son representativas de lo que tiene que ocurrir este, siempre. En el grupo 1 hubo, in, hubo interacción durante el tiempo de las observaciones con el dispositivo móvil. Ellos estaban haciendo el juego de Kahoot, 
así que usaron el dispositivo móvil, así que no solamente hubo interacciones con personas, sino también con la tecnología, algo que me parece este, interesante. Y además hubo reacción de los estudiantes a estímulos. Esta me parece muy curiosa, porque era la de un estudiante recibe un papel, vamos a coger uno, y entonces comienza a leer las instrucciones y dice, oh my God, mira este papel, está muy nice. La persona debió haber sido muy amable. Y dice esto simplemente porque el papel, las instrucciones están escritas de una manera que dice, por favor, prosiga la próxima por la manera en que es redactada las instrucciones en un papel. Así que esas fueron parte de las interacciones que se observan en el grupo 2. Entonces, vamos a los registros informales. Los registros informales encontramos en el grupo 1 palabras como palabras, expresiones o frases, como bueno, a lo mejor. Y en el grupo 2 encontramos palabras o frases como a que me colgué, por mi madre, se ve mal, se ve sucio y otras más. Están, a, están ahí en violetita, en rojo. Dilo. Entonces, por ejemplo, aquí hay una ocasión del día de la entrega de notas. Esto es una, una ocasión de, de cuáles fueron esas expresiones informales. Pues mira, en la ocasión del día de las notas, el instructor concedió, están, están como todos bien, bien animados, así que el instructor concedió un minuto para expresarse, para que los estudiantes descargaran emociones. Y... Uno de los estudiantes viene y responde, que fue catalogado como registro informal, a que me colgué. Así que ese fue el caso de uno y pues regañaron al estudiante. Y estas otras que nos parecieron bien interesantes porque los registros informales también se marcaron con, con frases, con expresiones que, que además tenían figuras retóricas, por ejemplo, personificación. Hubo un estudiante que en una ocasión dijo, y a veces me como las palabras. Y pues nosotros decimos eso todo el tiempo, cuando nos saltamos alguna palabra, escribiendo, hablando. Pero verdaderamente, pues las palabras no se comen, así que contiene personificación. Y es también otra que nos pareció... Nos pareció curiosa y la clasificamos como que contenido ironía, es registro informal de que el instructor notificó que trabajarían en pares, o sea, en grupos. Y hubo un estudiante que respondió, sin ninguna mala intención, con la soledad. Así que iba a trabajar pues solita, nos dijo eso. Y nada, hasta aquí la presentación para Caribe Plurilingüe y estoy disponible para cualquier pregunta. Gracias a todos. Muchísimas gracias, excelente. Eh, vamos a continuar con las presentaciones y habrá uh, un momento para preguntas después de uh, la, tercera, uh, la tercera presentación de esta sesión. So, uh, we're going to continue with the presentations and we'll have questions after the third presentation in this session. Our next presentation will be by Fabiola Martinez del Valle and she'll be talking about social conditioning of the lateral variant of R in Puerto Rican Spanish. I'll get that up on the screen in a moment, Fabiola, and then you can start. Okay, Fabiola. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the professor said, my name is Fabiola Martinez del Valle. Um, I will be talking today about my investigation called the lateral variant of R and correlated social factors in Puerto Rican Spanish. This is an investigation I did a couple of years ago as part of my bachelor's degree in English. So, in Puerto Rico, so there has been like a slow and a change called lateralization and this process consists of changing the phonetic movement of the phone r from movement 
what does that mean? So a thrill is a phonetic movement produced by putting the tip of your tongue into the alveolar ridge and then striking it at least twice. In other words, vibrating it. And you get a word like carne. While a lateral uh, phonetic movement is produced by putting the tip of the tongue at the alveolar ridge, but instead of striking it, you're going to leave it in place and then the blades of the tongue are going to go down and the airstream, instead of going forward, is going to go to the sides. And then we have the word like So this process has been confirmed and documented by several Caribbean studies. One in her 2008 study, Gabriela G. Alfaras um, investigated Puerto uh, Cuban Spanish lateralization. And she saw correlations between gender, age, and place of upbringing. More close to home, we have Jonathan Carl Holmquist, which studied Puerto Rican Spanish lateralization, but instead he gave it a little bit more of a focus into the place of upbringing. Next. So with that in mind, um, this study adds to the work of the mentioned researchers, and we will explore how widespread lateralization has become in Puerto Rico, as well as some of the social factors like age, gender, and place of upbringing that are correlated with it. Next slide. So how did I do this? So I would look for volunteers. The volunteers who accepted that would then be given a questionnaire. This questionnaire has two different parts. The first part was five social demographic questions, which will later be used to correlate those factors with the lateralization, but they were kept anonymous. The second part consisted of 23 sentences. So each participant had to read aloud each sentence, and then in a Likert scale, they had to say, did it sound good enough? Did it sound bad? How was that sentence working out for you? Next. So while they were talking out loud, I had a tally sheet and I would be listening carefully to the different places they could potentially lateralize. And in the tally sheet, as you can see in the picture, I would just say here in this place. Each sentence had up to three possible places of lateralization. For example, there could be a sentence like, vamos a comer, and then I could hear if they would say comer o comer and then I would mark it up in the tally sheet. So what did I end up having as subjects then after recollecting this data? So I ended up with 16 subjects that were divided into the following groups. There were two age groups, which was from 18 to 25 and 45 to 55. Then we had two groups based on the place of upbringing which would be nine rural and seven urban. And then we have two groups divided into their gender, which was nine females and seven males. So what did we get as a result? So the first thing we saw, as you can see in the graph, was that age was the strongest contrast in frequency of lateralization. As you can see, the line, the yellow line is for the people who were from the age 45 to 55, and the orange is the one from 18 to 28. And we can see that younger speakers lateralized with a 41.3%, while older speakers had a 7.4 frequency of lateralization. When it comes to the place of upbringing, it, there was the group of speaker raised in the urban setting, lateralized R with a slightly higher frequency with just 27%. That would be the, the line, the green, sorry, the black line. When it came to the people from the rural setting, they only lateralized 21.9%. There's a difference, but it's not that much. And finally, when it came to the gender, social fact, there was no apparent contrast in frequency. As you can see, the lines are basically on top of each other. It's not like age, that they were very far away from each other. Place of upbringing was a little bit closer, but age were all, all over the place and basically on top of each other. So what does this 
results mean overall to my investigation. So when it comes to age, our findings do match those earlier studies, such as those conducted by Holmquist and Alfaras, in which they reported that the higher frequencies of letterization in syllable final R were frequent in younger speakers than older speakers. As Alfara observed, the lateral variant had been increasing among young speakers in her Cuban Spanish lateralization investigation. In terms of place of our bring, upbringing, our findings partially matched those earlier studies, such as the one conducted by Holmquist. He reported that there was a higher frequency lateralization when it comes to urban speakers than among rural, rural speakers. As Holmquist indicated, the lateralization of syllable final R as acuerdo o trabajar versus acuerdo en trabajar has been associated most closely with the urban northeastern end of the island. And finally, when it comes to gender, just like Alfaras reported, though, there was little correlation between gender and frequency of lateralization of syllable final R, so does our research demonstrated that there is no difference between gender and lateralization. So overall, this investigation, what shows is that there has been a significant change in lateralization. While some factors continue to be highly correlated with lateralization, such as age, some others like place of upbringing has been smoothed out because even though there's a difference, it's just a 5.1% difference. And in addition, the previous studies showed a percentage of lateralization overall less than my study. So it shows that widespread lateralization has become a phenomenon on Puerto Rico regardless of the social factors. So that's basically my investigation um, and questions, I guess, is for afterwards. Thanks, great presentation. Okay, so now we'll go to the last Thank presentation you. of this session. Um, and the final presentation of this particular session, we have two more sessions to go after this though, is Alternancia de Códigos en Puerto Rico, un acercamiento sintáctico prosódico sociopragmático de Mildred Carrasco, Carrasco uh, Santos. Uh, Mildred, I'll uh, get your presentation up on the screen now. Okay, Mildred. Hola, buenas tardes. Buenas Mi tardes. nombre es Mildred Carrasco, pertenezco al programa de lingüística de estudios hispánicos y les estaré presentando un trabajo en progreso, todavía no está culminado, sobre patrones en el uso de la alternancia de códigos en Puerto Rico. La, la alternancia de códigos se ha definido mayormente como el uso alternado y fluido de dos o más lenguas en la expresión oral o escrita sin que se incurra en un cambio de interlocutor ni tema. Este ejemplo que les presento aquí es el de una enunciación que contiene alternancia de códigos de uno de mis participantes y dice um, Es como un cómic donde el gorila kidnap a woman and he's making a really cheap excuse, and on the she's still mad, pero le ofrece una bebida y ella le pelea. Y así continúa la anunciación de esta participante. En cuanto a los estudios previos, en un principio se propuso una inexistencia de restricciones, es decir, que la alternancia de códigos ocurre al azar. Sin embargo, a medida que se hicieron más investigaciones en el campo, se propusieron restricciones sintácticas siendo las de Poblac las más importantes y las que han trascendido en el tiempo. Es, eh, luego se propusieron también restricciones psicolingüísticas y funciones sociopragmáticas. Siguiente. Siguiente. Eh, sin embargo, no existe un consenso sobre las restricciones gramaticales que propician la alternancia de códigos ya que distintos pares de lenguas violan con frecuencia estas, estas restricciones sintácticas que se habían propuesto. Por tanto, 
eh, se ha propuesto recientemente investigar la alternancia de códigos desde un punto de vista prosódico y desde este paradigma se propone una conexión entre la sintaxis y la prosodia, que voy a explicar más adelante. Siguiente. Voy a hablar brevemente sobre la situación del español y el inglés en Puerto Rico. Eh, sabemos que existe una coexistencia de ambas lenguas en Puerto Rico desde 1898. Sin embargo, el nivel de bilingüismo en la isla varía considerablemente. En el censo de 2010, el 66.4% de los puertorriqueños reportó no hablar inglés o no hablarlo bien. Sería interesante eh, poder comparar esos datos del censo del 2010 con estos del 2020. Eh, a partir de ese censo del 2010 sabemos que ha habido un avance en el nivel de bilingüismo de los puertorriqueños, especialmente los jóvenes y a su vez un incremento en el uso de la alternancia de códigos y generalmente también ha habido un cambio de actitudes más favorable hacia el inglés. Eh, algunos de los objetivos de la presente investigación son los siguientes. Examinar las características prosódicas y sintácticas de la alternancia de códigos de la población puertorriqueña joven y bilingüe auscultar la relación entre la sintaxis y la prosodia de estos enunciados bilingües, identificar las funciones sociopragmáticas de la alternancia de códigos en la isla y finalmente correlacionar la alternancia de códigos y los diversos factores sociolingüísticos entre los puertorriqueños jóvenes bilingües. En cuanto al acercamiento teórico, se propone una interfaz lingüística entre la sintaxis y la prosodia. Este acercamiento propone que los hablantes no alteren sus lenguas hasta cumplir con ciertos factores sintácticos y prosódicos. Dentro de este planteamiento de interfaz, se toman en cuenta los puntos de compleción eh, entre la sintaxis y la prosodia. En el ámbito prosódico, la frase de entonación, para que se considere completa, debe tener un contorno entonativo final en el espectro, es decir, que haya una caída en la entonación. Y para que se considere la frase sintácticamente completa, las frases deben estar bien formadas. A esto me refiero a que se recojan los argumentos y los complementos de dicha frase. Siguiente. Eh, ah, eh, se me olvidó comentar que también eh, se investigaron funciones eh, sociopragmáticas que las voy a mencionar más adelante. En cuanto a la metodología, hasta el momento pude, he podido analizar 20 puertorriqueños de un eh, corpus de 60 participantes. Estos son estudiantes subgraduados y graduados de la Universidad de Puerto Rico tienen entre 18 y 30 años, todos son bilingües de español y de inglés. Hasta el momento se dividió entre 10 féminas y 10 varones. Es importante recalcar que estos puertorriqueños han pasado la mayor parte de sus vidas en Puerto Rico, para no eh, contaminar los datos. Siguiente. Como parte del procedimiento y los materiales que se utilizaron para la investigación, y los participantes completaron el día de, de las tareas un cuestionario de datos demográficos e eh, historial lingüístico para recoger en dónde estudiaron, eh, eh, cuándo aprendieron inglés, etc. Y también se les hizo unas medidas de dominio lingüístico es decir, se recogieron pruebas de vocabulario en español y en inglés y también pruebas de gramática en español e inglés. Esto que les presento aquí es la tirilla cómica que se les presentó a los participantes el día del estudio para elicitar los datos. A ellos se les instruyó que se, imaginaban, que se imaginaran que estaban narrándole los sucesos de la tirilla a un amigo y se les pidió que hablaran normalmente como hablan con sus amistades, es decir, que no se les pidió específicamente que alternaran los códigos en ningún momento. 
en cuanto a la extracción, a extracción y análisis de los datos, luego de transcribir estas narraciones orales de, la, de las tirillas, se segmentaron en unidades de entonación que se refieren a la unidad básica del discurso que se produce bajo un contorno entonativo coherente y que este nos ayuda en la producción y en la comprensión del lenguaje y del discurso hablado. Eh, según varios autores como Torres, Capullos y Travis, esta segmentación nos permite delimitar la cláusula y le provee al investigador una división más objetiva de los enunciados que producen nuestros hablantes. Siguiente. Como esta segmentación es muy honorosa en tiempo, se utilizó un script de Pratt que permite segmentar estos enunciados a partir de unidades acústicas. En la imagen que les presento en la presentación, es importante destacar el nivel 5, que es el que contiene la segmentación en IU, siguiendo las claves, estas claves acústicas que las puedo mencionar luego. Los datos se validaron con la percepción acústica de la investigadora para hacer estas segmentaciones, así que no se recurrió solamente a este script de Pratt. Siguiente. En cuanto a la codificación de los datos, los factores prosódicos que se tomaron en cuenta fueron la distribución prosódica de la alternancia de códigos, es decir, si, a, si las alternancias ocurrieron dentro de una unidad de entonación, a través de unidades de entonación, alternancias léxicas y la terminación prosódica de la frase que se refiere a los puntos de confusión que acabo de explicar. Los factores sintácticos que se auscultaron fueron las alternancias entre categorías abiertas y cerradas y también si hubo o no terminación sintáctica de la frase. Eh, para las variables sociopragmáticas se tomó en cuenta la elaboración, marcador discursivo, cambio de tópico, alternancias libres, tema de conversación, repetición y si hubo acomodo lingüístico. Las variables sociolingüísticas que se tomaron en cuenta fueron el dominio lingüístico de los participantes y el género. En cuanto a los resultados bien preliminares de la investigación, la alternancia de códigos ocurrió mayormente entre unidades de entonación con un 50.7% dentro de una unidad de entonación o IU en un 25%, y eh, ocurrieron alternancias léxicas en un 24.3%. Siguiente. Aquí esta gráfica muestra la categoría léxica del segmento que le precede a la alternancia de códigos por género y por nivel. El nivel bajo es el azul y el nivel alto es rojo y el género femenino es el azul y el rojo es el masculino. En relación con estos datos, notamos que predominan los sustantivos, los adjetivos y los verbos. Estas son las categorías gramaticales antes de que, de que se genere una alternancia. La próxima gráfica eh, que les muestro es, tiene que ver con la Categoría léxica de la primera palabra de la alternancia de códigos. Y vemos que en este caso predominan los sustantivos, las conjunciones y los determinantes. Siguiente. En cuanto a los resultados de los puntos de comprensión entre las unidades de entonación, se demuestra que no se fragmentan las frases sintácticamente ni prosódicamente en su mayoría en ambos grupos bajo estudio, que es el nivel alto y el nivel bajo. Siguiente. Y en lo que respecta a las consideraciones sociopragmáticas, los hallazgos reflejaron que como estrategia principal pragmática, los hablantes alternan libremente, seguido por la elaboración y el énfasis o la repetición. A medida que analicen más datos, estoy segura que estos resultados van a cambiar totalmente. Siguiente. Ya entrando en la discusión, aunque predomina el español en estas narraciones de las tirillas cómicas, todos los participantes usan bastante alternancia y esto sin demostrar dificultades en el habla al momento de alternar. 
los participantes alternan tanto dentro de unidades de entonación como entre unidades de entonación, pero predomina la alternancia de códigos entre unidades de entonación y estos resultados dialogan con los de Durán Urrea, Chen y otros investigadores. Siguiente. Según los resultados, el dominio del inglés parece jugar un rol más importante que el género. En cuanto al género, hasta el momento no ha habido diferencias drásticas, ya que los participantes de menor dominio produjeron más alternancia entre unidades de entonación o alternancias léxicas, es decir, de una sola palabra. Sin embargo, los participantes de mayor dominio produjeron más alternancias dentro de unidades de entonación y fragmentos alternados más largos. Esto es de esperarse porque se ha documentado que las alternancias dentro de unidades de entonación requieren de un mayor dominio lingüístico y de más control simultáneo de ambas lenguas. Eh, finalmente, los datos confirman la relación entre la, sintaxia, la, entre la sintaxis y la prosodia hasta el momento. Eh, los participantes tienden a no fragmentar los sintagmas entre unidades de entonación debido a factores prosódicos y sintácticos, y esta metodología demuestra ser útil y adecuada para el análisis de la alternancia de código. En cuanto a proyecciones futuras, obviamente debo analizar los datos restantes, recopilar datos con una, teoría, una tarea de, conserva, de conversación más espontánea, esto ya, ya lo recogí antes de la pandemia, gracias a Dios, y la estoy analizando, examinar con más detenimiento el dominio lingüístico, y las alternancias entre determinante y sustantivo, porque ocurrió, ocurrieron muchas alternancias de este tipo. Así que eso sería todo de mi presentación. Muchísimas gracias por la atención. Gracias, gracias, Mildred. Excelente. Quisiera eh, ahora ver si hay algunos comentarios o algunas preguntas. Eh, ahora es el momento de hacer comentarios o hacer preguntas. It's time for questions and comments. Um, any questions or comments for the three presenters? That is uh, Zahaira uh, and her presentation, Pérate, una etnografía de la comunicación a estudiantes adolescentes. Uh, Fabiola's presentation, social conditioning of the lateral variant of R in Puerto Rican Spanish. And then Mildred's presentation on alternancia de códigos en Puerto Rico. Questions, comments, preguntas, comentarios. Bueno, yo tengo una pregunta para las dos, okay. para, para Fabiola. ¿Por qué piensas que los, los younger speakers presentan una frecuencia mayor en, en la lateralización de lo que has leído, de lo que piensas? Pues una de las razones que llegué a leer fue que como ya younger speakers estaban más en escuelas bilingües, o tienen influencia ya sea de media en inglés, la R cuando se lateraliza en español suena como la L, la R en inglés. Entonces como que quizás asimilaron eso. También es una cosa de que si lo asimilan, ellos no quieren hablar como las personas mayores, porque eso, eso es de viejito. Eso. Y pues así es que por eso yo pienso que hay una gran diferencia marcada. También que los viejitos, como dirían, este, quieren hablar perfecto y hablar bien. Que eso fue algo que me di cuenta también durante cuando estaba haciendo la entrevista. Que de momento habían algunos que empezaran a, eh, a lateralizar y de momento como que ellos mismos se daban cuenta que, espérate, no estoy leyendo apropiadamente y como que empezaban a hablar bien como de maestra. Nosotros comemos en el comedor bien así. Y yo como que, ok, se, se, hay un, un estereotipo o algo conectado a eso. Y... Me parece muy curioso lo que, lo que comentas, perdón. Este, me parece muy curioso porque con muchas cuestiones de la lengua, pues siempre existen los mitos de la lengua y mm. las ideas que nosotros pensamos, de hecho también están las percepciones, pueden afectar mm. la manera en que hablamos. Y para acá. No, no, eh, tenías otra pregunta para Mildred, ¿verdad? Zaira. Tenías... Sí, la estoy buscando. Para Mildred, 
eh, quería que me comentara un poquito más acerca de, de, las, de la narración de las comillas, que decía que el tiempo fue una hora, pues cómo fue, este, en qué constó el tiempo de una hora, si fue todo completando la, la tirilla, eso por ahora. Hola, ¿te refieres a que si hubo un tiempo en particular cuando estaban narrando las tirillas? Eh, en la parte de el slide que era sobre las tirillas cómicas que ellos completaban, uh -huh. que decía bajo tiempo estimado, el tiempo, una hora. Si ese tiempo era todo completando las comillas o si hacían algo más. No, sí, todo eso del tiempo en total fue una hora. Particularmente los, los participantes tenían que completar la, el cuestionario eh, demográfico y de historial lingüístico, y eso por lo general eh, duraba más o menos como 20 minutos, entre 20 y 25 minutos. Luego tenían las pruebas de, vocabula de vocabulario y dominio lingüístico, que también tomaba alrededor de 20 minutos entre las dos, y el resto del tiempo se dividió entre pues, que ellos pudieran producir las narraciones orales de la tirilla cómica, yo los dejé totalmente solos para que se sintieran en confianza y gusto y pudieran... Eh, enunciar con más confianza, pero no les limite el tiempo de la tirilla cómica. Ellos narraron todos los recuadros, yo les pedí específicamente que no se saltaran ninguno, y entonces cuando ellos terminaban, paraban la grabación y me llamaban, pero yo no les controlaba el tiempo de la tirilla ni lo que, ni lo que ellos pudieran producir. Gracias, sí. Sajaira. De nada. Entonces, otra que le quería preguntar también a Mildred era si... Si sí, podía comentarnos un poco más acerca de unos resultados que en particular mencionó que, que espera que cambien. Si nos puedes comentar más acerca de, de esa proyecto en que, que piensa, sí, particularmente sobre... los que mencionaste que podrían cambiar. Sí, yo pienso que todos eventualmente van a cambiar, sobre todo cuando comience a analizar las conversaciones entre los participantes, porque esta es una de las tareas, la otra tarea va a ser una conversación entre dos pares de amigos sobre unos temas que yo les especifiqué y también los dejé solo para que pudieran convers conversar con, con bastante familiaridad. Y pues porque sabemos que la alternancia de códigos también es un fenómeno del endogrupo, así que por eso recogí entre conversaciones entre amistades. Y sí pienso que las sociopragmáticas van a cambiar a medida que analice esos otros datos, porque hasta el momento salieron las alternancias libres, pero tengo la hipótesis de que a medida que he auscultado los otros datos, la elaboración es eh, bastante común entre, eh, entre la alternancia de códigos. Se recurre mucho a, a la alternancia de códigos para elaborar más sobre los temas que están hablando y pues para dar énfasis también al discurso. Más preguntas, comentarios. Preguntas, comentarios. Ok, yo tengo una, una pregunta para Zaira. Zaira, eh, ¿cuál de los resultados te sorprendió más de lo demás? Eh, entre lo que has eh, recopilado hasta ahora. Me llamaron mucho la atención el registro informal, porque tal vez no esperaba tantas cosas y lo, lo que en particular me llamó la atención de los registros informales fue que de hecho estoy estudiando para el examen de grado, entonces Leikov y Johnson 1890 nos hablan de las metáforas y todo lo que se puede expresar a través de. Entonces, en esos registros informales precisamente se vio como que todas estas otras cosas maravillosas que nosotros podemos hacer con, con la lengua, y pues se vieron la, la, las personificaciones, se vio que había ironía, entonces estoy segura que si pues continúo observando, podrían aparecer muchas más cosas. Entonces eso fue lo más que me llamó la atención. Una de las experiencias respecto... Simplemente comentar las interacciones. Me estuvo muy curioso que ellos eran bien atentos. Entonces entraba alguien al salón y rápido eh, saludaban, hacían una pregunta a la persona que fuera. En mi caso, que solamente fui con, este, con error de solamente voy a observar, me siento en la parte de atrás, nadie me ve, 
si es posible que yo sea cubierta como invisible mejor para que nadie me vea. Aunque lo traté de hacer así, en una ocasión, uno de los días de la observación, preguntaron por mí, que quién era yo. Entonces, pues son estudiantes muy atentos y esas fueron las cosas que, que, que más me sorprendió dentro de los resultados. Las palabras en respecto al léxico, creo que me esperaba mucho que, que hubiera palabras en inglés como el email, el please, me esperaba, esas me las esperaba, pero todo lo que observé de verdad que, que me pareció genial, que me pareció excelente para ver cómo, pues cómo se comunican los adolescentes y que además es algo que ya vimos con una de las referencias que puede aparecer en el léxico de delincuencia, o sea que hay similitudes entre las helgas que pues que hablen estos adolescentes y que se pueda hablar también en otros contextos. Eh, en, en términos de lo que eh, eh, la, 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 la lógica, la lógica detrás de la de la, uh, de la, la, la manera en que eh, habla la, los, uh, los estudiantes en la clase. Entonces, podemos hablar de una lógica formal o matemática, que es la lógica que se imparte oficialmente en el discurso académico, pero aparentemente, eh, a partir del comentario que acab acabas de hacer, entonces, eh, Quizás hay un papel más importante que juega eh, eh, la lógica imaginativa en, uh, en lo, que, lo que estaba pasando eh, en, uh, en uh, la interacción entre los, uh, los, uh, los estudiantes, los alumnos en el salón de clase. ¿Qué, qué piensas de eso? Sí, definitivamente coincido. Por ejemplo, con el caso del silencio. El silencio es no decir nada. Entonces, ¿cómo es posible que no decir nada signifique algo? Quiere decir que, que hay algo más, que no solamente, o sea, que sobrepasa la lógica matemática para ir a la lógica imaginativa. Y, y pues el silencio me parece el gran ejemplo porque dice, ¿qué tengo? O sea, ¿cuál es el dato? El dato es un vacío. Y sin embargo, ese vacío es capaz de significar lo que decía Austin... Este, que también hablaba de los actos habla de, de los actos del habla entonces coincido definitivamente y cuando hubo momentos de silencio había otras uh, bueno otras otros medios de comunicación que entraba en juego por ejemplo las expresiones uh, o eh, las, los gestos había algo que pasó en los momentos de silencio que, que funcionó como una manera de comun comunicar, pero no de comunicación no verbal. Sí, pues no tengo todos los datos de... Sería algo bien interesante para fijarme cuando es, vuelva a hacer una observación, una etnografía de la comunicación y haya silencio. Tomar de, de todas esas expresiones corporales que puedan significar algo. Sería sumamente interesante como que fijarme y tomar nota sobre eso. Pero sí sé que hay notas en donde, por ejemplo, los estudiantes en una ocasión pues, estaban tan emocionados que se paran de rodillas. Y tengo notas, el estudiante se paró de rodillas eh, para decir algo. Entonces, ese tipo de notas están en donde uno se para el otro, en donde uno golpea al otro. Entonces, sí, definitivamente este, se observan y en ellos ocurrían cosas que eran desde levantarse completamente hasta reaccionar así. El mismo estudiante que dijo reaccionar el papel de que esto está muy nice, en su rostro estaba esta expresión de, de que estoy hablando, como si estuviera hablando con el papel. Entonces es todo un comportamiento este, también corporal que está, que está detrás de, de todas sus expresiones que son verbales. Ok, una pregunta para Mildred. Eh, ¿Puedes comentar un poco más sobre la, el vínculo, la, el interfaz entre... Eh, el, el morfosintaxis y uh, la, la entonación, uh, bueno, a partir de los resultados preliminares de tu estudio. Sí, esto, este nuevo paradigma más o menos en el campo de la ortodoxia de código surge a raíz de, pues, el debate que existe entre 
eh, los patrones sintácticos eh, que se han propuesto hasta ahora y que otros pares de lengua, según se investigan, violan estas restricciones. Y lo que proponen los nuevos investigadores que se han metido en este tema es que el discurso hablado es sumamente complejo para que se explique solamente mediante la sintaxis. Así que, al igual que en el habla monolingüe, el discurso bilingüe es sumamente complejo. Y por eso es que hay que tomar en cuenta eh, también la prosodia cuando se investigan estos temas. Eh, también es un llamado a que las transliteraciones y transcripciones que hagan los lingüistas se hagan mediante este, este método de transcripción que es el de unidades de entonación. Aquí eh, surge la interfaz porque se ha propuesto que para alternar, el momento ideal para alternar no solamente es sintáctico, sino que también tiene que ver con patrones eh, prosódicos, es decir, que haya una terminación sintáctica de la frase, pero que a la misma vez también haya una terminación eh, prosódica, es decir, que se termine con un, una, un patrón entonativo eh, final. Y entonces eso es lo que se propone, que idealmente ese es el momento que tienen los participantes para alternar. Hasta el momento los datos arrojan eso, los participantes alternan siguiendo estas características prosódicas y sintácticas, pero para tener una eh, contestación definitiva tengo que terminar de, de analizar los datos restantes. Pero sí, lo que se propone es que no debemos estudiar la sintaxis por separado, eh, sino que también hay que incluir el componente prosódico y separar los enunciados de los participantes de manera más objetiva. Ok, no tenemos mucho más tiempo, pero quisiera preguntarle a Fabiola. Eh, la, eh, entonces, uh, entonces, hay otros factores eh, sociodemográficos, uh, uh, other factors, other sociodemographic factors that might Uh, since from the results that you got so far, do you think that um, in a future study you might uh, consider other factors that uh, might uh, be influencing the rate at which people uh, lateralize? Yeah, um, though I wanted to check, for example, um, ask them if their school was in bilingual or yeah. if it was monolingual. Also, I wanted to ask them if they were raised all this time in Puerto Rico or did they actually had a moment that they lived in another country to see if those also affects them. Yes, uh, that sounds like a good, that sounds like a, 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 an interesting thing that emerged from your study. Uh, some su uh, suggestion for further study uh, from this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Excellent presentations, excellent uh, comments and questions, uh, mm -hmm. excellent answers to the question. Uh, let's uh, go on to our next session now. Um, our first presenter uh, will be Gabriel Suarez, and uh, the, his, uh, the next presentation will be examining Puerto Rican linguistic identities to English use on billboards, okay? So I'm going to put your presentation up on the screen first, Gabriel, and then uh, let you get started. So, so. All right, Gabriel. Okay. okay, buenas tardes, gracias. This is work in progress. Linguistic landscape is defined as the use of language in public and private advertisements. This is coming from Landry and Borges, 1997. Previous studies on this topic have evidenced that the examination of the linguistic landscape allows researchers to recognize the ethnolinguistic vitality of different groups in a community, as well as the functions of diverse languages in administrative, commercial, and public contexts. In this study, I document and investigate written text and images used on billboards in the metropolitan area of Puerto Rico. The song leads to the presence of English along with Spanish, the most widely used language in the island. From a multimodal discourse analysis perspective, Press 2012, and a critical discourse studies perspective, Van Dyke 2015, I examine the relation between public science and Puerto Rican ideology or ideologies 
as presented on pictures taken from these billboards. The preliminary results are discussed in terms of quantitative facts about written text and social cognition power and even power abuse through the linguistic expression and displayed images on the billboards. Moving on with Scullin and Scullin 2003, the theories present interactive participants in the pictures or signs and their potential of interaction with viewers or readers. When one of the participants in the picture avoids eye contact with viewers or readers, they offer. And if, they are, and if there is eye contact, they demand. Also, they elaborate on human body pictures and explain how a close-up image composes social space. And an entire body image in the environment establishes public distance. For my research purposes, it is important to highlight here how picture shot angles are connected to power and involvement. This time, pictures taken from below are por portrayed in position, whereas invitation is portrayed from above. Once these visual semiotics have been studied, Scullin and Scullin demonstrate how signs obtain their meaning from time, space, and the social world indexed by language. Scholar and Scholar provide the reader with an introduction on geosemiotics. Another perspective, perspective that I should that I'll be using is the subsistence perspective. Taking for example Maria Miss article 2001, it is a kind of counter manifesto that claims, I quote, to maintain a concept of labor in which enjoyment as well as the harness of work are united, end of quote. She believes in maintenance of self-sustaining survival systems, a subsistence perspective, with, quote, a moral economy based on principle, not merely on supply and demand, end of the, of the quote. Her words are for people to resist the growth model as a strategy combining the goal of ecology, movement, anti-colonialism, and women's liberation simultaneously. To these proposals, she adds the need of, quote, integration of theory and practice. Also, she proclaims women's emancipation without having to accept to be non-mothers or career women. Let's talk a little about multimodal discourse analysis, starting from 1996, Press and Van Leeuwen portrayed images as matrices of signs in societies and cultures. For them, previously produced signs become the signifier material to be transformed into new signs. Contrary to Ferdinand de Saussure and his idea of an arbitrary and conventional sign, they contend to demonstrate it is motivated and conventional. Sign makers then present how they see an object in the most plausible form of representation, concluding that there is something like a Western grammar of three-dimensional visual design, a set of forms and meanings, and a Western grammar of moving image. Chris and Van Leeuwen understand globalization as a paradox. They argue it demands that the cultural specificities of semiotic, social, epistemological, and rhetorical effects of visual communications must be understood everywhere. Images, they add, are within the realm of the realizations and instantiations of ideology. Their thesis can be used as a tool for critical discourse analysis. For example, publicity as advertisement become a sign maker or producer of text objects within a specific social and cultural context. In 2012, Gunter Kress presents a more specific approach to discourse analysis. 
abbreviated by him as MMDA, and following ideas from Tion Van Dyck, Bruce Woodak, and Michel Foucault, a text linguistic with a multimodal perspective is introduced. After defining text or a multimodal semiotic entity, multimodal discourse analysis, he sustains, elaborates tools that can provide insight into the relation of the meanings of a community and its semiotic manifestations. Here, written or spoken language are just part of the meaning in the text, which, quote, as a whole resides in the meanings made jointly by all the modes in the text, end of the quote. In other words, he continues, MN MNDA describes and analyzes what goes on in a text, including the working of power in social interaction. Tress enumerates cultural modes resources, layout, color, writing, image, and font. He states that writing tells, image shows, color frames and highlights, and layout and layout and font are used for reasons of taste. Are we there? Yes, we're here. Let's consider yes. the let's consider the following questions when observing billboards are similar to the ones he uses in one of his examples. The first one would be, what is the meaning overall in these billboards? How is the meaning constituted? How do these billboards function as messages? Who is being addressed and how? In terms of identity and ideologies, next slide, these editors and I'm referring to Blackwood, Lanza, and Voldemirian, 2016. These editors define identity and its association to linguistic landscapes as culturally and historically situated, negotiated in interaction with other individuals, collectivities, and institutional structures. Also, they continue, it is continuously negotiated in and through linguistic landscapes. According to Blackwood, Lanza, and Voldemirian, how these identities interact or are in conflict brings perspective to the role of language in linguistic landscapes. One of their highlights is that language, culture, and identity are inevitably interwoven in the study of linguistic landscape of a given space. Regarding meaning in the linguistic landscape, this, they sustain that it is constructed with other semiotic means and hence a multimodal approach has proved to be necessary. These researchers conclude that the linguistic landscape provides an excellent arena for investigating multilingualism and identity to address various modalities in the investigation of meaning making and identity constructions in the public space. So my research questions are the following. Next slide. Is the dominant written text on the billboards around Puerto Rico part of a global linguistic identity? What are the characteristics of the visual grammar used on these billboards? From the questions, I have this hypothesis. Number one. The dominant linguistic variety or varieties of, on billboards around Puerto Rico reflect or reflects a global linguistic identity. Number two, the visual grammar in Puerto Rican billboards complements the capitalist discourse of the linguistic landscape. Just as Goldman and Papson 2011 point out, and please take a look at the, uh, all these pictures, but specifically at the last, very last one, point out, present the advertising in Puerto, Rico, in Puerto Rico, I should say, aims to project viewers into a public space by, quote, 
linking dispersed spaces into a community of global space, thus permitting an eclectic mix of globalism and hyper-individualism. Landscapes of capital are a space dominated by the non-place, where placeness is controlled by a few. Having access or appropriating these places transform the space. They describe this as topography where interwoven, interwoven with images of supermodern spaces and technologies, signifiers of place, daily life, family and ethnicity, dot and label the landscapes of non-places. Thank you. Great presentation. Okay, let's, um, we're going to have three presentations before we have questions and comments. Okay, so I'm going to um, get the next presentation up. Uh, the next presentation is also by Gabriel Suarez and it's titled Textos y Contextos en Quinto Place, Drama de Luis Rafael Sanchez. See, I'm going to be kind of bilingual now or something like that. Buenas tardes. Eh, quiero agradecer primero que todo a el Museo de Arte de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, su directora, la doctora Flavia Marichal, quien bajo esa cosa que está ahí, eh, National Endowment for the Humanities, Eh, hizo un proyecto, entonces hubo un proyecto con los carteles basados en la obra de Luis Rafael Sánchez, quien aprovecho para dedicarle esta presentación porque su cumpleaños es el martes. La segunda edición de Quintuples de Luis Rafael Sánchez, 1984, es, según Ramón Luis Acevedo Marrero, experimento teatral exitoso. Preferiría calificarlo teatro experimental muy exitoso. En el estudio preliminar al texto, Acevedo Marrero destaca los temas teatralidad, representación en la obra de Luis Rafael Sánchez. Otro aspecto que apunta es la iluminación en la pieza teatral. Tomando estas observaciones como punto de partida, evidenciaré textos y contextos en quíntuples desde una perspectiva semiótica multimodal. En acuerdo con Acevedo Marrero, al señalar, al señalar la habilidad para manejar especialmente el lenguaje popular utilizado por Sánchez, revisaré el texto dramático, acotaciones y parlamentos unido al texto performativo en los monólogos de esta pieza teatral. Para que el teatro de Luis Rafael Sánchez se oiga y se entienda, requerirá aquello que en el propio dramaturgo proclamó teatro total. En la grabación catalogada bajo su nombre en la Biblioteca de Congreso de los Estados Unidos y anterior a la publicación de Quintuples, el escritor puertorriqueño distingue la vitalidad del idioma de la calle y de la palabra oral. Desde la teoría del lenguaje de Mijael Bakhtin, 1934, y los acercamientos al texto de Mac Halliday y Jonathan Webster, 2014, en adición a la perspectiva multimodal de Gunther Kress y los acercamientos translingüistas, translingüistas de García y Alvis, 2019, releeré, releeré algunos textos verbales e imaginarios producidos por Sánchez en quíntuples. Por último, se comprobará el aspecto translingual presente en el drama y cómo el manejo de la palabra por Sánchez trasvasa los acercamientos tradicionales hacia el lenguaje humano. Me atrevo a validar quíntuples con, conforme a la dirección de Sánchez en la anterior grabación donde exige teatro como una fiesta para los ojos, para los oídos. Si bien la pieza es una gran farsa, vehículo de exploración del arte dramático, es también revolución teatral que incurre a la intervención del público y lector para completar el significado del texto performativo. De inmediato, dialogismo, dialectalismo y dialectismo postulados en la teoría del lenguaje de Bakhtin comprueban innovación lingüística con el lenguaje utilizado en este drama. Los personajes y, su, y, y sus improvisaciones recrean imágenes, fotografías humanas con capacidad del habla en Puerto Rico. 
Esto es Morrison, la improvisadora Daphne, el buscón de Baby, la secreta Bianca, el teatral Mandrak, la subtropical Carlota y el enfermo papá actúan y dialogan con su nuevo colega, el público. Halliday y Webster definen textos como coherent and interconnected pieces of language as distinct from unorganized strings of sentences. Piezas del lenguaje coherente e interconectadas. Mientras que Fernando de Toro, 1995, establece que un texto realiza trabajo desde el lenguaje a la vez que el texto colabora con otros textos porque cada texto es una asimilación y transformación de muchos textos. Esto es, dentro de cada texto, una intertextualidad existe y funciona. Cierro la cita. Para él, el texto performativo es a performance, a stage production in the complete sense, donde el texto como signo es puesto en escena, o sea, text as sign is staged. Concluye que el texto performativo es una theatrical manifestation of the dramatic text, which implies production of meaning of, or semiosis, that is, how the stage is semiotis, semioticized and what mechanisms are valid for this process. En las siguientes páginas hago eco de Tordera Saez para que en el teatro puede ser experimentado como un acto comunicativo con emisores y receptores, incluyendo autores, escenógrafos, actores, directores y hasta sensores. Entonces, de Grasa es asimilar la te teoría del acto de habla donde se unen actor y espectador. A continuación, presento cómo los personajes creados por Sánchez, especial, específicamente Bianca Morrison, exploran contextos por medio de la semiotización del espacio donde lenguaje e imagen producen un mensaje lingüístico. Tordera Saez llama a este proceso la escenografía de las tres realidades. En resumen, aquello visible en el escenario, aquello escrito o dicho o aquello inferido, todas ocurren en quíntuples. También afirma que The semantic dimension from a plate is made out of the infinite signifies within itself. Por tanto, asocia modelos semánticos con tradición y sostiene que a concrete text is totally understood only when it's related to other texts attached to its infinite signifies. El monólogo de teatro quintuples y los diferentes discursos de sus personajes abren otro espacio escénico al público con un personaje homosexual, Bianca Morrison, mujer quíntuple que traviste sus ideales con el vicio de la nicotina. El dramaturgo regidor de escena introduce y dirige a Bianca, su hablar de oración corta, algo tajante. Esta, por su parte, asegura, no exagero, no finjo, no hablo rebuscado, Cabe mencionar que las entradas y salidas de los personajes indican principio y fin de los monólogos, los cuales no son soliloquios. El dialogismo que subyace entre personaje y público está marcado por el lenguaje articulado del primero. Es la oralidad característica del Caribe hispano proyectada en la, con la actuación e historias de los personajes. Otra vez, dialogismo y dialectismo como matrices lingüísticas. Este personaje tiene dos pasiones, poesía y atracción por otra mujer. El dialectismo expuesto en el drama consiste en la inclusión de poesía, teatro y hasta música con español cotidiano. Además, introduce el tema de la homosexualidad por parte de una mujer con ideales independentistas, Bianca Morrison, quien dice, Solo el tiroteo al Congreso norteamericano llevado a cabo por los nacionalistas puertorriqueños el mismo año desplazó el interés de los quíntuples Morrison en la prensa mundial. Más adelante, el dramaturgo afirma de esta que la palabra es su defensa. Bianca duda cuando involuntariamente confiesa, se me han juntado los malos ratos, la violencia de improvisar, el cigarrillo que quiero dejar y no puedo, la rabia de no estar con ella. 
el contexto histórico de Puerto Rico actual parece favore, favorecer la tradición patriarcal, o en palabras similares a Luis Felipe Díaz, 2012, el closet. Bianca es un personaje mariconil o queer, pero en su escena hay más que una mera performancia. Respecto a la vitalidad de este concepto, transcribo el acercamiento de Miriam Meyerhoff, 2006. Para esta investigadora, queer was initially associated with quite radical attempts to destabilize the power of heterosexual norms. Meyerhoff concluded, queer activists and queer theorists have not yet been able successfully to challenge the stability of the dominance of heterosexual norms in all the areas in which they might have hoped. End of the quote. Final de la cita. Al revisar tanto texto dramático como performativo, la carta evidencia una postura determinada ante el poder social que impone una norma discursiva heteronormativa occidental. A tono con esta postura, que en 2019 propone una perspectiva translingual como alternativa a los métodos de adquisición del conocimiento occidental. Así postulan, to make visible what had been previously rendered invisible and to turn intelligible what had remained mute or unheard. Presento el lenguaje utilizado en la obra de Sánchez desde una perspectiva semiótica translingual. Los seis personajes dialogan con el público desde la oralidad distintiva de la población puertorriqueña y cuestionan con humor la vitalidad del teatro como elemento cultural. Entonces, Propongo diálogo entre los textos reproducidos en la puesta de escena de Quintuples y las ideas de Nicolas Paraclas, 2019, quien define el lenguaje como el producto de una matriz interactiva, donde actores heterogéneos y factores reproducen prácticas y patrones del propio lenguaje. Es mi traducción de una conferencia del doctor Paraclas en el 2019 en Bremen. Asociada a esta definición y con la salvedad de experimentar al teatro como acto comunicativo, el lenguaje en quíntuples es múltiple y no binario. El título de la obra y los nombres de los personajes lo evidencian. Desde el lenguaje corporal de Carlota Morrison, la resistencia de Baby Morrison a seguir la norma, el reclamo de un discurso queer de Bianca, la oralidad de Mandrake el mago, la maquinaria lingüística en el vientre de Carlota, hasta el irremediable bolero de Papá Morrison, todos realizan textos y contextos desde la lengua hispana caribeña que reconoce la fiesta oral e imaginaria a la cual se refiere Luis Rafael Sánchez en la grabación de la Biblioteca del Congreso. Por tanto, las acotaciones del dramaturgo matizan la perspectiva teatral que rige al escritor, donde el uso de la hipérbole debe alertar que todo es teatro. Quintuples es una pieza metateatral donde el texto performativo motiva la multiplicación de nuevos textos en la cognición social que representa al público. A su vez, este público promueve la transformación cultural mencionada en García y Alvis. Papá Morrison exclama con tono local, el matrimonio es una institución penitenciaria. En su expresión subyace un cuestionamiento de la familia occidental tradicional y específicamente la caribeña y puertorriqueña. Es todo, gracias. Magistral, excelente. Ok, entonces uh, nos queda una, una presentación más antes de la sesión de, de preguntas. Eh, la próxima presentación eh, es de Sofía Lebron Sepúlveda. Uh, la, el título es Code Switching in Wiki Renuncia, the Facebook Live of Rocío's uh, Resignation Message. Uh, so our, our next presenter will be uh, Sofía Lebron. Um, Sofía, I'll just get your presentation up on the, on the screen. Buenas tardes. ¿Se escucha? Sí. Ok. Pero un poco más fuerte, si se puede. ¿Se escucha ahora? Sí. Un poquito más. Ok. Perfecto. Bueno, pues, muy buenas tardes. Eh, mi presentación, como ven, es sobre el code switching de Ricky Renuncia, de Facebook Live of Rosellos Resignation Message. Voy a hacer unos disclaimers al principio, ya que la presentación la voy a hacer en Spanglish. 
eh, a pesar de que la presentación está escrita en, en inglés, con toda la intención voy a hacer el code switching a, a través de toda la, la presentación. Eh, aparte de eso, esta eh, investigación es bastante superficial. Es una presentación, que, una investigación que responde a una, a una clase de bilingüismo, la última clase que dio la profesora Posada antes de retirarse. Y precisamente el code switching no es mi tema, ¿verdad? No es mi, mi, mi área de expertise, pero este, mis trabajos, casi siempre todos, tienen una misma línea y es esta advocacy que estoy teniendo siempre de que se deben hacer estudios eh, o, o, o hacer estos estudios tradicionales sobre lingüística utilizando la tecnología y eso es básicamente lo que siempre he estado tratando de hacer a lo largo de toda mi carrera. Esto, ahora mismo estoy en el departamento de inglés en el programa doctoral. Next slide. Después de toda esa introducción, este... Pues asimismo me, me, me llama mucho la atención la utilización de, de el, el, el social media, de todos los datos que hay en, en, en el internet, el big data, ¿verdad? que muchas personas hablan sobre eso, pero muy pocos se tiran la misión, como dirían, este, de realmente estudiarlo, porque ve, es un tema sumamente complejo y hay que tener unos conocimientos técnicos de computadora, a veces sí, a veces no, pero de que con tantos datos que existen, es un terreno sumamente fértil. En específico, eh, siempre me ha gustado trabajar con la plataforma de Facebook, ya que varios estudios han establecido que es una de las plataformas más populares en Puerto Rico, una de las más utilizadas. Y específicamente, el Social Live Streaming Services, que es esta plataforma sincrónica del de social media, ¿verdad? de las redes sociales, que combina lo que es el, el live streaming o lo, lo que sería como una transmisión televisiva y el back channel que sería un chat. En el próximo slide eh, tienen la, la foto exacta de, yo creo que muchas personas tenemos esta imagen grabada por el resto de la vida y además de, de, de utilizar este... Este tipo de, de, de datos a mí me parece sumamente justificable este tipo de estudios ya que el gobierno, ¿verdad? El gobierno de Puerto Rico decidió en ese momento utilizar una plataforma social en vez de utilizar los medios de comunicación para llevar un mensaje sumamente importante, uno de los mensajes más importantes que se ha llevado al, al público, que es la renuncia de, de un gobernador y se hizo a través de este tipo de de plataforma. Next slide. Eh, como les dije, esta presentación es bastante eh, superficial porque el, el énfasis está en esa metodología, en, en, en esa escrudiñar, ¿no? En lo que es lo, lo, la, los grandes datos que se dan en, en, en el internet y en las redes sociales. Este, está, ¿verdad? El, el caso del, del bilingüismo en Puerto Rico que ya se ha hablado en, en las presentaciones pasadas, pero pues esa relación colonial que tenemos con Estados Unidos, la larga historia de las lenguas en contacto del inglés y el español, por dicha eh, ¿verdad? Esto, situación territorial, el, la complejidad ¿no? de, del término de bilingüismo, que todavía puede ser un, es un, un tema debatible, la influencia, gracias a esa historia de, de esas lenguas en contacto del inglés y el español, y la influencia del inglés en estas eh, palabras eh, préstamos que, que nosotros hemos incorporado, incorporado al, al, al español de Puerto Rico, y de que la mayoría de los estudios que se hacen sobre el bilingüismo en Puerto Rico están asociadas al, al nivel de bilingüismo que tienen este, los ciudadanos, ¿verdad? Los, los puertorriqueños. Next. Code switching. Code switching es eh, esa alternancia de códigos ¿verdad? entre una lengua y otra, como bien dijo y compartió Mildred en su presentación, que se pueda dar a un nivel de frase, a un nivel de palabra, a un nivel de, de oración y va back and forward, ¿verdad? Con, así mismo como estoy haciendo sobre un, un, una lengua y otra. Y dependiendo de cómo se haga esa, 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 esa alternancia, 
pues se, llevan a, se llegan a unas conclusiones del nivel de bilingüismo que tenga la persona. Uno de los, los ejemplos que ven este, ahí en, la, en, en pantalla es uno que dice Book report that no one cares about ve al grano. Es uno de los comentarios que hacen las personas viendo el, el mensaje de, del, del ex gobernador. Otro de los ejemplos es wrap it up, tírate los lesson learns y acaba el meeting. Y otra cosa que quería enfatizar también que la percepción que hay sobre el Spanglish, esto es algo bien estigmatizado y es negativo. Una persona que hace mucho code switching o Spanglish siempre es, es asumido como una persona que no domina ninguno de los dos idiomas. Y, y ¿verdad? se hacen unas assumptions, unas suposiciones sobre sobre el grado de bilingüismo que tiene la persona, que precisamente de eso es que se basan los estudios. Next slide. Una de las eh, teorías, de los teóricos que utilicé para el trabajo, que era lo que estábamos haciendo en, en la clase, que es de Grosan, el francés, este, es de que ciertas nociones o conceptos, ¿verdad? Porque nosotros hacemos el code switching, son simplemente mejor expresadas en otro lenguaje. Hay veces que nosotros tenemos palabras que nos sentimos más cómodos, quizás, ¿verdad? Si, si dominamos uh, alguna otra lengua, nos sentimos más cómodos o, o pensamos que, que, que hay otras palabras que, mira, llena más o, o tiene, comprende más lo que yo quiero decir en ese, en esa otra, en ese otro lenguaje. Eh, to feel a linguistic need for a word expression. Esto utilizado como un acto comunicativo de una estrategia social de cuán distante o cercano queremos a, a una persona. Esto queremos marcar una identidad. Por ejemplo, yo, si yo quiero marcar eh, alguna identidad específica, no, yo soy New Yorker, pero voy a hacer el, el Spanglish. O si quiero excluir a una persona, pues mira, voy a hacer este code switching. Porque no quiero que entienda esto esta persona que es monolingüe, pero este, esta otra cosa sí lo voy a decir. Y es ese back and forward de, de lenguaje en unos contextos sociales que se pueden hacer muchísimas, muchísimas especulaciones de la misma manera que, que lo hace Grosan, esto, Grosjean en su, en su teoría. Next. La pregunta de investigación para este trabajo precisamente es buscar esa manifestación completamente espontánea que se da en el internet, que se da en, la, en las redes sociales de eh, la comunidad puertorriqueña. En este caso podría no suscribirse única y exclusivamente a la comunidad puertorriqueña porque pues, se necesitan otros elementos y otras eh, componentes de la lingüística como computacional para tú identificar exactamente de dónde están comentando las personas y se asume pues que son puertorriqueños o puertorriqueños en la, en la diáspora. Y eso es algo que con un expertise mucho más grande sobre la lingüística computacional haciendo este tipo de trabajo, se puede llegar a a tener ese tipo de datos y tener unas investigaciones con unos datos demográficos bastante esto, fiables, ¿no? Y la resignación, además, como había dicho al, al principio, pues esa, ese cambio de comunicativo que hay entre un gobierno y la ciudadanía de cambiar métodos tradicionales para hacer la, la comunicación a través de, de las redes sociales. ¿Qué recogí en toda esta travesía de, de esta aventura, de esta investigación? Fueron alrededor de 47 mil comentarios que hicieron en un periodo de 13 minutos con 53 segundos. El mensaje se dio el ju julio 24 de 2019 a las 11 y 41 de la noche a las expectativas de todo el mundo todo el mundo estaba esperando y con ansias y se nota en, en los comentarios el ansia y la desesperación que tenían las personas de saber cuál era la decisión o cuál era el mensaje que iba a darle el, el gobernador aquí tenemos una nube de palabras que recoge todos los 47 mil comentarios y obviamente están las la frecuencia de palabras, de las más que, que se repetía, pues era renuncia, 
bla, 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 Puerto Rico, vete. Ahora, me parece súper curioso tener también en una de las de, eh, de palabras con más frecuencia el artículo the de, del inglés. Me, parece, me pareció muy interesante el, tenerlo en los datos. También, si notan en la nube, aparece en una que otro apellido, porque usualmente es bien común que en este tipo de, de plataformas las personas taguean a amistades o familiares para que les salga una notificación para que todo el mundo vea, ¿verdad? Y más personas, o, o, o mira, yo quiero que tú veas esto, pues en los mismos comentarios taguean a la persona para que le salga la notificación y así pues incluir y que todo el mundo esté juntos viendo este tipo de, de mensaje a través de las redes sociales. Excelente. El próximo slide, aquí yo hice entonces una separación con unos instrumentos de, de, de herramientas ¿no? de, de lingüística computacional de que se extrae toda la información y pude hacer una división entre todos los comentarios que eran completamente en español y todos los comentarios que tenían al menos alguna palabra en inglés. So que de los 47 mil comentarios que traje de, de esa investigación, de ese de estos Facebook Live, 1514 comentarios. Cabe mencionar que estos, estos números son bastante preliminares. Podrían cambiar, no son necesariamente exactos, pero son los más precisos eh, posibles al nivel de la que, que tengo, ¿verdad? De, de la investigación, porque es una investigación en, en, en proceso. Y de esos 1514 comentarios que al menos tuvieron una palabra en inglés, o eran completamente en inglés, o tuvieron una palabra, eh, la palabra que más frecuente ¿verdad? aparece es la de lies y bye. ¿verdad? Muy bastante, bastante de, de esperarse, ¿verdad? Que bye. Ah, quiero mencionar también que una de las más, eh, de las más frecuentes, que no sé si la pueden observar, es fast. Fast. Quiero que se recuerden de, de esa, esa palabra, es una de las más que se repite en, ese, in, eh, en esa alternancia, ya que la, las ansias ¿verdad? del público se puede decir que influyó en, en, en la utilización súper frecuente de las personas decir, denle fast forward. Las personas lo único que querían escuchar es, ¿vas a renunciar o no? El mensaje duró casi 15 minutos, 13 minutos, y la mayoría de, lo, de los comentarios de las personas era fast forward. Y entonces no hay, eh, no hay, no hay una, una versión en español de ¿verdad? los puertorriqueños decir como que dale para adelante. O sea, eso no se ve en los comentarios. Todo es fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Y me parece súper interesante que recurramos a esa palabra en inglés para, para ¿verdad? Este, demandar o expresarle el, 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 lo que se quiere decir en, en, ese, en ese momento. Next, next slide. Algunos de los, de los ejemplos de las manifestaciones de code switching, aquí puse esto, algunas que están mezcladas, pero quiero hacerle una una mención de que las distinciones más reconocidas sobre el, el code switching está la alternancia al, a los límites de la oración, que esa es la que está al, abajo, que, en la, que los ejemplos son nobody cares, dinos si renuncia o no. También quería, a ver, quería hacer la salvedad de que hay muchas palabras soeces en, este, en estos datos, así que me, me disculpa. El la segundo ejemplo de, de una alternancia en los límites de la oración sería shut up, no one cares, Ricky renuncia, y la palabra. Eh, Puerto Rico showing the world how to get rid of a corrupt government, una oración completa, termina y empieza la otra, yo soy boricua para que tú lo sepas, y está ¿verdad? esa alternancia. Otro tipo de, de distinción de alternancia que está dentro de una misma oración, que sería y el take out, el y el take home message es la renuncia. Brinca todo ese bla, bla, bla. Y la última, ¿verdad? Que quería hacer la, la distinción es la alternancia léxica, ¿verdad? Cuando es una oración sola, el crecimiento económico, ¿really? Será para tus panas. Este, 
me parece que la más, esto, aunque no tengo los datos completamente filtrados ¿verdad? Y, y, y totalmente analizados, pero como había mencionado, esa parte o esa palabra de fast forward o fats of forward, de, indiscutiblemente fue la más repetida dentro de esos 47 mil mensajes que escribieron eh, eh, las personas. En conclusión, este, ¿verdad? para unos futuros estudios, esto, todos estos datos pueden ser analizados a profundidad. Hay mucha, mucha tela para cortar en, en, en estos datos y dependiendo de cómo uno, uno los organice y cómo uno, uno los procese, esto, se pueden encontrar este, estructuras sintácticas, sujeto predicado, main subordinate clause, determinante, mucho, mucha, mucha información para para estudiar ver esto y ver a profundidad cómo se manifiesta el, 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 el code switching en, en las redes sociales. También siempre me gusta enfatizar de, de tratar de coger esos, esos estudios tradicionales y como que actualizarlos y pasarlos a, a, a las redes y al internet. Y ya que hay tanto estudio tradicional, pues mira, vamos a hacer el, eh, comparaciones en si esas manifestaciones que se dan en estos estudios tradicionales, con la, cuando se licita a las personas para que hagan narraciones o tirillas, si son los mismos resultados que se encuentran en, la, en las redes sociales, ¿no? en, en toda esta grandísima eh, océano de información que sería el Big Data. Y otra cosa también que se puede analizar que también lo, lo hice en mi trabajo pasado y en otros trabajos que he hecho sobre Facebook es esto, la diáspora. Eh, es bien, bien interesante la, 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 cómo la diáspora se manifiesta en el social media. Y por lo menos hasta aquí, esa era mi presentación, preguntas. Eh, ok, gracias, excelente. Eh, bueno, yo eh, ahora es el momento para hacer preguntas y también comentarios. Now it's time for comments and uh, questions on the three presentations. The first one was by Gabriel, uh, examining Puerto Rican linguistic identities to English use on billboards. The second one was by Gabriel also, textos y contextos en quinto place. Y then the last one was on code switching in Enrique Renuncia by Sofia. Questions, comments? Okay, um, Gabriel, uh, I have one uh, about um, the billboards. Uh, you said that um, <laughs> when, the, when the person is looking up, they're offering something. When they're looking down, they're imposing something. Uh, and that's, I think, very, um, very good. But the thing that they're imposing, um, and I think this gets us back to the contrast you're making between Uh, what Mies is saying and what's being offered on those billboards. So in other words, Mies has a particular definition of how human beings gain fulfillment and satisfaction in life. And then the billboards, in most cases, are promising us some form of satisfaction and fulfillment. But then um, how, do those, how do those two economies, how do those two uh, E economies of satisfaction, economies of fulfillment, or economies of uh, of of, uh, of communication happen, and and uh, how do they contrast with each other? Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? Wow, uh, es una pregunta bastante general y específica a la vez y, y challenging, pero. Hablando de mí y la perspectiva de subsistence perspective, ¿verdad? Eh, es, es el tipo de mensaje que trata de, en mi perspectiva, de redescubrir eh, la, la humanidad y su esencia, ¿verdad? Y en vez de verlo todo como un intercambio que tiene valor de dinero, en nuestro caso de dólares, ¿Cómo podríamos cambiar eso a nivel de, de, en términos de comunidad, a nivel más humano? Tú me das esto, yo te doy esto. 
Pero en los billboards no está así. Los billboards es, primero que todo, es, es, es la imposición de quienes han creado ese billboard. Quienes tienen acceso a esos billboards, porque estamos hablando de billboards electrónicos, que yo no he investigado cuánto están pagando cada persona que hace esa, ese anuncio, pero asumo que es bastantes dólares que hay ahí, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, pues todo tiene un valor, ¿verdad? Todo me gusta mucho, o no sé si me gusta o me, o me disgusta la última imagen de la compañía de, de teléfono, ¿verdad? Que es la reafirmación en mi perspectiva del patriarcado. En el libro que mencioné de usted y con Ben Hall, etc., pues se habla de el patriarcado being the last stage of capitalism. Eh, or, is, or is it the other way around? The capitalism being the last stage of patriarchy. Actually, eh, two stages of the same thing. Sí, entonces tenemos ahí la rogativa, ¿verdad? ¿A qué le estamos rogando? A Don Dinero, ¿verdad? Bienvenido Don Dinero, que es nuestro salvador. Eh, y así lo vemos en diferentes billboards. Si contextualizamos estos billboards, ¿verdad? Porque no queremos hablar de lenguajes muertos que están allí y los vemos dentro de las comunidades donde se encuentran. Muchos de estos billboards yo los tomé por áreas donde están rodeados, hay un residencial público o están eh, en, un, en, un, en un building específico. Habría que ver eh, a qué categoría social, si eso existe, pertenecen los miembros de la comunidad que están ahí, qué lenguaje es el que se habla, eh, eh, utilizan todos ellos esa compañía de teléfono. Esa particularmente está en, en la Ashford, en condado, que se distingue por ser una comunidad con unos eh, salarios más altos, ¿verdad? Así es que, no sé si estoy contestando la pregunta. Sí, sí, sí. Excelente. Sí. Excelente. Sí. Ok. Uh, so, uh, any comments, questions? Or else I'll just go ahead with mine. Yes? Eh, profesor, hay una pregunta en el chat. Eh, ok, sí. Contesto. Eh, voy a contestar a eh, Iván Sotomayor. Tengo una pregunta abierta para la presentación de Sofía. Una de las palabras relativamente grandes en la primera gráfica era familia. ¿Tendrá alguna idea del contexto en el cual se usó tanto esa palabra? Sí, sí tengo el contexto. De hecho, a mí me pareció interesante también, obviamente no la puse en este trabajo porque pues está, es, es, es una palabra que estaba en los comentarios que eran solamente en español. Fue muy, creo que no, no salió o si sí salió fue mínima en, en los comentarios que, fueran, que eran en inglés, que fueron pues la, la división que hice para, para depurar lo, los datos. Pero la, la palabra familia en los comentarios en español se utilizó muchísimo, muchísimo y en casi todos los contextos para decirle al gobernador, Dios lo bendiga a usted y a su familia. Esa fue la... la gobernador. Es gobernador. gobernador. Pero todas, todas, mis respetos, señor gobernador, que Dios lo bendiga a usted y toda su familia. Y lo estoy leyendo exactamente de los datos. Muchas veces, en muchas ocasiones, muchas convenciones, las personas eran, mis respetos, señor gobernador. Eh, o, y eran eh, personas, en, obviamente, en, en, en muestras de apoyo y incluían a usted y a su familia, a usted, a su familia, a usted y su familia. Y ese fue el, el contexto. Ok, pero relacionado con eso y relacionado con la presentación de uh, Gabriel sobre quíntuples. En quíntuples él habla de una um, eh, infinidad de, eh, de intertextualidades, un sinnúmero de intertextualidades dentro de uh, las obras uh, de uh, Luis Rafael Sánchez. Y entonces... Eh, bueno, en el caso de eh, este, este, esta modalidad que estudiaste, entonces, eh, el diálogo, el, la, la intertextualidad eh, se ubica no 
tanto entre el, me parece, el, 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 lo que se emite de las fuentes oficiales y la contestación de los demás. Pero entre las contestaciones, porque bueno, me parece que yo, yo, yo bueno, una de mis hipótesis que surge de tu, de tu estudio hubiera sido que, bueno, hay, hay como uh, palabras que se, se uh, propagan como de manera viral. Por forward, for, por ejemplo, quizás alguien dijo fast forward y después había un sinnúmero de gente que dijo que sí, 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 eso es lo que tenemos que hacer. Entonces, y así forward se, se convirtió en uno de la, de una de las palabras más importantes. ¿Qué opinas sobre eso? Y a mí me, me, a me parece, me parece súper interesante y, y, y sí, y creo que no lo... No lo pensé en un principio, esa influencia que puede ser hasta un priming, ¿verdad? De, de, de que una persona ve esta palabra y es como que mira, sí. Y o, otra cosa que, que vale la pena mencionar es que a pesar de que era en vivo y que eso era supuestamente un mensaje en vivo, realmente era un mensaje pregrabado y las personas se dieron cuenta a través, mientras estaban viendo el video, que era un mensaje pregrabado y aún así hacen ese reconocimiento en los mismos comentarios pero siguen hablando y si no es que hablan directamente hacia el gobernador, hablan entre ellos, ¿verdad? Que eso también sería como que un análisis de la conversación dentro de un mismo live o hasta que, que también se ha hecho, entiendo que otras personas lo han hecho en, en los foros y, y en los comentarios per se que son un poco más eh, estáticos y son asincrónicos a diferencia a esta a este tipo de, o a esta plataforma que es completamente eh, sincrónica, ¿no? Que la inmediatez es, es otro, otra variante de, de, de los resultados, ¿verdad? Y, y, pero sí, sí, me parece súper interesante estudiar, eh, ver esa posibilidad de, de un tipo de priming en, en las palabras y, y, y sí, sí, hay, hay muchísima tela, muchísima tela. Y como dije, esto es una eh, investigación sumamente superficial, pero que, que, porque yo estoy tratando de pulir esa metodología y estas herramientas computacionales para cuando realmente quiera hacer un estudio, no importa el tema, si es code switching, si es este, cualquier otro aspecto ¿no? de la lingüística, se pueda hacer a través de, de, de estas herramientas y se pueda hacer de una manera inmediata, porque es verdad, y, y mucho más fácil estos datos mitad se hacen computacional y mitad se hacen manual y, y lo ideal, ¿verdad? La meta que se quiere es que todo se haga a un nivel esto, computacional y, y, y que pues tengamos las herramientas y, cualquier, y que sea accesible para todos los lingüistas, ¿no? Y, y, y sí, sí. Ok, Gabriel, ¿y vas a decir algo? Sí. sí, sí, es que pienso también en, en, lo, en el poquito que estamos viendo en la automatización de los seres humanos que se refieren en, con la sub, a perspectiva de la subsistencia, eh, como tal vez no es precisamente inglés lo que se está expresando ahí, sino que es automático, es como tú has dicho, Sofía, es un código, no precisamente en inglés o en español, es simplemente como estamos hablando, es un nuevo código out there que está ya sea en la computadora, en Facebook, o en, o en pantallas gigantes en mis billboards. No estamos hablando precisamente de español, inglés o francés, sino de ese nuevo código, no sé. Sí, okay. me parece no. muy interesante ese punto de vista. Excelente. And, and that goes back to what, you were, uh, what we were talking about this morning about translanguaging. And then in the particular context of uh, Luis Rafael uh, Sánchez's work. Um, but translanguaging, okay, so if we're not going to talk about particular languages anymore, okay, so, so basically um, I have been convinced by the people who do post-colonial linguistics that we should no longer talk about the English language or the Spanish language or any language as an individual language, that we have to start talking about repertoires, repertoires, and this I think is what Gabriel was talking about, we're talking about repertoires, there's this new a set of varieties and codes and, 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 and uh, possibilities for expression that people have. And I think that that's a real Caribbean way of looking at language. So as Caribbean linguists, I think that that's a, something important that you can bring 
uh, to the discussion. Uh, the discussion that's talking about decolonializing the way we look at language, but also um, reminding us that for probably most of human history, people didn't think of languages as languages. They were just part of repertoires that people had uh, that blended into each other and were in constant flux and constantly alive. It was living language rather than dead language, which is the, the problem that, um, uh, of course, modern linguistics, uh, one of the things that it's best at doing is killing language <laughs> and uh, something that's alive or turning it into something that you can kill, package, sell, or put in a museum or do something like that. Okay, uh, that's all the time we have for our discussion and questions for this session. Uh, thank you to the presenters, it was great. Uh, now we're going to move on to our last session. Uh, and our first presentation in the final session is by Keishla Gonzalez Garcia, and she's going to be talking about sign language in the Caribbean. A look at Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, so I'm going to get your presentation up on the screen, Keishla. Uh, and then once it's up there, we can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, Keshla. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Keshla Gonzalez Garcia. My topic is sign language in the Caribbean. I look at Tobago and Trinidad. And this is a work in process. This is actually my monographia for my master's degree, and I'm slowly working towards it. So the beginning of uh, next slide, please. So the beginning of uh, Keshla, Keshla, sorry, yes. the volume is going up and down. Um, Maybe if you speak a little bit louder, sorry. Okay. My signal is also not so good. So it's one of the guys okay. know. Okay. okay. So um, the beginning of sign language in Western society started in the 17th century as a visual language. In the Caribbean, there are said to be about four sign languages that were introduced to local populations by educators and missionaries. Mm -hmm. These had to do with the colonial relationships with European countries that were present in the region at the time. And these influences can be seen in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica with British Sign Language. And the question remains as if there's any possibility of this leading to language endangerment in Trinidad and Tobago Sign Language. Evidence has been presented regarding the presence of sign language in Trinidad and Tobago at the beginning of the 1900s. And Ben Brathway states that the emergence of a national sign language in Trinidad and Tobago can be traced back to the first deaf school, which was opened in 1940. And these communities are a small part of the other language communities that are present in these countries. Trinidad English Creole is spoken as a first language by many people, and the English lexifier is the base for the languages as it has been influenced from the period of colonization by British. As mentioned above, the influence of British Sign Language has played a role in the formation of Trinidad and Tobago Sign Language. So sign language is a combination of gestures, finger spelling, and hand signs instead of spoken words. And the signs that are used can represent a word or even an entire phrase. And there are a lot of misconceptions regarding sign language. So one of this is the idea that sign language is a universal language, and there are many countries that have their own sign language. So a sign can mean bread in one language, but it could mean fan in another. So another misconception with this is the idea that sign languages mirror the respective spoken language completely of the country. And sign language has its own grammatical structures, expressions, regional accents, and dialogues, just like any spoken language. There are many origin stories of sign languages and Native Americans use simple hand signs to communicate with other tribes as well with the Europeans. And these were signs and gestures that could help in the process of training rather than languages that met the needs of the deaf community. And an island of the coast of Massachusetts named Martha's Vineyard had a large deaf population and a regional sign language was developed so the deaf could communicate with one another and the hearing residents. In the early 1500s, a Spanish monk named Pedro Ponce de Leon adapted the gestures using a vow of silence into signs to help him educate deaf students. He's the first recognized teacher to the deaf. Through his work, um, the way was paved for the creation and instruction of a more formal sign language. And it wasn't until 1620 that a Spanish priest and linguist named Juan Pablo de Bonet published the first book on teaching sign language to deaf people with a manual alphabet. The book, which is titled Reduction of the Letters of the Alphabet and Method of Teaching Deaf Mutes to Speak, was created with the intention to teach speech to the deaf. 
and in the 16th century, an Italian named Girolamo Cardano was next to contribute to the education of the deaf community. And Cardano was a physician who claimed that deaf people could be taught to understand written combinations of symbol if they are associated to the thing they are representing. So he states that hearing words were not necessary for understanding ideas. Cardano presents the idea of a symbol to create a connection between the object and the meaning of the object. In 1775, the first deaf school was founded in Paris, France by a man named Ave Charles Michael Lepe. He felt that deaf people could develop communication with themselves in the hearing world through a system of hand signs, finger spelling, and conventional gestures. Lepe started out this idea by first observing a group of deaf people in Paris who were using certain signs. And after he recognized these signs and learned them, he began to develop his own sign language. And this process brought on what he considers to be at the time a sign version of spoken French. In, 19, in 1778, there was another deaf educator paving the way for the deaf community named Samuel Heinicke of Leipzig, Germany. And in the case of Heinicke, he did not use the manual method of communication. Instead, he taught speech and speech reading to the deaf. So these were somehow common for many deaf schools in the beginning, as shown also in the Caribbean. And the first public school for deaf people was established by Heineke. And moreover, the school was recognized by the government, which was a huge step in the education of the deaf community. In 1817, a man named Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, a minister founded the nation's first school for deaf people in Hartford, Connecticut. Gallaudet had been interested in helping his neighbor's deaf daughter, and in 1815, he traveled all the way to Europe to study various methods of communicating with deaf people, and during his stay in England, he met a man named Aver Roche Ambrose Sicar, and this man worked in a school for the deaf and actually invited Gallaudet to study with him. And after his studies at the school, Gallaudet returned to the United States with a deaf instructor named Laurent Clark and they opened the school together with Clark, becoming the United States' first deaf sign teacher. This created a chain of reactions as soon as other deaf schools began to pop up in several states. And by 1863, a total of 27 schools had been established throughout the United States. And this led to the opening, opening of Gallaudet College in Washington, D.C. in 1864, which is also known as Gallaudet University now. So in the Caribbean, is very diverse, whether it's historically or linguistically. And there are many influences that are present in the Caribbean from the English, the French, the Spanish, the Danish, the Dutch, the Africans, and the indigenous people. And the, reg the region's islands were at some point, if still not, colonized by other countries that brought their language along, including the sign languages. And there are some sign languages that have been imported from other countries that are used in the Caribbean until this day. There are also indigenous languages that have been happening in isolated areas, as well as the establishment of various deaf schools that were currently happening. And during the 20th century, the scholar Ben Rathway mentions that there were at least four sign languages brought over by missionaries and educators. And out of the four, three have shown some sort of colonial relationship with European countries. And these are French sign language using the Martinique, Guadeloupe, and French Guiana. The second is sign language of the Netherlands in Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, and even Suriname, which gained independence in 1975. And the third important language is British Sign Language, also known as BSL. And though it was used briefly during the establishment of the first deaf school in Trinidad and Jamaica, um, the British Sign Language can be seen in some older signers in both countries throughout the language varieties. And in that slide, you can see a picture of the school. So American Sign Language is also considered the most important language, important language of all. So this language brought, was brought over through the course of the 20th century by missionaries and educators from the United States. And varieties of American Sign Language can be found in Puerto Rico, Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. So in a way, this process is such as how spoken English was brought over to the Caribbean. And through these important sign languages, language contact between them has occurred. So this is not considered the case for some places like Nicaragua, but other settings such as Puerto Rico are highly influenced by ASL. And then this brings it back to the point that these countries were or are colonies from these places. So sign language in the Caribbean has been influenced by a lot of manually coded spoken languages that were presented. And as mentioned before, many of the teachings that had become for deaf people was teaching them how to speak or some form of finger spelling related to the spoken language. 
So the Caribbean was not an acceptance, exception to this norm of oralist teaching methods in deaf schools. These coded spoken languages can vary across the places and languages are spoken there. So in Puerto Rico, we have a Spanish influence ASL, while in Trinidad and Tobago, we see an English ASL influence. Sign language in Trinidad and Tobago, which is also known as TTSL, and you'll hear me say it a lot, <laughs> is one of the youngest languages in the world. And the sign languages can be traced back to the 1940s, like I mentioned, when the first deaf school emerged. And the Cascade School for the Deaf wanted to teach, like Nicaragua, lip reading skills and speech, and there was no signing allowed in the classrooms. So the teachers were not prepared whatsoever as they did not know any signing at all. So what they did now recently in a dictionary project they presented with the intention of describing and educating people on sign language. And so they have a brief introduction about the history of the language can be found. Although it is considered a bit controversial, the book mentions that the language spread across the country through the Cascade School for the Deaf in 1976, mentions ASL as the language that was introduced. And it also mentions that the deaf community uses a combination of ASL and TTSL in the country. However, older members of the Trinbagonian deaf community disagree with these statements. They state that they already have their own language developed in the school and have passed through generations. And many older members of the deaf community consider TTSL and ASL to be very different from one another. Ben Brathway mentions in his article, Language Contact in the History of Sign Language in Trinidad and Tobago, that some younger signers see TTSL as a mixed language, combining indigenous forms with influence from ASL, and some usually hearing people see TTSL as a variety of ASL rather than a distinct language. So this discussion is not new in the deaf community regarding our sign language. ASL plays a type of role in the structure of TTSL, and the same can be said regarding British Sign Language, which was also introduced to the deaf community briefly in Trinidad and Tobago, as there are still traces of BSL still found in TTSL to this day. Brathway presents data collected through a large corpus of video recordings collected over 2008 and 2017, and the data consists of video recordings of deaf of all signers of different ages with various educational backgrounds, and the data contains interviews on topics like the history of sign language, unstructured conversation, and control elicitation tasks. And during the data collection, Brathway presents how TTSL has had contact with spoken languages. One aspect is the mouthing, which has been derived from spoken language. And there are also mouth gestures created from ASL, not spoken language. So an example is the mouth gesture for the word bow. This gesture has an ASL origin, but the meaning does not seem to be borrowing from ASL. So it may have come from the existence of a manual sign that functions as a degree adverb, meaning very, and is accompanied by the pow mouth gesture. So there is the word vex also in Trinidadian English Creole that does a similar gesture. So though the origin may be found in spoken language, the data has not accurately said which language. So as TTSL borrowing has borrowing from the spoken languages, an example that also marks clear is the influence from the English Trinidadian Creole and the lexified finger spelling, which is a picture that I have in the PowerPoint. The data provided by Brathway in his article, The Language Contact and History of Sign Language in Trinidad and Tobago, presents those two different forms in TTSL that correspond closely to the sense of, sense of the word vex. So these meanings have both been derived via lexicalized finger, lexicalized finger spelling. And these forms can both perform as a one place predicate in TTSL, like the English Creole. And the finger spelling in this case uses the two variants of X that is used in Trinidad and Tobago. So American Sign Language has been present in Trinidad and Tobago since the 1970s. Its effect on the language has been present since the adoption of ASL and SEEII in deaf schools. And these schools were the primary location for language transmission in which the teachers have brought along these languages. Brathway points out that there's a marked difference between the list with the behaviors of older and younger signers. And this has been marked by certain changes found in TTSL signs specifically. He mentions some TTSL signs have assimilated certain phonological parameters of synonymous ASL signs. An example is a boy sign in TTSL sign at the forehead instead of a neutral place, simulating as is the location of the equivalent of ASL sign. Brathway also brings up the examples of grandmother and grandfather, and both signs originally articulated in a neutral space, but are sometimes articulated at the shin and forehead, respectively, with movements corresponding to the ASL signs. 
So Brathwaite's analysis of the data have brought forward three relatively distinct varieties of signing in Dumilantologo based on different age groups. And the example of the sign three is brought up. So in the article, it is mentioned that signers over 60 tend to sign three fingers, palm forward to the side of the face, holding the index, middle, and ring finger up. And those who went to school after the arrival of ASL signed three with their thumb, index finger, and middle finger palm facing upwards, which is identical to the sign in ASL. Those who are under 60 but went to the school before the introduction of ASL tend to sign um, the sign three with the thumb, index, and middle finger up, palm facing inwards. So this example brings up the mixed form shares by combining combining aspects of the phonological forms of the signs used by the older and younger signers. So the sign is made up by the hand shape with the ESL sign, ESL sign, and the palm orientation is of the older TTSL sign. So in the questions, you can go to the question. <laughs> is there an indication that it's going to lead to language endangerment in the case of TTSL? And I can't predict the future. This is just a thought that TTSL is its own language that has gone diff through different changes through generations, like every language. And the outcome of the language contact has led to fears of endangerment as a generational problem rises. The contact presented between TTSL and ASL has brought on different forms of combined aspects of science, like I mentioned. Thus, it's also brought up different concerns of the language being completely lost. So the work to preserve the language is underway through various projects in hope of maintaining TTSL as it is. So they have the Dictionary Project, which was a collaboration between the deaf community and the hearing interpreters, teachers, and government ministers. And the Dictionary provides CTSL, CTSL signs for around 500 English words. So through several projects like this, the preservation of the history and language is underway. Although, um, like my quote says, at the end, the future of sign language in the Caribbean, many of the indigenous sign language of the Caribbean at the moment face an uncertain future and the continued spread and the relative prestige of ASL, just like spoken English in particular, poses a threat to local languages with the smaller rural sign languages, especially at risk. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we're going to have time for questions after the next two presentations. We do them in blocks of three. So uh, save your questions. Uh, the next presentation uh, will be by Keshla, but joined by um, Paloma Martinez Estrada and Ana Vasquez Barreto. And they're going to be presenting on uh, comparing methods of healing trauma after hurricane disasters in Puerto Rico. Okay, so I'll just get your, your presentation up and then uh, you can get started. Okay. Well, good afternoon again. My name is Keisla <laughs> Gonzalez Garcia, and these are my colleagues, Paloma Martinez and Ana Vasquez. And our presentation is titled Comparing Methods of Healing Trauma After Hurricane Disasters in Puerto Rico. So, according to the article, Natural Disaster by Hannah Ritchie and Max Rosser. Natural disasters are responsible for the death of around 60,000 people per year in the last decade, and traumas caused by atmospheric catastrophes resulted in the production of various creative projects such as poems, essays, journal entries, and photographs. Puerto Ricans' outlook on the process of healing in the aftermath of different hurricanes that have impacted the island have been exhibited in various artistic works. WAPA Radio and the Centro de Periodismo Investigativo have contributed to informing the public on the true damage this disaster has left on the island. Puerto Rico has often been presented as La Isla del Encanto, a place where tourists can come to relax and escape reality. And as mentioned by Risa Palm and Michael E. Hudson in their article, Natural Hazards in Puerto Rico, the island is presented as an American paradise. However, reality is different for the locals as there is an extensive history of natural disasters in Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans have endured hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, flooding, and other natural disasters and the island's location makes it more susceptible to the occurrence of hurricanes. So according to Rachel O'Black, in an article, where does the word hurricane come from? She says that this comes from the Taino word Urika, who was considered the Carib Indian god of evil. And O'Black mentions that the word was derived from the Mayan god of wind, storm, and fire named Uraka. 
in Puerto Rico, it is said the word derives from the dandy named Huracan, who lives in Ajunque. The history of hurricanes in Puerto Rico can be traced back to the 1400s, and Dr. Luis A. Salivia helped to provide an informative graphic in Historia de los Huracanes in Puerto Rico. And according to this information, hurricanes have been recording from 1502 until 1989. Hurricanes are categorized from A to Z. So A represents hurricanes that cross Puerto Rico with winds of 74 miles per hour, and B represents that only parts of the island were affected with stronger winds. And the last category, C, represents the hurricanes that did not pass over Puerto Rico but caused serious damage. So the table presents the frequency of the hurricanes and the tropical storms that have occurred on the island throughout this period. After Hugo in 1989, there have been other hurricanes such as George's in 1998 and recently Maria in 2017. So a page presented by Historia de Fajardo, titled Huracanes y Tormentas Tropicales que han afectado a Puerto Rico, provides information on hurricanes in Puerto Rico since 1508 to 1998. One of the first hurricanes to cause great devastation on the islands was San Siriaco. The hurricane passed through the island on August 8, 1899, and this was the last hurricane of the 19th century and the first to happen under the colonization of the United States. So the death count reached 3,369, the most deaths caused by a hurricane in Puerto Rico's history until Maria. The second uh, hurricane that caused a significant amount of damage on the island was San Felipe II. The Category 5 hurricane occurred on the 13th of September, 1928. And the difference between San Felipe II and the hurricane that came before it is that the death toll was lower, possibly due to the more advanced facilities this time around in early warnings. It was also the first time the radio was used to deliver the news and warnings to people. So on September 26 to 27 in 1932, San Cipriano made its way to Puerto Rico and the hurricane entered through Ceiba that night and exited through Southern San Juan. And after San Felipe II, the government created an emergency fund for any other natural disaster. Hugo arrived at the island on the 18th of September, 1989, and some observations and satellite pictures suggested that the western side of the wall of the eye moved over land, and the damage to agriculture, poultry farming, and vegetables extended to two-thirds of the island, and the 56 towns were eligible to receive assistance under the federal disaster program. Georges arrived on the island on the 21st of September, 1998, and the natural disaster entered through the southeast of the island. The eye of the hurricane was 20 to 25 miles wide, thus leaving no part of the island unscathed. As expected in the article, published by El Nuevo Día en Primera Hora, Maria, un nombre que no vamos a olvidar. Hurricane Maria has become a name associated with darkness, pain, and fear. Maria arrived on the island on September 20th, 2017, and it came in the early hours of the morning to rain chaos on Puerto Rico, a category four hurricane that brought floods throughout that island and caught water, power, and communication. The American Psychological Association defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event such as as an accident, rape, or natural disaster. When a natural disaster hits, people can only do, some, do so much to prepare for it. Climate change and development expert Ramon Bueno said nearly half of the population lives in poverty, which makes it particularly vulnerable to disasters. For citizens below the poverty line, disaster relief is almost out of reach. In the piece, How Hurricane Maria Fueled Puerto Rico's Resistance by God and Preaching, she mentions that the number of people who were without power for up to a year was alarmingly high. Geophysicist Bram Warner states changes that are happening with the earth are causing a huge amount of suffering, which is totally concentrated on the most marginalized people. Healing is, def is defined in the Merriam-Western Dictionary as to cause an, undes an undesirable condition to be overcome. In the book Trauma and Recovery, the Aftermath of Violence from Domestic Abuse to Political Terror, Judith Lewis Herman writes, commonality with other with other people carries with it all its meaning of the word common. It means to belong, in, it means belonging to a society, having a public role, being a part of that which is universal. It means having a feeling of familiarity, of being known, of communion. Being a part of a society and engaging with it meaningfully creates a bond that promotes unity. This act of unity encourages people to share their traumas and experiences. The discussion regarding healing is highlighted in Aftershocks of Disaster in the chapter titled the trauma doctrine. The way to recover from trauma, from that trauma, 
of losing all control over one's life is to have some control once again, to be empowered to exercise control. That is healing. Everyone who works in trauma, in trauma recovery, knows this, that the way to help is to give people agency so that they are participants and not spectators in their own lives. It doesn't erase the trauma, but there is a healing that happens. After Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, thousands of citizens experienced astronomical loss, being torn from their families and their belongings. Despite this, people became responsible for sheltering their neighbors and family members in the emergency. By Herman's consideration in the trauma and recovery, these people have begun the process of healing properly as a community exerting the commonality as the, of the experienced trauma by assuming control over the lives and the lives of their members, they echo the trauma doctrine's key step to recovery. As the government delayed in recognizing a death toll above double digits, a study published by Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health estimated that 4,645 people died as a result directly from the storm and indirectly in the aftermath. An impromptu memorial was held soon after the published study. Artists Rafael Acevedo, Nelson Rivera, and Gloribel Delgado Esquilin proposed for Puerto Ricans to bring shoes of loved ones to the square across from the Capitol building in San Juan, which was executed on June 1st, 2018, and lasted 48 hours. Almost 3,000 pairs of shoes were collected for the installation. People shared their stories about the victims in the memorial. It is within the act of sharing stories that healing also begins. As people gathered in their driveways, their balconies, and their sidewalks, the first attempts at communicating revolved around telling their stories. Their ways of reaching out for comfort among old neighbors and families stem from the need to have some control of the narratives that have been thrust upon them. There are accounts by and about traumatized survivors in the book After Aftershock of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm. Some of them perfectly represent how the process of recreating their own traumatic accounts through an artistic light helped along their personal healing. One of these such highlighted artists is Sofia Galliza Muriente, who composed a diary titled Another Half the Third Gesture. Within it, she, she captures the losses she went through along with the positive gains, as with the section aptly titled Things I'm Happy Maria Took. There she lists things like fences, billboards, stoplights, her schedule, the idea of normality, and the shame in being sad. This next testimony does not demonstrate personal healing, but instead the process in which one can help another to begin theirs. Patricia Nahua Ortega is a psychologist with a background in psychoanalysis, a field of psychology concerned with the individual response to suffering and its uniqueness. During Noboa's participation with a health brigade, she met a woman organizing help for the people in her community. This woman spoke with her about the things that she had lost in the aftermath of the hurricane. But quickly afterwards, she added that those are material things, that they do not matter, at least we are alive. To Noboa's gentle questioning, the woman reacted with tears, stating that she cannot cry because they need me, I must be strong, I cannot become lost, I cannot lose my mind. Noboa goes on to tell her readers the importance of creating a space for the woman to expunge the pain and suffering that she was going through. In order for the woman in question to mourn, she has to also address the stress beyond her losses, the responsibility that now rests on her shoulders, further denying her the time and the care to heal. One of the factors that united people in recovering from the trauma of disaster was the government. As some of these stories attest to, the artists become involved in the lack of government intervention. Mariana Ramirez Aponte cites that central to the work of these creators are issues associated with the slow and ineffective handling of the disaster by local and federal authorities. In Albizo Campos' time, the island faced Hurricane San Ciprian, a financial calamity fell upon Puerto Ricans between two hurricanes and the Great Depression. A national bank holiday was implemented by the then President of the United States to protect banks from mass withdrawals in the wake of the Depression, but did this not extend relief efforts for mortgage and other debt payments to the devastated islanders? Albizo Campos argued that the U.S. financial system could not help but take advantage of the vulnerabilities brought on and worsened by the hurricanes. He warned that Puerto Ricans would be naive to look to the banks to help the island recover from the natural disasters. For Maria, something similar in the process of privatization occurred. Editor Jim McKay in an article for GovTech's Emergency Management states that recovery is a long and arduous process even for those eligible for some assistance such as FEMA's Individual Assistance Program. But for some, like those mentioned in the testimonies above, the process is even worse and many may never fully recover. After many coinciding traumatic events, the healing process can be difficult to commence and reaching out is much more challenging than people imagine. 
and as seen as the, in these testimonies and by the recorded accounts of government actions in Hurricane San Ciprian and Hurricane Maria, the healing process can be disrupted. Outside of the local community, the government plays an important role in unifying or dividing the people. This is observed by Albizu's campus's criticism of the bank's disregard for disadvantaged Puerto Ricans and by the artists following Maria who revealed through their works the injustices committed against people in these disastrous times. Not only must the traumatized bring forward the effort to heal, but the people around them and the government at large must be willing to contribute and aid in the process of healing. And thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Let's go on to our last one of the day. Um, we have uh, finally, last but not least, uh, Heidi Mir uh, Sira, who is going to be uh, doing a very interesting tribute to Louise Bennett. Maybe not what uh, maybe not the the what you you're, what you're expecting, but I think um, it's uh, I I really think that she's done something quite ingenious with this. Let's um, let's get her presentation up here, and then she can start. Awesome. Thank you, Professor. Right, right. Um, I think we all have fantastic taste since we use more or less the same PowerPoint <laughs> template. So excellent. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, I have my camera on because I, I'm going to use a lot of my hands and my expressions um, uh, when doing the, the tribute. So firstly, I want to thank uh, Professor Faraglas for hosting Caribe Brilengue as always. Um, uh, the University of Puerto Rico Recinto de Rio Piedras and the uh, Instituto de Estudios Caribeño for, again, giving us the space to be able to like present our academic endeavors in such difficult and trying times. So the title of my work is A Tribute to Louis Bennett. My name is Heidi Mircida, and I will be presenting this today. <laughs> okay, let's see, you can go on the next slide. Okay, so this right here is Louise Bennett, or how many people know her as Miss Lou. She was born in Jamaica in, on September 7, 1919, specifically in Kingston. She was a famous Jamaican poet and also comedian that, thanks to her use of language, specifically Jamaican Patois, it helped not only um, catapult her career, but share with the world the importance of celebrating one's native language. Um, she validated Jamaican identity through the use of Jamaican Patois. She elevated the language socially to the point that it was accepted and appreciated in Jamaica, something that was never before seen that the use of Jamaican Patois was in the media, in the news, in art forms, everywhere now because people were starting to celebrate their language identity. So she has been writing since she was 14 years old and her poetry, it was so magical because she was able to, encap to capture the, the, the art of Jamaican expressionisms, the sense of humor and the verbal and physical nature of speaking Jamaican Patois. Um, she studied in the Royal Academy of Arts um, thanks to a, schol a scholarship from the British Council. Um, she lived her life educating students in Jamaica and even in England on the importance um, of Jamaican Patois and the culture of Jamaica. And she also taught in England uh, not only Jamaican Patois but the art of uh, Jamaican performance through poetry. She won numerous awards. She was recognized uh, all around the world. She has two honorary art, uh, doctorate of the arts titles. One was given to her 
by the University of the West Indies, and the other one was from York University in Toronto. Miss um, Lu passed away on July 26, 2006, peacefully in her home in Canada, surrounded by her family and her friends. And I like to think that her spirit never leaves because she's always there. So without further ado, we can go on and pass to the first slide. So this is the original poem by Miss Lou. You can find it on YouTube. I will not be reading it because I think that watching it by yourself is ex an experience in it of itself, but I'm sharing it with you so you can have a little bit of the reading. Um, this was the original video that Dr. Faraklas put on the class that inspired me to like, ah, maybe I can do something creative with this in honor of Miss Lou because her magic just absolutely captivated me. Um, so Dry Foot Boy, a little bit about it is um, Mary has a son who went to England and he came back speaking like an English man and they are making fun of him. <laughs> and that's basically what the poetry is about. And I decided to like, huh, how would that sound if Miss Lou could have spoken Puerto Rican Spanish? How would I could, how could I incorporate her magic into uh, a, a language that she didn't know, but shares so many similar expressions and characteristics when presenting something. And so if you could pass to the next slide, this is what I came up with. So it's not a literal translation, it's more of an, an interpretation in honor of Miss Lou. And from Dry Foot Boy, I came up with Del YouTube. Um, and so it goes like this. ¿Qué carajo le pasa al hijo de María? Esa loca lo tiene gringao. Me lo encontré por la noche y el cabroncito me asustó. Le dije que su tía y sus primos le mandan saludos. ¿Y qué es la que? Y él me dice, fine. A mí me dio una pena por el nene. Pensé que le dio un catarrón y que tenía la garganta jodida, pero poco a poco me di cuenta que son gringuerías que le estaban dici que estaba diciendo. A todo me decía, yes, what, oh my god. Y todos ahí como que, ¿qué carajo le pasa? Pero nada, nos hizo reír hasta con su jojojo. Jo, jo. Todo lo sacó del YouTube ese. And so that was like the original poetry that I came up with, just sitting down in Professor Farrakhla's classroom and just writing like, why is this hitting me? I still don't know. But it's something that I found it was so exciting. And then I said, well, maybe I can do something more, you know? And that's what I did. So next slide. <laughs> So Cuss Cuss by Miss Lou is two women who are fighting, um, specifically verbally fighting, which is ingenious in and of itself. I invite you to also listen to this poem. Um, it's incredible. I, it's one of my favorite. It's really fun. And I came up with something in Puerto Rican Spanish also. It's called Carajo Carajo. You know? So it starts with Arranca jodia loca que, te, que parece una tecata. ¿Qué vas a hacer, ah? Tú y tus locas piensan que yo les tengo miedo. Arranquen, que parecen palos con ropa. A mí es quien quieren roncar. Soy la única aquí con uso de su mano que se zafará para tu cara. Mis manos no pertenecen a ninguna congregación. Y yo no pago licencia para comunicarme. Te diré sobre tú. Mira para acá, no me irrites. Yo no sé a qué iglesia tu boca se integra. Cuando tus labios guindan de tu cara como mula que no se decide. Arranca que tú y yo no somos panas. Tus piernas son largas y sin figura, como si alguien las tiró de lejos y se, se te pegaron mal. Tus pies parecen una K en capital. Y mira esos huecos en tu nariz. Son grandes y anchos como la pecera gigante de Doña Isabel. Arranca para el carajo, que no puedes ni hervir un huevo. Y con todo y eso quieres una sortija de matrimonio. Ningún hombre se quiera casar contigo cuando no puedes hacer nada. Eres muy envidiosa. No puedo cocinar, pero definitivamente voy a una buena universidad. Soy bien inteligente, jodido ignorante. Ay, lamento mucho por el hombre que tengas. Esa pobre alma no comerá nada cuando me voy a su arroz e ignore su bacalao. And so that's the second one. I hope you enjoyed it. And then I thought, well, maybe I can do one more and publish it. And that's what I did. <laughs> so next one is No Lick Twan. Again, I invite you all to read it, to search for it, to hear it. Um, the art of Louise Bennett here in Jamaican Patois. I could absolutely never um, give, 
do it enough justice um, to it. But basically, Nolik Twan is about this man who came, who went to America, and his family were expecting him to come all decked out and go. Oh, my head fell off. All decked out in gold and new pants and speaking like an American and just having a completely different change and outlook on the way that he presented himself after going to the United States. So I thought, hmm, that reminds me about when people go to Spain here in Puerto Rico and everybody, like at least in the in the earlier years, everybody was expecting, oh no, que si no español and everything. And I thought, hmm. Again, let's see how this would sound if it was Puerto Rican. That's what I did once more. And I called it, ¿Y tu Helga? Así que it starts like this. Que bueno verte, mi hijo. Pero como que mm, me fallaste. Estoy bien decepcionada. Mi orgullo anda por el piso. Fuiste para España. Pasaste seis meses completo. Y no regresaste mejor que cuando nos dejaste. No tienes vergüenza. Así que así es que eres. Después de estar tanto tiempo, no tienes ni un poco de acento, ni un poco de cambio en la lengua. Tu hermana, quien trabajó una semana con un español, habla tan lindo. Ahora que en verdad no, no entendemos. Ni tan siquiera te conseguiste un buen par de pantalones, ni un jacket bien fashion, ni un buen diente de oro, una cadena de oro que en tu cuello. ¿Qué pasa si llega mi pan? Ay, Dios. Y te presento un extraño, como el hijo que lloré y sufrí por seis meses porque estaba en España. Los dos se van a reír. Yo no puedo bregar decir eso. Pensarían que estoy mintiendo y que en verdad estaba en Mayagüez. No me contestes, mijo. Que hablas muy mal. Cállate. Yo no sé cómo tú y tu papá van a bregar. Si lo quieres hacer feliz, hazlo pensar que trajiste algo nuevo. Siempre le dices, papi, hoy cuando llegue por la tarde, dile padre. And so <laughs> that's what I did. It's um, a tribute to Louise Bennett. I, I made this right after, I would say, right, not actually right before the pandemic. Um, so it was a nice exercise to finish up during the pandemic. Um, working with Louise Bennett is definitely therapy. Um, and I think that today she would have loved to be here with us and that she would have just said to take the time, sit down, write, laugh, and share. So I hope that everybody enjoyed this. Thank you for coming to Caribe Plurilingue. Thank you to Dr. Faraklas again for sitting here with us all of these, all of these hours. So yeah, thank you. Great, okay, that's a great way to end up. Let's um, have some questions or comments. Uh, the three presentations were, first, Keishla, uh, talking about sign language in the Caribbean. Uh, second, Keishla, Paloma, and Anna, uh, talking about uh, healing, uh, trauma after hurricane disasters in Puerto Rico. And then finally, uh, Heidi's tribute to Louise Bennett. Questions, comments? Okay, entonces, preguntas, comentarios sobre las tres últimas presentaciones. See? Well, I wanted to say, Stella. Um, yes. yes, hi, <laughs> I'm back. Um, I was like, I loved Heidi's presentation. I like, I'm, I, I'm so glad I was on mute because I was laughing out loud, like um, with the poems, they were amazing. I loved it. Like claps, Janie. Um, the other, like, I really enjoyed the presentation about Hurricane Maria because um, for obvious reasons, <laughs> I really, really like their exploration um, on trauma, trauma and the trauma. Uh, trauma is as part of the grieving process and like going through that trauma is also part of the healing process. And I definitely want to reach out to you um, presenters because um, I feel like uh, I would love a copy of the presentation because it would help me in my research. <laughs> so great job, everybody. I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, um, uh, Stella, can you say a little bit about what you did this morning? Because I don't think the, the Keishla and Anna and uh, Paloma were here, um, just so that you know, they know that how you connected. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, earlier today, I presented on Hurricane Maria as well, but my focus was a little bit different. Um, 
I'm trying to pull up the name of the presentation, but it was uh, No Son 64. Uh, ah. I, I made the presentation and my brain is like not working with me right now. It's okay. By the way, sorry. Do you, want me to, do you want me to pull it up? Or, well, no, it's okay. It's just uh, just uh, how do you see it connecting? Because you were talking about. Um, yeah, go ahead. So talking. I was, I focused on death. Um, like, um, particularly, I did like a review of death processes and traditions in Puerto Rico mortuary customs. And then I discussed how these mortuary customs are in and of themselves a form of protest and remembrance. In particular to Hurricane Maria, how the government, and you, like the presenters touched upon this, like the government basically forgot. The dead forgot, the Puerto Ricans forgot everything. And the community had to like build up amongst themselves and then reclaim the dead. And um, tenían que reclamar, no, no tan solo que, que había muerto, pero sin, sino la cantidad de muerto, because the government to this day keeps denying the final count. And so I really enjoyed it because I feel like I, I, it, it really informed me on aspects that I still have to like research further into for my work. Okay, great. More comments, more questions. Well, <laughs> yes, Gabriel. I just found out that, sí, sí, sí. Acabo de enterarme que el título de la presentación de Estela fue en español y no en inglés. Yo lo estaba leyendo, like, no son 64? What is that? <laughs> Spanglish, Spanglish, Gabriel. <laughs> no, it, there is something, uh, quote, uh, ling a new linguistic soundscape. So, you know, right there when you read it, that was like a click, oh, da -da -da, it's in Spanish. So, just to add a joke to end this conversation. Good. Okay, so but where does English begin and where does uh, English end and where does Spanish begin and where does Spanish end? And then if you, if you look at what Heidi did, actually, yeah, maybe we can talk about different codes, but if you look underneath those two codes, there's a rhizomatic network that goes from Jamaica to Puerto Rico because yeah. you, couldn't, you couldn't do that with Castilian Spanish and you couldn't do that with British English. You couldn't do that but she could do it with Puerto Rican Spanish. So this is, this is all of this transgressive stuff that with language that we were talking about. Yes. O con, cualquier, o con cualquier variedad lingüística en el Caribe, porque es algo que nos identifica. Eh, creo que lo escribí, pero quisiera repetirlo. Eh, de acuerdo a, la, a, la, a las estadísticas que se presentaron esta tarde y los code switching, etc., me pregunto si verdaderamente vamos a tener, eh, o hay gente actualmente, además de Joe Swan, que quiere ir a estudiar a España. Eh, sería más bien ir a estudiar a los Estados Unidos, ¿verdad? Porque todos queremos ir a Harvard y a universidades como esa. También eh, fue bien interesante escuchar a la co colega de Chile, eh, no sé, me fui en el viaje fonológico, y escucharla y ver cómo ella aspira las S, etcétera. Eh, y también ver cómo a Josuán parece que comparte mucho con ella y en vez de pegársele el acento español, que es lo que nos ocurre a muchos de nosotros cuando estamos en España por tres semanas, pues a él se le está pegando el acento chileno. Sí. <laughs> hasta, hasta luego, muchas gracias. Gracias, okay, Heidi. Cuídate mucho, cuídate mucho. Ok, um, now, uh, what about uh, sign languages? So is there that kind of rhizomatic um, connection uh, that underlies um, sign languages in the Caribbean as well? So I don't know if, Keshla, you got into any of this, but um, are there similarities, for example, between um, a, the sign languages that uh, are found in the uh, islands of the Caribbean that are colonized by that were colonized by the English, like Trinidad, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, they were colonized by the Spanish before that. Um, and then, say, a place like Puerto Rico or other islands. In other words, can we talk about like a regional um, a connection? I don't know. 
uh, or is it just balkanized according to the colonial power like so many other things are? I don't know if you know a little bit more about that case law. So from, like, this is still a work in process and right now like I'm focusing on Trinidad and Tobago and then I, I did Nicaragua as well. But Nicaragua is like a, a whole different ball yeah. field because yeah. they have no contact until recently they're getting contact. Okay. So there's Caribbean islands that like Martinique, Guadalupe, French Guiana. So they do have the same in the French sign language because of the colonization in that sense. Yeah. Just like Netherlands, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, and even Suriname, they have um, sign language from the Netherlands because they were colonized by them. So in that connection, there are signs, like I mentioned, that could be the same sign, but they'll have a different meaning. I had an experience like this. I'm studying sign language, but American sign language, and I went to Germany and I saw a couple signing in the train and I was very excited. I was, oh my God. <laughs> and when I saw them, they had signs that were similar, but obviously they mean different things. And so I'm not sure. I haven't found anything that could be original because there could be maybe a sign that's similar, but it could have a different meaning. It's not going to be, even in the Caribbean, maybe if they're the, sign language, like I said, with the French sign language, Martinique, Guadalupe, they all have that in common because they were colonized by the same, so they might have similarities, but anything else across Puerto Rico is really heavily, heavily influenced by American sign language. I'm wondering if, uh, Ben, are you there, Ben Brathwaite? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Nicholas. Okay. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. Welcome, welcome. Hopefully next time you, 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 we can welcome you face to face here in Puerto Rico. But in any case, um, do you see any kind of similar, any of these kind of rhizomatic connections between different sign languages in the Caribbean that uh, sort of subversively kind of connect places that shouldn't be connected according to the colonial, dominant colonial uh, spheres of influence? Yes, absolutely, I do. Um, an example of that I can think of is, um, I think you often see in Caribbean sign language, you see African, West African influences, but you know, you can trace back to that lineage. So for example, uh, and, and that are connected through gestures. So I know in Trinidad and Tobago, um, when you measure the length of something, say you caught a big fish or whatever it is, uh, you might sign like, you might gesture like this, a hearing person mm -hmm. might gesture like that, measure on your, on your arm. Whereas a European way of doing that would be like this, mm -hmm. you measure like that. And I think that a number of Caribbean sign languages have incorporated those, gest those things through the African gestures that survive, survive the trip to, to the Caribbean. And I think there's, there's probably a lot more of that that exists. Uh, yeah, and I'm wondering about indigenous stuff too, you know? That would be really, really fascinating to look at. Well, absolutely, yeah. We're, we're working here at, on a project in um, Guyana, working with um, an indigenous um, Carib mm. community there, where they have, a, they have the genes for deafness. And so they have lots of deaf people living in a small village. And they have their own sign language, completely different, completely separate, and, and largely unaffected. Yeah, wow. and you have that in other places as well, in, in other little islands, in Bekwe, in Providence, in Providence Island, Colombia, um, in the Bay Islands of Honduras. So there's all these little pockets, all these little things going on beyond the, the sort of colonial influence, colonial and neo-colonial influences. Great, thank you so much. And then I would like to ask Velma. Um, Velma, are you there? Velma, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, Velma, welcome, welcome. And again, uh, thank you. I'm enjoying this. Yeah, but I wanted to, I I'm, I'm just want to tell you that uh, next time we hope to welcome you in person here, not virtually, just electronically. <laughs> but anyway, oh, okay. very warm welcome. And also, I'm wondering, uh, what do you think um, Miss um, um, Lou would think of uh, 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 the presentation that Heidi just gave. 
I think she would be very excited. And I, I do take the point that the translation to Puerto Rican Spanish is much more realistic than another kind of translation might be. She would be so excited to know that you've gone to the trouble to do, you know, translate her, her stuff. And I will certainly let some of those people who are still working on her stuff be aware that somebody took the trouble, you know. I, I, thought, I thought it was hijinks. <laughs> I enjoy it. Well, I, I didn't can... expect that at all. I, I, I expected <laughs> uh, a formal paper on Miss Lou. And then here comes this burst, you know, so I, I love yeah, it. Yeah. But I think I can speak for Heidi that it wasn't a trouble at all. <laughs> it wasn't what? That as soon as I saw, as soon as we uh, looked, we saw it wasn't trouble at all for Heidi. You said yes. that she took the trouble, but I think for her it was a pure joy. <laughs> right. And, and Miss Lou would laugh loudly and be very happy about it. So thank you. Yeah. So and, I want to say thank you because I'm like about to cry. But este, like I wanted to thank you because like as Professor Faraka said, like it wasn't no trouble at all for me. It was like this almost like how can I say it's like a spiritual moment or a connection in the sense that like, como que I would hear her talk and I heard my grandmother talk. Okay. But like if my grandmother would have been Jamaican, the expressionisms, the movement, the warmth because she captures just this lovely inviting warmth that Jamaican culture just embodies. Um, so it's, I was absolutely no trouble for me. I was actually really nervous because I thought, you know, that maybe it was like, it, I, 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 I was really worried of maybe being disrespectful towards her and towards the Jamaican um, community by doing this. But I thought, oh man, I think she would have loved to sit down and have a conversation about this. And she would have just laughed of my ways of expression, like uh, the poetry that I translated to Puerto Rican Spanish. So I appreciate you incredibly, Miss Pollard. There were that. Thank you so but, much. But I, I wanted to ask you something. Did you yes. find any of the um, poems more difficult to understand than others? Yes. I, know, I, I, I ask you this because I taught a class one at UCLA, once at UCLA mm -hmm. and they told me that, that I always chose difficult poems, the difficult ones to give them to do. And I was not aware of any difference. Well, I, I understand them all. So I'm asking you <laughs> which one was most difficult for you to understand. Well... A dry food boy was I, the easiest for sure, but I would say that cuss cuss was the hardest one okay. because in cuss cuss they use so much idioms, local, idioms yeah, and local slang to insult yeah. each other that just really trying to capture the essence of an insult in a late in a in a native language and changing into the other. It was so difficult. But it was so incredible because I learned so much about Patois. And at the same time, it was like, these insults are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you call somebody like you're just like as boring as a mule who can't decide where to go? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that stuck with me. Like, since I first read it, I got so excited and I was like, this is so creative, but definitely cuss cuss because of the use of the idioms of the slang and just how do you how do you capture somebody insulting another person? It's like a video clip. It's like a video clip. Yeah, you got to close your eyes. Read it three, four times. <laughs> Look for a Jamaican Patua dictionary to English, then translate it to English to Puerto Rican Spanish. And like, which word works and which word doesn't work. So it was definitely an incredible experience to be working with her poetry. And hopefully being able to share this with more Puerto Rican people that get them hyped and, oh, I can hear this. I can understand it in Spanish. And maybe if I'm so excited about hearing it in Spanish, they're going to look for the original one and then just share um, Miss Lou's original work with the rest of the island. So that's like the hope and the goal for me. Picture, right. Yeah, that's a big picture. But Miss Lou deserves that and even more. Okay. Well, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, All right, okay. so anyway, this, 
This is the 14th uh, Symposio Caribe Plurilingue. It's the 14th time we've done this. We've been doing it for the last, I don't know how many years, at least 10 or 12 years. So uh, you're all welcome. You're all welcome to come to the... The thing yeah. that, the thing that um, lockdown has done has allowed me to want to, 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 see, to see that I could. That's what is just fascinating, you know. Long, I would just hear about it, but no, I was able to be. I only came for half day. I came at one o'clock, my one o'clock. So I came at your, your, anyway, I came for the second half. I couldn't make it in the morning. I had other things. No, no, yeah, I, I agree with you. And also, you know, this morning, I didn't know how this thing was going to turn out because we have so many different PowerPoints and I, I've never really juggled all this stuff. And so I, I, I made big apologies at the beginning of the day saying, be patient with us. Don't, uh, if something goes wrong, we apologize in advance. But actually, it, uh, I, again, it, it's showing us what we can do, what we can do. And, um, the, uh, so I think that actually um, this worked out quite well as far as I can see. I mean, I, I still like the face-to-face, -face, you know, that contact. I know, I but that is a pipe dream now. Yeah, I know, I know. People are hardly getting on planes, far less I too. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Well, anyway, this is a great way to end the day. Uh, we've had uh, 18 I wonderful see. presentations. Uh, I want to thank all the presenters and all of the participants, uh, all of the great questions, all of the great comments, um, and let's uh, do more of this in the future. Uh, we, will, we do this every semester towards the end of the semester. Our, it's around April and uh, October, November of each year. We do it twice per year. And don't forget, we also have the uh, Islands in Between Conference, uh, which happens in November every year. And the next one will happen in Martinique. It'll happen in Martinique. What do you mean by that time we will be going to Martinique? That's next year, you think? Well, 2021. But if not, we'll, I'll see you right here. <laughs> yeah, well, we can do it like this. At least we know that this works. You're right. You're right. And I more mean, people will come because they don't have to travel. Yeah, I, I understand that. I agree. I agree. Or maybe we can do both at the same time somehow. Yeah, you know, well, yes, yes. Yeah. But I, but I, don't know. Find, I don't know. You find that you have 200 people abroad and 20 on the spot. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. You know, yeah. that would be fun too. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's so many possibilities and we just need to explore them, you know, and see what right. we can do. But uh, I, really. I mean, I'm just happy that we've been able to do this like this. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. We had to, you know, we, we postponed this one. This was the first time we postponed, I think. Uh, no, we postponed for Maria to Hurricane Maria, but oh, this one, yeah, but this one was postponed for the pandemic. But actually, uh, if we knew then what we know now, we could have very well done it by this. But I think there was no Zoom at that time, uh, or it was just getting started. So Zoom is a very good way to do this. But in any case, uh, okay. many, many thanks to everybody. Uh, and I hope to see you. Thanks to all the presenters. Yes. Uh, by next April, we should be having another one, and I hope to see everybody back by then. Uh, but congratulations to all of you. You all did a fantastic job. So uh, I'm really uh, happy, and I could go on. You know, we had a lunch break, but we didn't take it. We just kept going through the lunch break. Well, this is, again, another thing. You don't <laughs> have to take all these breaks and go to buy food. And Yeah, you know, that's really true. And think about the budget. Some positives. Yeah, some positives. <laughs> Where are we going to get the money to buy the coffee and the, <laughs> and the, and the sweets? Exactly, you know. Yeah, all of this. And then, uh, oh, lunchtime. Uh, how many vegans do we have? How many vegetarians do we have? I mean, organizing conferences can be a headache, but this seems like really it's easy. Simpler. <laughs> That's simpler. Okay, guys, hasta pronto. Yes, hasta pronto. Okay. Nos vemos.